In this lecture, we are going to create our very first the user-defined function. And user-defined functions help us to organize code. And if you want to reuse a code fragment again and again, it might make sense to organize the code in a reusable function. For instance, let's assume that we have a code fragment with 20 lines of code and we need to reuse it many times. So this is getting really messy. And this is one case where we should create a function. And typically functions also enhance the readability of our code to others as you can give a meaningful function name and then everybody understands what you are doing. So let's have a simple example here and we have already learned how to calculate the future value given the present value, the interest rate and the number of periods. And with the following code and the following formula we can calculate the future value. So here we have 121. And this is based on a period of uh, five years, but let's change it to six years. And therefore we have to change here the parameter n. And we have to rerun the line where we calculate the future value. And actually it would be more comfortable to have here a function. So for instance, uh, the future value function, where we have uh, the three parameters, uh, present value, interest rate, and number of periods. And then we can simply pass our arguments here within the function. So this would be great, but there's uh, no future value function and therefore we will create our very own user-defined function. And we can actually do this uh, with uh, the def keyword. And then we can define the function name. So in this case, um, for instance, it's a future value. And here you can see in blue the function name and there are actually some conventions. So for a function name, you should use uh, lowercase letters like here, future value. And then we can specify some parameters by opening the parentheses. And uh, we have here present value, the interest rate and the number of periods. So let's define the parameters here. We have the present value, then we have the rate and we have the number of periods. And then we need a colon. So this is uh, the function header where we define the function name and the parameters. And then we press enter and uh, Python automatically uh, makes an indent here. And now we have to define the action or the calculations uh, that the function uh, shall perform. And in our case, it's uh, calculating the future value. So let's copy here the formula. And uh, we have actually uh, the parameter present value, then we have rate and we have number of periods. And here within the function based on present value, rate and number of periods, we calculate the future value and we create here the function variable future value. And finally, our function should uh, return the future value that we calculated. And we can do this uh, with uh, the return keyword. And then we want to return the future value. So this is our very first uh, user-defined function. So we defined the function here in the header and uh, we defined uh, the actions in the body. And finally we return the result of uh, the function, the future value. And uh, finally we can define the function by simply running the cell. So now we have defined the function. And in a very next step, we can actually call the function by passing some arguments uh, to the parameters here. So let's do this here. And actually we can call the function by simply writing here the function name, future value, and then we can open the parenthesis. And uh, then we have to pass um, the values or the arguments uh, that you want to have uh, to the parameters present value, rate and number of periods. So let's uh, run the cell here and let's uh, call the function. And here we get uh, the result 121.66. And if you want to change now the number of periods to six, then we can simply do this here. And we can actually uh, rerun and uh, reuse the code. And here we get 126.53. So the function future value returns uh, the future value here. And uh, we can see this here in the output. However, in many cases, we want to store the result of a function in a variable. 
And of course we can do this. So here on the right hand side of the equal sign, we actually call our function future value and we assign or we store the result in the variable future value. And uh, here we have 121. And finally, there's no need to pass uh, the numbers here to the parameters. So 104% and uh, six or five years. So we can also pass here the variables uh, that we defined here. And uh, these variables are pointing or referencing to the objects. So we can also pass here the present value that we saved here to the function parameter or variable PV. Then we can pass R to the rate parameter and N to the N per parameter. And also here we get uh, the result 126.53. So here N is uh, six. All right, this was uh, the very first uh, user-defined function. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next video. Bye. All right, we have already learned the difference between a function parameter and a function argument. And many people mix up these terms and use them interchangeably, and also I do. But that's not a problem, as everybody understands what you mean. But we should keep in mind that there's a slight difference. And let's have a look at our future value function. So we have uh, the parameters, the present value, rate, and n per. So these are the function parameters, or also function variables. And then we p actually pass uh, the arguments or the values 100, 4% and 5 to the parameters. And actually even more important is the difference between keyword arguments or named arguments and positional arguments. And let's again uh, define our future value function. And first of all we can simply call the function by passing 100, 4% and 5 in uh, this sequence here. So we have the present value 100, then we have uh, the interest rate of 4% and we have five uh, periods. And actually these arguments are also called positional arguments. So we pass uh, the arguments in the sequence in the very same sequence of the parameters and we can do so. And here we get uh, the correct uh, result 121.6. However, when using positional arguments only, so we have to keep in mind uh, that uh, the sequence or the position matters. So we have to pass uh, the positional arguments in the very same sequence as uh, the parameters. And if we mix uh, these up, so for instance, uh, first of all, we pass 4%, then 100 and then five, then our function uses uh, the present value 4%, the interest rate 100 and uh, five periods. And consequently, we get here a false result. So these are so-called positional arguments and the sequence matters. And uh, the second alternative is uh, that we can actually use keyword arguments. And in this example, we use uh, keyword arguments only. So we explicitly pass here 100 uh, to PV, then we pass 4% to the parameter rate, and we pass five to the N per parameter. So these are called keyword arguments as we explicitly passed the arguments with an equal sign to the parameters. And actually when using keyword arguments, so there's one advantage, so the sequence does not matter. So if we first of all pass 4% to the rate parameter, then five to the n per parameter, and finally 100 to the present value parameter, then this works. Because Python exactly knows what you want to do here and uh, this is actually not the case uh, with uh, positional arguments. So here Python assumes uh, that we pass uh, 4% uh, to present value and in this case it's not correct. So for positional arguments uh, sequence matters and for keyword arguments uh, the sequence actually does not matter. Next we can also use a combination of uh, positional arguments and keyword arguments and uh, this is actually the most common case so I typically use a combination and typically the first parameter or the first two parameters of a function or a method are the most important parameters. And for most functions or methods, I simply know the position of uh, the most important parameters. And uh, therefore, so let's assume here for the future value function, the most uh, important parameter is actually the present value. And here I pass 100 to present value and this is a positional argument. 
And then I start with the keyword arguments. So I use uh, the keyword argument 4% to the rate parameter and I use uh, the keyword argument 5 and I pass 5 to the n per parameter. And uh, this works. And of course I can also have two positional arguments. So I can pass 100 4%. And finally the last argument is uh, then a keyword argument. So this works. But when using a combination of positional and keyword arguments, there's uh, one important rule. So once we use our very first uh, keyword argument, so for instance rate, then after that uh, we cannot use uh, positional arguments anymore. So once we start with the uh, keyword arguments, uh, then we have to proceed uh, with the uh, keyword arguments. And for instance, uh, this example here does not work. So we have a positional argument, then we have a keyword argument, and then we have another positional argument. And let's uh, try to run the cell here. And here we get an error message. So positional argument follows a keyword argument. So here we used a keyword argument for the very first time and after that we cannot use positional arguments. So this is a pretty simple rule. So in this example, what's uh, the correct code? And uh, we start uh, with uh, the positional argument 100. Then we use uh, the keyword argument 4%. Uh, and after that, uh, we have to use another keyword argument. So we have to explicitly pass uh, 5 to the n per parameter. And this works. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. All right, we still have our future value function now called uh, future value one with uh, the three parameters, the present value, interest rate and number of periods. And then we can call the function by using either positional or keyword arguments. And actually here all arguments are mandatory arguments. So Python expects uh, that we pass uh, three arguments here and if we do not pass uh, all arguments, so let's try this out, and let's pass only two arguments, then Python assumes uh, that 100 is for the present value, 4% for the interest rate, but we get here the error message uh, that uh, we have one missing required positional argument numbers of periods. And actually Python simply does not know what to do and what to use uh, for number of periods here in uh, the function and in the calculation. However, we can set and determine default arguments and these arguments are automatically used if we do not specify an argument. And actually working with default arguments uh, makes sense whenever we can specify a default argument that is uh, typically or in most cases used for this function and for this parameter. So let's have an example here. With our future value function we assume annual compounding. So a compounding period of one year. However, we have already learned that uh, sometimes we have quarterly or even monthly compounding frequency and actually our function should uh, provide this additional functionality and therefore we should add the additional parameter m with the number of compounding periods per year. And also here we have two options and let's have a look at the first option. So we can define m as a mandatory argument so we have to specify m. And we can simply do this uh, by having here our future value uh, to function and uh, we add the parameter m. And also here in the function body we add m respectively. So let's uh, define the future value to. And then again we can call the function future value to. And for instance we can pass uh, the argument uh, 1 to the m parameter. So that means uh, that we have annual compounding. And here we get the same result as before. So before we implicitly assumed that m is uh, equal to 1. But we can also calculate the future value with uh, quarterly compounding by passing 4 to the m parameter. And here the future value is slightly higher because we earn interest on interest, so compound interest on a quarterly basis. And then we can also assume uh, monthly compounding by passing 12 to the m parameter. And here we get even a higher future value, 122.09. So this is uh, the first alternative how to add to the additional parameter m. And as I said before, so m, the argument m is mandatory. And if we forget to specify m, then we get here an error message and it says missing one required positional argument m. And now let's come to the second alternative 
And actually we can define a default argument for M. And uh, typically we assume an annual compounding frequency. So the default argument could be one for the parameter M. And we can specify this uh, for the function future value three. So we have uh, the parameter M equals uh, one. So this is uh, the default argument. And let's uh, define the function here. And consequently, if uh, we are happy with uh, the default argument, so if we assume annual compounding, then we do not have to uh, specify M. And we can simply pass only three arguments uh, for present value, rate, and number of years. However, if we want to change M, then we have to explicitly define an argument. So either we can use a positional argument by having here four positional arguments and uh, we pass actually 12. So we have a monthly compounding and get 122. And of course we can also use a keyword argument and we can explicitly pass uh, 12 uh, to the M parameter. And of course uh, this gives uh, the very same result. Finally, there's uh, one important thing that uh, you should know when uh, defining uh, default uh, parameters or default arguments. So let's have a look at uh, future value for the function. And here we specify the parameter present value rate. Then we have uh, the default parameter or argument m. And finally, after that, uh, we have the mandatory argument the number of years. And let's try to uh, define the function here. And here we get an error message and it says a non-default argument follows the default argument. So once we have defined uh, one default argument or parameter, then all of uh, the following arguments must also be default arguments. Or to put it the other way around, so the default arguments must be the very last arguments of our function. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. It might be the case that you have already seen the default argument none in a function or a method. This is not uncommon and in this lecture, I want to give you an intuition why and how this is used. Typically, when we have the default argument none in a function or method, then the real default argument is specified in the function body, like in this case here. So if you do not specify m, then the function uses uh, the default value of 1. And let's have a short excursus on the none object. So we have a none and we save the object in the variable a. And um, actually a produces an output of uh, nothing, so it's simply none. And we can also check the data type. It's a none type. And if we pass none to the bool function, then we get a false. And consequently not a gives a true. So if we have here the following code, if not m, so if we do not uh, specify m, then the function uses uh, the default value 1. And otherwise, if we specify a value for m, then uh, the function uses our value. So let's define the function future value 5. And actually it produces uh, the very same results as uh, before with uh, the default argument m equals 1. So let's call future value 5 uh, with uh, the default argument. And here we get 121.66. But of course we can also explicitly pass an argument, for instance uh, 12 for monthly uh, compounding frequency. And here we get 122.09. So the question is now what is uh, the difference and uh, the benefits of using none? And there's actually a small but a pretty important difference. And let's assume that we are working in a bank and we set the compounding policy for ordinary savings accounts. So here we specify an annual compounding frequency. So by passing one to a compounding policy. Now we have the future value six function that allows to calculate the, the future value for savings accounts uh, based on the present value the interest rate, the, the number of years, and also the compounding policy. And the policy for ordinary retail accounts is annual, but for very few privileged business clients, we also have uh, savings accounts uh, with a monthly compounding frequency. And therefore we have the parameter M, 
with uh, the default argument uh, compounding policy. So let's define the function future value six and let's calculate the future value for one uh, retail account with the uh, present value 100 and uh, the interest rate is four uh, percent and we have five years and we get 121.66 and now let's assume that we change uh, the compounding policy for retail accounts uh, from uh, annual to uh, for instance uh, monthly now let's call again future value six uh, with uh, the default argument and we would expect that now the default argument is uh, 12. So let's run the cell here and you would expect actually a future value of 122, but still we get 121.66 based on a compounding policy of uh, still actually annual, so one. So we actually didn't change the default argument for our future value six function, even if we changed here the compounding policy so we set the default argument m equals 1 for the function future value 6 at the time when we define the function and at that time the compounding policy was 1 and this is fixed unless we redefine the function and rerun the cell here but that's pretty inconvenient and therefore there's a better solution with the default argument none. So let's define future value 7 with the default argument none, specifying in the function body the real default value that is equal to uh, the compounding policy, to the current compounding policy. And actually when specifying the default value in the function body, the value is specified in that moment where we call the function. And in contrast to that, if we specify the default argument in the function header, then the default argument is set in that moment where we define the function and we cannot change it anymore unless we redefine the function. So that's uh, the difference and let's uh, now define future value 7. And first of all let's assume that our initial compounding policy was uh, 1, so annual. And now let's uh, redefine here and let's uh, call the function future value 7 with uh, the default argument and here we get 121 and now let's assume that we change uh, the compounding policy to 12 and actually we do not need to rerun or redefine uh, the future value 7 function we can simply call the function and here we get uh, the result 122.09 and that is based on the revised compounding policy and the changed uh, default argument of uh, 12. So the key message is here that whenever we want to have uh, default arguments that uh, should be dynamic and that should be changed after we defined the function, then we should use uh, the default argument none. And then we specify actually the real value, the real default value in the function body. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. This is a short repetition on how to unpack iterables like tuples or lists. And then I will show you how to work with the so-called star arcs expression. So this lecture covers some basics that we require before I can introduce the function parameter star arcs in the next lecture. And let's assume we have a tuple with four elements, one, two, three, four. And then we can unpack the tuple by having here a comma b comma c comma d equals uh, tuple and by doing so we store the element one in the variable a the element two in the variable b and so on so let's check this so a is one b is two c is uh, three and d is four and actually something similar happens when positional arguments are passed to a function so let's uh, consider here our function future value two with uh, four parameters, the present value, rate, the number of years and m. And then we can call the function with uh, four positional arguments, 100, 4%, five years and uh, 12 periods. And let me show you what happens in the background. So by passing four positional arguments, we actually pass a tuple with uh, four elements. So this is uh, the tuple here. And then actually the function 
unpacks uh, the tuple and uh, assigns uh, to the very first uh, parameter the first value of our tuple, to the second the parameter the second value and so on. So this is what happens in the background. So PV rate number of years and M equals tuple and uh, we actually unpack the tuple and we have for the present value 100 for the interest rate uh, 4%. For the number of years uh, we have 5 and we have M equals 12. So now let's go on and let's have uh, the tuple with uh, four elements, one, two, three, and four. And then we can also unpack the tuple with uh, the following code, a comma star b equals tuple. So let's have a look here. We have a, which is one, and then we have b with um, the remaining elements. And also with uh, this expression here, we unpack the tuple and we assign the very first element, so one, to a, and then star b exhausts all remaining elements. And um, the important part is here actually uh, the star sign. So let's delete it here. And here it says uh, there are too many values to unpack. So we have only two variables, but uh, we have four values in our tuple and uh, this doesn't work. So we use here the star operator actually. And by doing so star b exhausts all remaining elements. Now let's have another example and let's have uh, the list with uh, four elements, five, six, seven, and eight. And then we can unpack the list with uh, C comma D comma star E. And it's actually no surprise uh, that we assign five to C, six to D, and the remaining elements seven and eight to E. Let's check this here. So we have five, we have six, and we have the remaining elements here in a list for E, seven and eight. And typically the convention is uh, that we use star arcs. So this can be any name, but typically we use arcs. And in particular, when we use uh, this uh, in functions as function parameter, so we will see this in the next lecture. So typically we have this here. So C comma D comma star arcs. And by doing so, we unpack the list, so the uh, result is actually the very same. We have five, six, and uh, the remaining elements. And now let's have a final example. So we have still my list, and we can actually uh, change uh, the sequence here, and we can start with uh, the expression star arcs, comma, c, comma, d. And actually Python assigns uh, the last element a to d, the second last element to seven to c, and all remaining elements are then actually stored in arcs. So here we have arcs with five and six, then C with seven and D with eight. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. In this lecture, I will show you that we can also pass a sequence like a list to a function parameter. And I will also show you how to use star arcs in a function. And star arcs allows us to pass a variable number of positional arguments to a function. So for instance, calculating future values or net present values is a good example as the projects have a variable number of cash flows. So in one project we have four years and in the next project uh, we have 10 years. However, our future value or net present value function should handle all cases. Let's assume we have the following investment with the following cash flows and we have a required rate of return of 6%. And with the cash flows and the required rate of return, we can calculate the net present value of the investment project. So this is nothing new. And here we get 38. And now we can also define a function net present value. And we have actually two inputs or two parameters. So we need the required rate of return and we need the cash flows or the values. And here we structure the NPV function in a way that we have to pass a sequence uh, to the values parameter. So for instance, a tuple or a list, and then we iterate over the list. And for each and every element in the list, uh, we calculate the present value and then we add uh, the present values. And finally, the function returns uh, the net present value. So let's define the function here. And let's pass our required rate of return of 6% to the rate parameter and the list the CF uh, to the values parameter. 
And no surprise, we also get here the 38.71. And now let's try to do the following. So we pass uh, seven positional arguments to the NPV function. So the required rate of return and each and every cash flow. And here we get an error message and it says NPV takes two positional arguments, but seven were given. So here we have to pass exactly two positional arguments. So one for the required rate of return and then for the values parameter, actually a list uh, with uh, the cash flows. So this works. However, we can modify the NPV function in a way that also this works here. And we can actually define in the function header that we have uh, the parameters rate and the star args. And this allows us to pass a variable number of positional arguments. And uh, the very first argument is actually assigned to the rate parameter. And actually then star args exhausts all other positional arguments and uh, creates a list. So let's uh, define the function here. And then let's call the NPV function by passing uh, seven positional arguments. And by doing so, we assign R to the rate parameter and all other positional arguments uh, to args. And also here we get um, the NPV of uh, 38. And again, let me show you what actually happens in the background. So we have uh, the two function parameters rate and star args and we pass actually a tuple with uh, seven positional arguments. And uh, then we have here the rate which is 6% and args is actually a list uh, with uh, all other elements. And finally let me show you one last uh, thing that actually does not work. So let's assume that uh, we change here the sequence of uh, star args and rate so here in the beginning we have star args and uh, rate. So let's define the function here. And then we can actually call the function by passing a variable number of positional arguments. So the cash flows here. And then we add uh, the rate as a keyword argument. So this works. However, the following does not work. So if we simply pass seven positional arguments, including R, then we get here an error message and it says NPV missing one required keyword only argument. So if we have star args uh, followed by another parameters, then uh, the following parameters or arguments are actually mandatory keyword arguments. So keyword only arguments. And actually this behavior is a bit surprising because uh, the following works uh, perfectly. So again, we have a tuple with uh, the seven elements and here we can code the star args comma rate and uh, this works here. And by doing so we actually assign R to a rate and star args exhausts all of the remaining elements. All right, thanks for watching and see you in the next video. All right, in this lecture I'm going to show you that a user defined function can also return two or many results. And we've already seen this when we performed a t-test so the t-test method uh, returned the t-statistic and the p-value in a tuple. So now let's create a function that returns the net present value and the internal rate of return for an investment project. And uh, we have uh, the following investment project with uh, the following cash flows. And we have a required rate of return of 6%. And then we can define uh, the function NPV IRR and we need uh, three parameters. So we need the required rate of return, then the cash flows, and also we can pass a guess for the internal rate of return. And the default argument is uh, 5%. So let's have a look at the function body. And first of all, we calculate here the net present value based on the cash flows and based on the required rate of return. And then here we calculate uh, the internal rate of return with a while loop. So this is actually nothing new. And here we actually use uh, the cash flows and also the guess. And then finally, let's have a look at uh, the return statement. So we calculated uh, the net present value and the IRR. And finally, we can say that we want to return the net present value and the final guess separated by a comma. So let's define the function here. And let's call the function NPV IRR 
by passing r to the rate parameter, so r is uh, 6%. Then we pass uh, our cash flow list uh, cf to the values parameter and uh, we set uh, the initial guess uh, to 6% for instance. And here we can see in the output a tuple with uh, two values. So we have on the left hand side the NPV 38.71 and uh, we have uh, the final guess, which is uh, very, very close uh, to the IRR. So we have 11.91%. And last but not least, we can also unpack uh, the results tuple. And uh, then we call the function here. And by doing so, we saved uh, the NPV in the variable NPV and the IRR in the variable IRR. And actually we are not limited to uh, two results. So this is uh, completely variable and flexible. All right, thanks for watching and to see you also in the next video, bye. We are coming now to a very important concept in Python, scopes. So this is a quite complex topic that we could spend a couple of hours on. And in this video, I will give you a very practical and high level overview on what you should uh, really know about scopes. And the key message is, what happens in a function stays in the function and what happens outside the function stays outside the function. So in a way functions are pretty similar to Las Vegas. So functions and Las Vegas have their own scope, the local scope, which is separated from the rest of the code or the rest of the world, which is the so-called global scope. So let's have a look at a simple example and let's assume that somewhere in our code we have uh, saved uh, 40 in the variable NPV. And then we have an investment project with uh, the following cash flows. And we have a required rate of return of 6%. And then we can actually define the user defined function NPV, where we can pass uh, the rate, so the required rate of return and the cash flows. So this is nothing new. And then we can call the function by passing our required rate of return and the cash flow list. And this gives an NPV of 38.71. So we also printed here the intermediate results. And actually, as you can see here, we have in the function the variable NPV and we have outside the function the variable NPV. And first of all, we set uh, the value 40 to NPV. And then inside the function, we also have the variable NPV. And uh, first of all, we set it to zero and then we iterated over the cash flow list and uh, then we actually updated NPV several times. So from zero to minus 200 to minus 181. And the final value for NPV here in the function is uh, 38. And one could expect now that NPV is actually now 38, but NPV is uh, still 40 as we defined here above. And the simple reason for this is that we have different and separated scopes. So here we have uh, the variable and the global scope, uh, which is referencing or pointing to 40. And then within uh, the function here, we have uh, the local variable or the function variable NPV. And uh, this is completely separated from the global variable NPV. And even if we change to the local variable NPV several times, the global variable NPV is still 40 because here this is only a local variable or function variable that is separated from the global scope. So this is uh, the local scope, the function scope, and this is uh, the global scope. So here we are inside the function in the local scope and NPV is um, a local variable. And uh, therefore we cannot change here the global variable unless it is our intention. And uh, there's a way also to change uh, the global scope uh, variable NPV. And we can actually do this with uh, the keyword global. And here we can define that we also want to change the global variable NPV. So let's again run the cell here and let's uh, call the function. So here we get the same results, but now let's check uh, the global variable NPV. So before we had 40 and now we have uh, 38. So this is actually due to uh, the global keyword. And there's even no need to define uh, the global variable in advance. 
So we have here in the global scope, uh, no variable future value. We can check this. So in the name future value is not defined, but we can actually uh, define and create uh, the global variable future value inside and within a function. So first of all, let's uh, create the future value function where we have to pass uh, the present value, the interest rate and the number of periods. And this is here the calculation. And finally, we return the future value. So let's call the function and we get a future value of 121. So inside the future value function here, we created uh, the local variable future value. But if we try to print a future value in the global scope, then again, we get here an error message. So in the global scope, future value is not defined. However, we can change this with uh, the global keyword. So here we can define that the, the variable future value should also be in the global scope. And let's uh, redefine the future value function and let's call the function. And now we have also the global scope variable future value. All right, let's have another example and let's have a equals 10 and b equals uh, 20. And then we define the function my function where we have to pass uh, a and b. So here a and b are actually global variables, uh, but here inside uh, the function my function a and b are actually local variables, so function variables. And the function my func actually increments uh, the local variables a and b by 5 and then it returns a and b. And then we can actually pass the global a to local a and the global b to local b. So this is of course possible and uh, still those are separated. So let's run the cell here and here we get uh, 15 and 25. So actually uh, the local variables a and b are 15 and 25, but uh, the global variables a and b are still 10 and 20. Last but not least, let's come to a very important concept. So let's uh, create uh, the global variable a and a is 10. And let's define now the function addition with uh, one parameter, so the b parameter. And actually what uh, the function does, it actually adds uh, a and b. And here inside the function, we create uh, the local variable a, which is 100. And then we add a and b and uh, save uh, the result in the uh, function variable add. And finally we return add. So let's define the function and let's call the function by passing 20. So we have uh, b equals 20 and uh, then we calculate here 100 plus 20 and we should actually return 120. And uh, this is true. However, now let's uh, cross out here a equals 100. So we do not define inside the function, uh, the function or the local variable a and uh, therefore, so let's define the function here. And therefore, if uh, we call the function now, then first of all, Python looks in uh, the uh, local scope, uh, whether there is uh, the variable a and actually there is no variable a. And then Python goes uh, to the next higher scope. In this example, it's uh, the global scope. And here Python finds actually uh, the uh, global variable a and uh, uses uh, the value or the object that is stored in the global variable a. And if we pass uh, 20 to the addition function, now we would expect uh, the result actually 10 plus uh, 20 gives uh, 30. And this is true. So the key message is uh, that uh, Python first of all checks uh, the local scope here and tries to find uh, the variable a. And if uh, Python cannot find the variable a, then it goes uh, to the next uh, higher scope in this example here, the global scope. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. This is an introduction to NumPy arrays. And the uh, same as lists, NumPy arrays are also collections or sequences where we can store many elements. And actually NumPy arrays are much more functional and powerful than lists when we have homogeneous data. So if we only have numbers, then we can do a lot of more things uh, with the NumPy arrays than with lists. And we will see this in a minute. But first of all, let's uh, import NumPy SMP as always. 
And now let's assume that we have some kind of cash flow projections for the next six years. So for example, 50 in one year, 100 in two years and so on. And uh, as always, uh, we create here a list with uh, the six elements and uh, save the list in the variable CF. So that's uh, the list here. And uh, then we can actually convert the list into a NumPy array. And uh, we can actually do this by passing the list inside the parenthesis of np.array. And by doing so, we create a NumPy array and we save the NumPy array in the variable CF array. And here in our output, uh, we can see a NumPy array. And uh, the word array indicates uh, that uh, this is a NumPy array. And uh, we can also check uh, the data type with the type function. And here we can say that it's a NumPy ND array. So we will see later what ND array means, but it's sufficient to know that here we have uh, the NumPy array, which is a sequence of elements or values. And actually we have already seen uh, some pitfalls of lists so it's actually pretty hard to perform element-wise operations. And uh, let's assume that our projections uh, changed and there's an additional fixed cost of uh, 20 per year. So from each and every element in our list, uh, we have to deduct uh, 20. And we have seen with the uh, lists uh, that uh, this is not possible with uh, the following uh, code. So CF minus 20 does not work. And alternatively, let's assume that uh, we changed our projections and uh, there's some positive news uh, that allows us to increase our projections uh, by 10%. And it uh, would be great to actually multiply each and every element uh, with 1.1. Uh, but uh, with the lists, uh, this is actually uh, not possible. However, we can multiply a list uh, with an integer, but actually this is not element-wise operations. So by multiplying the list uh, with uh, two, we actually create two copies of uh, the list and then we concatenate the two copies into one list. So here we actually kind of doubled the list. So if we want to perform element-wise operations uh, with the lists, then we have to use uh, a for loop. So we create uh, the list uh, CF new and then we iterate over all elements in uh, CF and we deduct uh, 20 from each and every element and then we append uh, the new values uh, to uh, the new list here. So here we have all elements uh, decreased by 20. And now let's come to NumPy arrays and uh, NumPy arrays actually allow element-wise operations. So to deduct uh, 20 from each and every element in our NumPy array CFA we can simply code the CFA minus 20. And here we have all elements uh, decreased by 20. And of course we can also increase all elements uh, by 10% by multiplying the NumPy array with 1.1. Uh, and of course also we can uh, double each and every element, so this is no problem. But also here it's important to understand uh, that uh, so far we didn't modify uh, the NumPy array CFA. So it uh, has uh, still the original elements and values. So far we have used a single scalar value. So we reduced each and every element by 20 or we increased all elements uh, by 10%. But uh, now let's assume that uh, we made a more detailed uh, projection and it turns out that we should increase the first cash flow by 10, then the second cash flow by 20, and decrease the third cash flow by 10, minus 10, and so on. So we create here the new NumPy array additional cash flows. So now we have two NumPy arrays, and then we can add two NumPy arrays, and actually NumPy performs here element-wise or vectorized operations. So we could also say that uh, these two NumPy arrays are vectors. And if you recall some high school math, then uh, you might uh, remember that uh, we can add or subtract uh, vectors. And actually adding or subtracting NumPy arrays uh, works in the very same way. So let's add uh, CFA and add uh, CF. 
So now we have here 60, 120, 110. So maybe let's uh, print out again uh, CFA. So what we actually did here, we added uh, the first elements of uh, the NumPy array. So 10 plus 50, then we added uh, the second elements, 20 plus 100, uh, then the third elements, minus 10 and 120 and so on. All right, and actually NumPy arrays have uh, many methods and also attributes. And uh, one attribute is the uh, dtype. And here we can actually check uh, the data type in our NumPy array. So the data type of the elements. And here it's integer. So we have seen that uh, with NumPy arrays uh, we can perform element-wise or vectorized operations. And uh, this gives us uh, much more functionality than lists. However, there's uh, one uh, major drawback. So we have learned before that in lists uh, we can store many elements uh, with uh, different data types. So for example, here we can create uh, the list L and we have an integer, we have a float, integer, float, we have a boolean value and we have a string. But uh, this uh, we can do here with lists. However, NumPy arrays only accept uh, one data type. So now let's uh, try to convert uh, the list uh, L into a NumPy array. And here we can see in the output uh, that each and every element is a string. And we could actually say that uh, the data type string is uh, the lowest or least uh, common denominator here. So actually we can convert integers and floats uh, to string and also Boolean values. However, we cannot convert a string into an integer or float. So the lowest common denominator data type is here string. And uh, therefore we end up uh, with a NumPy array of uh, strings only. And we can also check this explicitly by iterating over the NumPy array. So of course we can also iterate over a NumPy array with a for loop. And uh, we check for each and every element in A and uh, print out uh, the data type of the element. So let's have a look here. And here we have a uh, string. So that's uh, the pitfall of NumPy arrays. So we have to make sure that uh, we have only one data type and actually NumPy arrays uh, work uh, perfectly if uh, we only have uh, numbers or so integers or floats. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. In this video we will see that indexing and slicing NumPy arrays works in the very same way as indexing and slicing lists. And also here the concepts of uh, zero-based indexing and negative indexing apply. So first of all we import NumPy as NP and uh, then we create a NumPy array by passing here a list uh, with uh, six elements or cache flows to uh, the NumPy function np.array and actually uh, we save uh, the array in the variable cf. And then we can actually index for the very first element at index position 0, so 50, also here with uh, square brackets and we pass uh, the index position 0. And uh, we can also get uh, the third element at index position 2, 120. And uh, negative indexing also applies, so we can get the last element uh, 300 at index position minus 1. Or we can also get uh, the third last element 150 at index position minus 3. Next we can also slice uh, from position 2 until 4 exclusive, so 2 inclusive and 4 exclusive. And uh, we get actually here the third element at index position 2 and uh, the fourth element at index position 3. Then we can also slice uh, the NumPy array for the first uh, three elements, 50, 100 and 120. Then we can also get all elements starting from the third element at index position 2 until the very last element inclusive. So here we have 120, 150, 200 and uh, 300. Then next we can get all elements until the very last element excluding the last element. So all elements 
except uh, the very last element at index position minus one. So here we are missing uh, 300. Then we can also get the last two elements by slicing from the second last uh, till the very last. So here we have 200 and uh, 300. And uh, then we can also get every second element. So for example, first of all, you want to get the elements uh, from index position one till four inclusive, but only every second element. So here we have 100 and 150 starting from the second element and every second element 100 and 150. And uh, finally we can also reverse uh, the order by having all elements and then every minus one element. So here we are starting with uh, 300 and ending at uh, 50. Alright, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. We have already seen one of the most powerful features of NumPy arrays, vectorized or element-wise operations. And in this lecture we will perform some more advanced vectorized operations. For instance, uh, we will calculate the net present value of an investment project with only one line of uh, vectorized NumPy code. So we import NumPy and uh, let's assume we have here projected uh, cash flows then we have already learned that we can increase um, all elements uh, by 10% and we can also add uh, 20 to each and every element. So here we've multiplied the NumPy array with a scalar value or we added a scalar value, but we can also add uh, two NumPy arrays. So let's create a second one and let's add both NumPy arrays and here we can also perform element-wise or vectorized operations. So here we added uh, the first elements, uh, 50 plus 10 is 60, the second elements, 100 plus 20 gives uh, 120 and so on. All right, now let's go back uh, to XYZ company's investment project. So we want to buy an additional machine for 200 and uh, we have uh, some uh, inflow projections here. And we want to calculate the net present value based on a required rate of return of 6%. And uh, first of all, we can create here the NumPy array with the cash flows. And we have the interest rate and the discounting factor. And uh, then we also create a NumPy array with uh, the discounting periods. So we want to discount uh, minus 200 uh, by zero periods, uh, 20 by one period and so on. And we can actually simply discount each and every cash flow by its uh, respective uh, period with the uh, vectorized NumPy code. So we have here our CF NumPy array divided uh, by F to the power of uh, N and N is here the NumPy array with uh, the uh, discounting periods. So let's simply run the cell here and here we get another NumPy array with uh, the present values uh, for all cash flows here. So the present value for minus 200 is minus 200 then uh, the present value of uh, 20 discounted by one period is 18.86 uh, and so on. So this is uh, the NumPy array with uh, the present values and we can also save uh, the NumPy array in the variable PV array present value. And then finally to get uh, the net present value we simply have to take uh, the sum over the present values. And actually also NumPy arrays have uh, plenty of uh, built-in methods and uh, one method is uh, the sum method. And here we sum up all elements in the NumPy array. So let's sum up all elements here and uh, let's assign the result uh, to the variable NPV. And no surprise uh, we get here the same result uh, 38.71. And actually we could also have this in one line of code. So here we calculate uh, the NumPy array with present values and we could uh, create here parentheses and uh, take uh, then the sum. So this is here in one line of code and uh, we get the net present value. And finally we can also compare this uh, with uh, the code that we needed when we used uh, lists and uh, for loops. So here we have actually a couple of uh, lines of code and uh, this is here definitely an improvement uh, with the vectorized NumPy code.
All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. In this video I will show you some helpful NumPy array methods and attributes. So we import NumPy SMP and uh, then we are working with our investment cash flows so that we save as a NumPy array in the variable CF. And uh, then we could determine the maximum element in our array with uh, the Python build-in function max. And here we pass the uh, CF uh, to the max function and uh, the highest element is 100. But uh, there's also a build-in method for NumPy arrays max. So let's have a look here. And it says uh, returns uh, the maximum along a given axis. So here we only have uh, one axis. So we have here a one-dimensional array. And uh, let's uh, run the cell and also here we get uh, 100. And of course we can also determine the minimum value with uh, the min method. Next we can determine uh, the index position of uh, the maximum element. So the index position of uh, the element 100 and it should be uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. And we can actually do this uh, with uh, the argmax method. So let's have a look here. So it returns indices of uh, the maximum values or the index here. And here we get 4. And we can also get uh, the index position of uh, the minimum element, so minus 200, and we should get uh, index position 0. So here we have the arc min method. And we can also sum up all elements in our NumPy array with uh, the sum method. And we can also calculate uh, the accumulated sum. So we start at uh, the very first element and uh, then we add another element and another element. So we start with minus 200, then we have minus 180, minus 130. And we've already seen that our investment project uh, breaks even in year four. So here we turn positive. So before with lists, we have seen that we need a for loop to calculate uh, the accumulated cash flows. But here we simply have a method. And let's store here the accumulated cash flows in the variable array. Then let's import matplotlib. And actually visualizing numpy arrays works in the very same way as uh, visualizing lists. So first of all, we determine a fig size of uh, 12 8 And uh, then we simply pass um, the array, our numpy array, with uh, the accumulated cash flows to the plot method. And uh, finally, of course, we have plt.show. So this is a line plot uh, with uh, the cumulative cash flows and we have here the break even uh, between year three and uh, year four. Next with uh, the sort method, we can also sort uh, the elements in our NumPy array from low to high. And it says here that uh, the sort method sorts an array in place. So we uh, change uh, the object in memory so we do not create a copy. And uh, let's have a look here. So here we have now the order from low to high. Next, let's add a float uh, to each and every element, for example, 0.0235. So now we have uh, float objects here or floats in our NumPy array. And with the round method, we can actually uh, round each and every element and uh, we can determine the number of decimals. So here we uh, define uh, two decimals. So let's have a look here, 20.0235 uh, gives uh, 20.02 and uh, so on. Now let's come to an attribute and uh, we have uh, the size attribute. So here you can identify that this is an attribute as uh, we do not have uh, parentheses, so we cannot uh, kind of call an attribute uh, like a method or a function. And uh, the size simply returns uh, the number of elements in uh, the NumPy array CF. And last but not least, we can determine also the shape of our NumPy array with uh, the attribute shape. And actually here in this case, so we have here a one-dimensional NumPy array. But uh, later in this course, we will see that we can also have uh, two-dimensional NumPy arrays with uh, rows and columns. So there, for example, we could have a shape of uh, three rows and four columns, but in a one-dimensional NumPy array. This is uh, pretty straightforward. So here we have a one-dimensional NumPy array with uh, six elements.
So these were a few methods uh, that are available. So let's have a look here, cf dot, and let's press uh, the tab key. And here we can see that uh, we have many more methods and attributes. All right, thanks a lot. And I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. NumPy universal functions are pretty similar to Python build-in functions. And uh, we can actually apply universal functions uh, not only on NumPy arrays, but also on other collections and uh, sequences like lists. So universal functions allow us to perform element-wise operations and uh, broadcasting not only on NumPy arrays, but also on lists. This sounds complicated, but uh, let's have a look how it works and we import uh, NumPy. And then we create uh, the list uh, CF uh, with uh, some numbers. And then actually we can perform an element-wise operation and take the square root on each and every element with uh, the NumPy universal function np dot the square root. So let's have a look here and here we can see that it's a universal function and it uh, returns uh, the non-negative square root of an array. And uh, this works actually element-wise. So let's run the cell here. And here we get for each and every element the square root and the output is here an array, so not a list. Next we can exponentiate each and every element, so we can calculate e to the power of uh, the element by passing a cf uh, to the numpy universal function np.exp. So here we have uh, the results and we get uh, pretty high numbers here, so this is uh, in a scientific format. And we can also square each and every element uh, with uh, the universal function np.power and we pass cf and uh, we want to square each and every element by passing here 2. But uh, we could also raise each and every element uh, to the power of uh, 3, 4 or whatever. So let's have a look here. So the first array elements are raised to the powers uh, from the second array element wise. So let's uh, run the cell here and here we get, uh, for example, 100 uh, squared or 10 squared and so on. Next, let's assume uh, the following list uh, with uh, floats. So we have cf1 and uh, with uh, the numpy universal function np.apps, uh, we can actually uh, return uh, the absolute value of each and every element. So let's have a look here. So apps uh, calculates uh, the absolute value element wise. And uh, let's run the cell here. So here we get uh, plus 200, plus 20 and so on. And we can also round each and every element in our list. And we can do this by passing the list cf1 to the function np.round. And uh, we can determine the number of decimals. So for example here 1. So for instance uh, we rounded 20.53 to 20.5. Uh, and 70.87 to 70.9. Next we can increment each and every float number to the next higher integer with uh, the function np.seal. So let's have a look here, we have minus 200.6 and the next higher integer is the minus 200. Then we have uh, 20.53 and the next higher integer is uh, 21 and so on. And we can also round all floats uh, to the next uh, lower integer value with uh, np.floor. So we have minus 200.6 and the next uh, lower integer value is minus 201. Then we have 20.53 and the next lower integer is uh, 20 and so on. All right, this were some NumPy universal functions and uh, there are many more. So in particular for math and uh, scientific uh, purposes. Thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. Early in the course uh, we have seen that we can check for each and every element in a list whether the element meets a certain condition or not and uh, we combined a for loop with a conditional statement. And uh, finally we were also able to create a new list containing those elements that uh, meet the condition and another new list uh, with uh, those elements uh, that uh, do not meet the condition. And actually uh, these workflows are way easier with numpy arrays. So we import numpy 
And uh, we have our investment project here start as a NumPy array in the variable CF. And now let's assume that uh, we want to check uh, for each and every element uh, whether the element is positive or negative. So whether it is an inflow or outflow. And actually we can uh, simply do this uh, with uh, the following code. So CF is smaller zero. So we check for each and every element whether the element is negative. And actually we get as an output also here a NumPy array with uh, Boolean values. Therefore, this is also called a Boolean array. And we can see here that we checked element-wise uh, whether the elements are negative or not. So minus 200 is negative and we have a true. And all of uh, the other numbers or elements are positive and uh, therefore we get a false here. And actually we can also store the Boolean array here in the variable negative. And uh, the same we can also do for the opposite. So we can check uh, for each and every element whether the element is uh, greater than zero, so positive. And we can store the Boolean array in the variable positive. So this is in this case exactly the opposite. So we get only a false here for minus 200 and a truce uh, for all of uh, the other elements. And now let's assume that uh, we want to create one array with um, all uh, negative elements and uh, one array with positive elements. So this is also called conditional filtering and uh, this works uh, pretty well here with NumPy arrays. So we have here our NumPy array CF and then actually we slice our NumPy array. So we open here square brackets and uh, we pass uh, the respective uh, Boolean array. So here we pass uh, the Boolean array negative and here we get uh, the array with only negative numbers. So what actually happened here, we sliced our array CF and we passed uh, the Boolean array and uh, NumPy actually only returned uh, these elements here where we have uh, corresponding uh, trues in uh, the uh, Boolean array. So here we have only one true in the very first or for the very first element and uh, therefore the output is only the very first element minus 200. And uh, the same we can also do for all positive uh, elements. So we pass uh, the Boolean array positive uh, to the CF uh, NumPy array. And actually NumPy returns back all elements except uh, the very first element uh, where we have a false here in the Boolean array positive. And of course you do not have to save uh, the Boolean array first in a variable. So we can directly code the following. So we can actually filter the NumPy array CF for all elements uh, that are negative or less than zero. And actually then we can save uh, the resulting uh, NumPy array in the variable negative. So only minus 200. And the same we can also do for positive elements. So we filter CF uh, for all positive elements greater than uh, zero. And finally, you might question whether we create here a new object or only a view on the, the original NumPy array. So it's actually not for granted uh, that uh, we created here a new object. And uh, therefore, let's uh, try this out. So we could actually change the very first element in the NumPy array positive to 30. So now let's have a look here. So we changed here the element to 30. And uh, let's also check our original NumPy array CF. And uh, still we have here 20. So by performing conditional filtering on NumPy arrays, we actually create uh, new objects. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video, bye. All right, this lecture is on advanced filtering. And it is often the case uh, that we have to filter data based on more than one condition and uh, we have already learned that we can link uh, many conditions uh, with a logical and, logical or, and not. So let's have a look at an example and let's assume that uh, we are working for the XYZ company and uh, that we are responsible for an investment project uh, with uh, the following projected cash flows here. So first of all we import NumPy and uh, then we have our projected uh, cash flows. And actually in larger companies it's uh, quite common that uh, the controlling or risk department asks for all projected cash flows uh, that are either negative or very large. So large positive or large negative. 
And in our case, uh, controlling us to filter our projections for all negative cash flows and all cash flows uh, that have an absolute value greater than 60. So we have two conditions and at least the one condition must be met. So either the cash flow is negative or very large. And uh, now let's create uh, two so-called filtering masks. So mask one and mask two. And uh, these are actually uh, Boolean arrays. So mask one is actually the array where we check for each and every element whether the element is negative. And then we check for each and every element whether the absolute uh, value is uh, greater than 60. So first of all, we calculate or transform into uh, the absolute value with uh, the uh, NumPy universal function np.apps. And then we check uh, whether the elements are greater than 60. So we want to filter out all elements or all cash flows where at least the one condition is met. So the very first uh, cash flow minus 200 uh, meets uh, both conditions. Then for the second, uh, we have a false also for the third. And then for the next two cash flows, so we have one true. So at least the uh, one condition is met. And uh, finally, for the last condition, uh, we have two falses. So no condition is met. All right, now let's uh, link mask one and mask two with an OR operator. And uh, we can actually try to do so. And uh, we get here an error message and it says the truth uh, value of an array with more than one element is ambiguous. So the problem is here that we combine uh, two sequences with uh, many elements uh, with uh, the OR operator. And uh, this does actually not work. So with uh, the OR operator, we can simply combine a true and a false or a false and a true, but we cannot combine sequences uh, with uh, Boolean values. But for these cases here, we have bitwise operators. So let's have a look. And for example, here we have uh, the bitwise operator for logical or it's uh, the pipe symbol. Then for the logical end, we have uh, the end uh, symbol. And uh, for not, uh, we have uh, the tilde symbol. So now let's go back uh, to our Jupyter notebook. And instead of combining mask one and mask two with or, we combine them with uh, the pipe symbol. And here we get a true for the first element. So true or true gives true. Then we get a false for the second. False or false gives false. Then also for the third element, false or false gives false. Then for the fourth and uh, fifth element, uh, we have uh, false or true gives a true. And finally, false or false gives a false. So by combining here mask one and mask two, we again uh, create a Boolean array and uh, we can actually filter our initial cash flow array with uh, the Boolean array here. And here we get uh, the elements or the cash flows uh, that we have to report uh, to controlling. So minus 200, it's negative and large and uh, 70 and 100, uh, which are large cash flows. And an alternative question now might be, so what are the cash flows uh, that we do not have to report? So the opposite of uh, this here. And uh, one might think that uh, we have to use here the uh, not operator. But again, here we get an error message. And instead uh, we have to use a bitwise operator. So here the tilde symbol. And here we get actually the inverted NumPy array. So for true, we get false, for false, we get true and so on. And uh, then we can also filter again our cash flow NumPy array. So the cash flows uh, 20, 50 and also 50, uh, we do not have to report to controlling. Next, let's assume that we have a closer look at the small positive cash flows. So if uh, something is going wrong, then uh, these cash flows will turn negative. And let's assume that we need to have a closer look at all cash flows uh, that are between uh, zero inclusive and uh, smaller than 30. So between zero and uh, 30 exclusive. And uh, therefore we can create mask uh, three and mask four. And actually now we want to filter out all elements uh, that uh, meet uh, both conditions. So greater than zero and uh, less than 30. And therefore we have to use here a logical end. 
And also here the end uh, does not work. And instead we have to use uh, the bitwise operator end. And here we have all small positive cash flows. So in this case only 20. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. So far we created NumPy arrays manually by passing a list to np.array. However, there are quite uh, powerful tools to create larger NumPy arrays. So first of all, let's import NumPy as NP. And uh, we've already seen that we can uh, create a list, uh, for example, with integers from zero to six with a range object and by passing a range object to the list function. And very similar to this, uh, we can uh, create a NumPy array with integers uh, from uh, zero to five with uh, the NumPy function np.arrange. And here we can pass, for example, six. And uh, we get all integers uh, by default uh, from zero until six exclusive. So now let's assume that you want to create all integers uh, from uh, one till 10 inclusive. Then we can uh, code here NP arrange from one inclusive till 11 exclusive. And similar to the range function, there's also a third alternative. So we can say that you want to have all integers uh, from one till 10, but only every second integer. So we can define here the step and here we can pass, for example, a step of two and uh, the default step is one. So here we have a one, three, five, seven, and nine. And actually in contrast uh, to the range function, uh, we are not uh, limited to integers. So for example, for the step, we can also select a float 0.5. So here we have a one, 1 1.5, two until 9.5. And also for start and stop, uh, we can have uh, floats. So for example, from 0.1 till one with a step of uh, 0.1. And here we get 0.1, 0.2 until 0.9. And now let's assume that you want to have interest rates uh, from 1% till 15% at a step of 0.1%. Then we can do this here. And here we have 1%, uh, 1.1% uh, and so on until 14.9%. So the stop point is always exclusive. However, if you want to create uh, many values within a specified interval, so for example, between one and 10, and you want to have uh, in total 10 numbers, then we can also use np.lin space. So let's have a look here. So here we have a start parameter and a stop parameter and a num parameter and the default value is 50. And actually np.lin space returns evenly spaced numbers over a specified interval. So the specified interval is from one till 10. And uh, here we can uh, define that you want to have uh, in total 10 evenly spaced numbers in that interval. And uh, this gives here one till 10, but uh, we can also have uh, the default uh, argument 50 here. So these are 50 evenly spaced numbers between one and 10. So in total we have uh, 50 numbers. And again for the start point and uh, the end point, uh, we are not uh, limited to integers. So we can also have floats here from 1% till 15%. So here we have uh, 15 evenly spaced uh, interest rates, so to say, but we can also have uh, 1000, so this is no problem. And there's actually one major application for np.lin space. And uh, let's assume that you want to plot uh, the sinus function in the interval from minus 10 till 10, then uh, we have to create uh, many x values. So in total, we create here 1000 X values in the interval minus 10 till 10. So starting with the minus 10, then minus 9.97 and so on. And in total, we have 1000 elements. And uh, then we can create uh, the Y values. So for each and every X value, we calculate the corresponding uh, sinus. 
with uh, np dot uh, and we pass here our numpy array x. And by doing so, we create a numpy array with uh, 1000 values and we save the array in the variable y. And uh, now let's uh, create the plot. So first of all, we import uh, matplotlib as uh, plt and we create a figure with fix size uh, 12 8 and then we pass um, the x array and the y array to the plot method. So let's simply run the cell here. And uh, this is actually uh, the sinus function from minus 10 till 10. So here we have uh, the x axis and uh, the y axis. And we also have here a title, so the function uh, sinus x. And last but not least, uh, we can also create uh, many ones uh, with np.ones. And here we have uh, to pass the number of ones uh, that we want to have. So here in this case, 10. And uh, the same we can also do for zero. So we can create, for example, 10 zeros with np.zeros. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. Welcome to coding exercise 7 and uh, exercise 7 is all about the numpy package and handling numerical data and uh, first of all we shall perform uh, vectorized operations so with uh, one numpy array and a scalar value and also with uh, two numpy arrays then next we shall convert a list into a numpy array and actually index and uh, slice uh, the numpy array and we can also calculate a project's uh, net present value with the uh, vectorized numpy code. Then we go on with the uh, mutability of numpy arrays and uh, creating copies. Next we shall calculate uh, the sum and uh, the highest value and the lowest value and the cumulative sum. And also some more advanced operations like uh, taking the square root. And then we have to filter a numpy array and uh, we have to use and, or, and uh, not. And then we have to create numpy arrays from scratch. And uh, finally we shall plot a function with uh, numpy. So that's uh, coding exercise 7. And if you want to do the exercise on your own, then please stop the video now. All right, now let's go on with uh, the solution. And first of all, we have to import NumPy and uh, by convention, we import NumPy as MP. And then we have some stock prices in Euro currency. And uh, first of all, let's uh, create the NumPy array with np.array. And then we shall convert uh, the prices uh, denominated in Euro currency to US dollar with an fx rate of 1.2. So we have actually here uh, the euro prices and we have to multiply each and every element uh, with 1.2 and uh, we can do this actually with uh, vectorized numpy code. So we simply multiply our numpy array a with uh, 1.2 and by doing so we get uh, the uh, prices uh, denominated in US dollar. Next we have four companies and we have two numpy arrays so one numpy array for the end of 2017 stock prices and one numpy array for the end of uh, 2018 stock prices so let's uh, create the two numpy arrays and uh, then we shall calculate the absolute uh, price increase or decrease in 2018 for all four companies and also here we can use the vectorized numpy code and uh, we can simply deduct uh, one numpy array from the other and for instance uh, the first stock increased by 2.89 from uh, 33.65 to uh, 36.54 so this is uh, the absolute price increase or decrease and we can also calculate the price return by actually having uh, the numpy array 2018 divided by the numpy array 2017 and then minus 1. And uh, for instance, uh, for the very first stock, uh, we have a positive price return of 8.59%. Uh, 
Next, we have the following cash flow list uh, with a total of six elements. And we can actually convert a list into a numpy array with uh, np.array. And uh, then we can get uh, the second uh, cash flow at timestamp one. And we can simply do this uh, with indexing. So we index uh, the numpy array A and uh, we select uh, the second element at index position one. And it's no surprise, it's minus 100. And then we can also slice uh, the array for the last two cash flows. So from index position minus two until the very last element. Then here in question seven, we shall slice uh, the array for the cash flows in T2, T3, and T4. So we actually slice from the third element at index position two inclusive until the sixth element at index position five exclusive. And here we have uh, the three elements. Here in question eight, we shall calculate a project's uh, net present value. And uh, we have already in place uh, the NumPy array with uh, the cash flows. And actually we know that uh, the required rate of return is 7.5%. And therefore we can also calculate the discounting or compounding factor F. And uh, we also can create a NumPy array with uh, the timestamps corresponding to the cash flows. And then we can calculate the net present value with the vectorized NumPy code. So actually we divide each and every cash flow by the discounting factor to the power of the respective time period or timestamp. And by doing so we calculate for each and every cash flow the present value of the cash flow. And uh, then we sum up all present values. And by doing so we get the net present value which is in this case negative and uh, therefore we shouldn't pursue the project. Here in question nine, we are still working with uh, the cash flow array and actually we shall make a slice of uh, the array by selecting all elements starting from the second element until the very last element. So these are the positive cash flows. So the NumPy array CF positive is a slice of uh, the NumPy array CF and it's actually a view on the NumPy array CF. So the variable CF positive is not referencing or pointing to an independent object, but it's uh, referencing to a slice of uh, the original NumPy array CF. And therefore, if we change uh, the slice CF positive, so for instance, if we change one element to 70, then let's have a look if we change uh, the original NumPy array CF. And obviously also here we have changed uh, the second element to 70. Now let's restore CF and actually we want to redo questions uh, 9 and 10. But this time uh, we have to make sure that uh, CF and uh, CF positive are referencing to independent objects. And actually we can do this with uh, the copy method. So we can actually uh, take a slice of CF and then we can create an independent separated object. So CF positive is now an independent object and not a view on the original NumPy array. And if we change now CF positive, then of course we do not change uh, the original NumPy array CF. So here it's still 50. In the next question, we still have uh, the NumPy array CF and uh, we shall take the total sum and we can do this uh, with uh, the sum method. And we can also get the highest value, the highest cash flow with uh, the max method. And we can also calculate the cumulative cash flows for each and every element with uh, the cum sum method. Here we have a list uh, with uh, five numbers and uh, we can actually calculate the square root of each and every element with uh, np.square root. So we pass uh, the list to np.square root. And also here this works in a vectorized uh, manner. Now let's go on and uh, we have uh, the following stock prices. So in total we have uh, six stock prices and we save uh, those uh, prices in the NumPy array A 
And in the next question, we shall filter A for all penny stocks. So penny stocks have uh, prices uh, below one. And uh, therefore, we actually filter A. And the condition is A is uh, smaller than one. So with A smaller one, we actually create a Boolean array with uh, trues and false. And then we can filter A with uh, the Boolean array. And actually, we return all elements in A that uh, fulfill uh, the condition here. And in total it's two elements, so we have 0.34 and 0.87, so those elements are below one. Now in question 17 we have uh, two conditions, so we shall filter A for all stock prices uh, that are greater than 10 and also less uh, than 50. And actually this is a logical end, so we have to fulfill both conditions and uh, we can uh, link both conditions with an end sign and then we can filter A. And no surprise, we get the prices between 10 and uh, 50, so 43 and uh, 32. Next, we shall filter A for stocks that are either penny stocks, so the prices are below 1, or have prices uh, greater than 60. And uh, this is a logical OR, so at least uh, one condition must be met. And we can combine two conditions uh, with uh, the pipe symbol, so that's actually OR. And uh, we can filter A. And here we have uh, the two penny stocks, so prices below 1. And uh, we have one stock where we have a price uh, greater than 60. And we can also get uh, the reverse of this. So actually all prices uh, between 1 and uh, 60 by using uh, the tilde symbol here for not. And uh, here we have actually three prices, so 9.87, 32.12 and 43.56. Next in question 20 we shall create a numpy array from scratch. And actually with interest rates from 0% till 10% with a step of 0.5% and we can actually do this with np.arrange and actually the low value is 0% and the high value is 0.1%, 10%. But uh, this is here actually exclusive and therefore we should use here 0.101 and the step is 0.5%. Finally, we shall plot the function cosine is x in the interval from minus 10 till 10 and we shall use 1000 data points and we can actually create 1000 evenly spaced numbers with np.linspace from minus 10 till 10 and in total 1000 uh, data points. So that's uh, the x values for the x-axis. And then we can also calculate the y values and we can pass our numpy array x with uh, the 1000 uh, numbers to np.cos, so cosinus. And then we can import matplotlib and we can create the graph with uh, figure size 128 uh, and we can pass x and y to plt.plot. So let's have a look here. And uh, this is actually here the cosinus function. Alright, this was coding exercise 7. I hope you had fun and uh, see you in the next exercise. Bye. We've already learned that lists are collections where we can store many elements. And so far we had numbers, strings and booleans in a list. But we can also put other lists into a list and uh, this is a so-called nested list. And now let's assume that we have uh, three investment projects and uh, with uh, the cash flow streams. So we have project one, project two and project uh, three. And uh, the term is actually different for those projects. For project one we have uh, the initial investment and then we have uh, five years of inflows. And for project two we have four years of inflows. And for project uh, three we have uh, seven years. So let's save uh, those lists in the variables project1, project2 and uh, project3. And then we can actually create a nested list with uh, the three project lists here. And uh, we save uh, the nested list in the variable all projects. 
And here we can actually see the outer square bracket. So this is a list. And uh, within the list, we have a list with uh, the cash flows for project one. Then we have another list uh, with project two and a third list uh, with uh, the project uh, three cash flows. And of course, uh, this is here also a list. So a nested list, but it's a list with uh, in total uh, three elements. So we have uh, three lists in the list. And then we can actually select the uh, single elements of the list. So for instance, we can select uh, the very first list at index position zero. And that are the cash flows for project one. But we can also get the very last list at index position two or alternatively at index position minus one. And we can also create slices. So let's slice uh, the nested list uh, for the first two lists or the first two elements. So here we have uh, project one and project two. And of course you can also get the last uh, two lists. And now we can also chain index operations, for instance, two index operations. And let's assume that we are interested in the initial investment uh, for project one. Then first of all, we can select project one. So the list by passing here zero at index position zero. And this gives actually the list for project one. And then we can select the very first element. And here we have minus 200. So we simply chained here two index operations. Now let's assume that we are interested in the initial investment for all three projects. And it would be great if we can also do this here by chaining index operations, but uh, this is actually not possible with lists. So we could use uh, the following code. We could say that uh, for all projects, so for all three lists, we want to have uh, the very first element. But this actually didn't work. So we have here the list for project one. And the reason is uh, that the first index operation simply gives us um, all three elements of the list. And uh, then we select uh, the first element, so the first list. And in fact, to get uh, the initial investment for all three projects, we actually need to use a for loop. And therefore we create the empty list uh, initial investment. And then we iterate over the projects or over the lists in the nested list. And for each list of each project, uh, we take the very first element, so in the investment, and append the investment to the list uh, I0. And this is actually our desired result. So here we have uh, the initial investment for the three projects. So as a summary, working with uh, nested lists is uh, pretty limited. And if we have kind of a two-dimensional or tabular data, then we should better use uh, two-dimensional NumPy arrays. And this complete section is all about two-dimensional NumPy arrays. Thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. All right, in this lecture, we will make our very first steps with two-dimensional NumPy arrays. And it's two dimensions because we have rows and columns with numerical data. So first of all, let's import NumPy SNP. And we are starting with an easy case where we have uh, three lists uh, with uh, the same shape. So we have here six elements in each list. And later we will relax uh, this assumption. So we have uh, the list CF1, CF2 and CF3. And uh, we actually create the nested list uh, NL with uh, those uh, three lists. So here we have a nested list. And uh, then we can create a two-dimensional NumPy array by passing the nested list uh, to np.array. And we get actually a two-dimensional NumPy array and we have rows and columns. And each row is actually one project. So the first row is uh, the project one, the second project two and so on. And uh, we have in total six columns. So the very first column there we have uh, the initial investments. And in the very last column, we can see the cash flows uh, for the year five. Now let's save uh, the two-dimensional NumPy array in the variable CFS. And let's also check the type. So this is a NumPy array as well. And uh, there's uh, the attribute shape where we can uh, check uh, the shape of the NumPy array. And here in this case, it's uh, three, six. And uh, this means that we have uh, three rows and six columns. 
And now let's perform some simple indexing and slicing operations so we can get uh, the very first row and the very first project by having here square brackets and uh, the index position of uh, the very first row, it's uh, zero. So also zero based indexing and negative indexing applies here. And we can also get the very last row at index position minus one or two alternatively. And we can also slice so we can get uh, the last uh, two rows or the, the last two projects uh, with uh, one colon. And let's assume now that you want to get the initial investment for the very first project minus 200. And we can do this by chaining indexing operations. So first of all, we can select the very first row and the very first project. And this gives here actually a one-dimensional NumPy array. And then we can index for the very first element minus 200. So here we have chained and uh, used the uh, two indexing operations, but uh, with uh, two-dimensional NumPy arrays, we can also do this in one indexing operation. And we can open here the square brackets and uh, we have here a comma. And on the left-hand side of the comma, we can define uh, the row or the index position of uh, the row or the rows that we want to slice or index for. And on the right-hand side of the comma, we can define the index position for the column or columns. So in our example here, we want to get the element in the very first row at index position zero, in the very first column at index position zero. And uh, this also gives minus 200. All right, uh, these were some easy and uh, straightforward indexing and slicing operations. And in the next video, we will have a look at uh, some more advanced uh, indexing and slicing operations with uh, two-dimensional NumPy arrays. Thanks for watching and I'll see you there. Bye.
Hi and welcome to the very first lecture on pandas and pandas data frames. In this and the next lectures and sections, you will learn pandas coding from scratch. But before we move to Jupyter Notebooks and start coding, first of all, I want to introduce uh, the concept of tabular data and some terms and vocabulary that I will frequently use in this course. So in the whole course, we will work with uh, data that is organized in a tabular manner. And in pandas, uh, this is a so-called pandas data frame. So that's a data frame here with uh, five famous football players, for instance, uh, Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. And actually each row here is uh, one football player. For instance, uh, we have the row Cristiano Ronaldo with uh, some features or characteristics of uh, this player here. For instance, uh, we have the nationality or the club or also the height. So the height is uh, one column of uh, this data frame here. And actually we can see that the height of uh, Cristiano Ronaldo is uh, 1.87 meters. And uh, 1.87 is also called an element, a value or an entry of the data frame. And we can also have uh, slices or subsets. So here we have only two players and only uh, the columns nationality and club. And we can also say that tabular data or pandas uh, data frames are two-dimensional, so we have uh, two axes, we have rows and columns. And actually all rows and columns are labeled. And uh, first of all, we have uh, the so-called uh, row index or simply the index. And uh, each and every element here is called an index label. So Neymar Jr. is uh, the label of uh, this row here. And uh, the index uh, shouldn't be mixed up with the columns. So the index is uh, not the first uh, column of the data frame, it's uh, the index, that's the difference. And a row index can also have a name. So the row index name, in this case, it's a player, but it could also be player name or whatever. And uh, second, uh, we have uh, the column index or short uh, columns. And the elements in the column index are called uh, column labels or column headers. And last but not least, there's an optimal data organization in data frames and uh, we should always have the observations in the rows. So the observations here are the football players and each uh, single row should be uh, one observation or one football player. And in the columns, we should have the characteristics, uh, the variables or the features of uh, the observations. So for instance, uh, the height is a characteristic or a feature of a football player. So when working with data frames, we should always have uh, this structure here to have uh, the full functionality of a data frame. And uh, the reason for this is uh, the following. So we should make sure that uh, we have only one data type per column. And let's have a look here if uh, this is uh, the case in our example. So we have uh, the nationality column with the uh, string or text data. Then we have uh, the club column with the uh, string or text data. Then we have uh, the world champion uh, column that indicates uh, whether the player already won the world championship or not. And uh, here we have uh, bool or boolean values. Then next uh, we have uh, the height column where we have uh, floats. So with uh, two decimals, 1.70 for instance. And finally we have uh, the column goals, 218, with uh, the number of goals that the player scored in the year 2018. And here we have uh, integers. So in this case we have an optimal data organization and uh, we can be sure that uh, we have full or maximum functionality. And uh, in case uh, we have uh, mixed data types in some columns, this can uh, restrict the functionality of the complete data frame and uh, this can cause severe problems. All right, this was a short overview on tabular data and pandas data frames. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. All right, after having imported the data, we are coming now to the next and one of the most important steps when working with data, the very first inspection. And typically when working with data and with uh, new data sets, we don't know much about the data and before we can start with our primary task, and this can be explanatory data analysis, data visualization, statistical analysis, machine learning or whatever. So before we can start with this, uh, we need to perform a very first inspection and based on that first inspection, we can plan the next steps. For instance, we could come to the conclusion that we need additional data or that we need to clean the data or transform the data or handle missing values or whatever. 
And it is very often the case uh, that uh, this first inspection is underestimated. However, coming from the business side, I have to emphasize uh, that understanding your data and understanding your task is the uh, key to success. So we have still imported the Titanic data set and uh, we have saved it in the variable Titanic. And here we can see the first five rows and the last five rows and also the column headers or column labels. And in the vast majority of cases, uh, this is already sufficient to get a very first impression. So here we can see we have 891 rows and actually 891 observations and each and every observation or each row is here one passenger on board of the Titanic and uh, we have nine columns. And each column is actually a characteristic or a feature of uh, the particular passenger. So here on the left side, uh, we can see uh, the index of our data frame. And uh, the default index is actually a range index. And a range index simply consecutively numbers uh, the rows. So starting uh, with uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 and uh, until 890. And typically when importing data from a CSV file, by default, uh, we can see here a range index. And now let's come uh, to the columns. So first of all, we have uh, the survived column. And uh, this indicates uh, whether the passenger survived the disaster or not. And actually zero stands uh, for the passenger did not survive. And one stands for survived. Then we have uh, the passenger class. So in total, we had uh, three passenger classes, so one, two, and three. And uh, one was, of course, uh, the first class. Next, we have uh, the gender or the sex of the passenger. So we have, of course, the uh, males and females. Then uh, we have uh, the age in years, so for instance, here 22. Then next, we have the column SIP SP, and this stands for siblings and spouses. And this is actually for each and every passenger the number of uh, siblings and the spouses of uh, this passenger on board of the Titanic. Then we have PARCH which stands for parents and children. And this indicates uh, the number of parents and children of that particular passenger that were also on board of the Titanic. So the very first passenger here was a 22 year old male passenger in the third class and he obviously did not survive uh, the disaster. And he also had uh, probably his uh, wife on board. Then next uh, we have uh, the fare or the ticket price. And uh, I don't know if uh, this is in dollar or in British pound, but uh, this passenger paid uh, 7.25 uh, dollar or pound for the ticket. Then next we have the port of embarkation. And uh, for instance, S stands for Southampton. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, the deck where the cabin of the passenger was located. And uh, for instance, here we have uh, the C deck or the B deck. And we can also see some values called NAN. And uh, this stands for not a number. And this indicates uh, missing values. So for instance, uh, for this passenger here, we simply do not know the age. And typically when working with three world data, Missing values are very common and actually pandas is uh, designed uh, to work with and handle missing values. So this is a very important concept and we will go into much more detail later in this course. Next, uh, there's one very important method uh, for data inspection. It's uh, the info method. So let's run the cell here. And the info method is actually one of uh, the most important methods in pandas as it uh, summarizes uh, the data frame and shows important meta information at a glance. So let's have a look at the output here. And first of all, we can see uh, the data type or the class uh, that uh, the object uh, that is stored in Titanic belongs to. And it's obviously a pandas data frame. Next, uh, we can get some information on the index. And we've already seen that here we have a range index uh, with 891 entries from 0 to 890. And then we get an overview on uh, the columns. So we have nine columns. And uh, these columns here are consecutively numbered from 0 to 8. And uh, first of all, here we have the column label. Then we have the non null count, uh, which uh, gives us actually the number of uh, non missing values. So in total we have 891 entries and obviously 
in the survived column and in the p-class column and the sex column we have no missing values so we have 891 non-null or non-missing values but uh, here in the h column we can see that we have 177 uh, missing values and also in the embarked column we have two missing values and uh, we have over 600 missing values in the deck column Finally, we have also some information on the data type in the columns. And it's actually no surprise that in the survived and p-class column, we have integer. Then in the sex column, we have a so-called object data type. And actually this stands either for string or text data or also for mixed data types. So whenever we have object, it's not 100% clear whether we have uh, string or text data, but uh, this is uh, pretty likely. Then next in the H column, we have float data. So here we have one decimal, 35.0 for instance. Then in the SIPSP and in the patch columns, we have integers. So we have actually uh, zero parents or two parents and children and so on. And uh, finally in the embark column and deck column, this is also here an indication that we have string or text data. So this makes sense. Here we have uh, S, uh, C, C, B, and so on. And finally, we get here a summary of the data types. So we have uh, two columns uh, with floats, four columns with integers, and uh, three columns with uh, the data type object. And last but not least, we also have uh, the memory usage. So this is a very small data set with uh, 62.8 kilobyte. But of course, we could also have uh, data frames or data sets uh, with uh, megabytes or even gigabytes. So again, the info method is uh, really useful and helpful. And actually, the functionality and the behavior of a data frame is determined by only a few things. It's uh, the index. So a range index behaves uh, different than a daytime index uh, with the uh, daytime information. And uh, second, uh, we have the columns and the data types in the columns. And last but not least also the missing values. So these factors actually determine the functionality of our data frame. And we can see those factors at a glance uh, by calling the info method. So as a summary before and also while you're working with your data and your data frame, you should uh, regularly check your data frame with the info method. And to draw an analogy, when you go by car, you regularly check fuel, oil and speed to reach your destination safely. And that's exactly the same with the data frames and the info method. All right. And uh, finally, let's have a look at uh, the very helpful method to describe. And by default, the describe method uh, returns uh, some summary statistics on numerical columns. So here we have the numerical columns survived, P class, H, and so on. And first of all, we have here count. So this is uh, the number of uh, non-missing values. Then we have uh, the mean value. And the mean value in the survived column actually stands uh, for the survival rate. So in total, 38% of all passengers uh, survived uh, the disaster as uh, we have uh, one for survived and uh, zero for not survived. Then we have uh, the standard deviation of the values and uh, also the minimum. So the youngest passenger on board was, for example, 0.42 years, and actually that's a baby. Then we have uh, the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, which is actually also the median. And that means uh, that, for instance, 50% of all passengers uh, were younger than 28 and 50% uh, uh, were older than 28 years. And also we have uh, the 75th percentile and finally also the maximum values. So the highest fare or the highest ticket price was 512. And actually with uh, the describe method, we can also analyze the non-numerical data. So let's copy here. And let's paste. And uh, then we can use uh, the include parameter. And here we can pass uh, capital O. And uh, by doing so, we actually select all columns where the data type is object. And typically, these are non numerical columns uh, with uh, text data. So let's run the cell here. And here we have a summary for the sex embarked and deck column. 
So count also stands for the number of non-missing values. Then unique uh, actually indicates uh, the number of unique values. So in the sex column, we only have male and female. Then next uh, we have uh, the most frequent value and uh, this is here in the sex column male and uh, the frequency is 577. All right, this was uh, the very first inspection of our data. And uh, by simply inspecting the data and uh, by running two or three methods here, we uh, already know quite a lot about the data. And uh, this helps uh, for our further analysis. So thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next video. Bye. We are coming now to one of the most frequently used operations in Pandas, selecting one or many columns. And we have still imported and saved uh, the Titanic dataset. And you might recall from sequences like lists, uh, strings or numpy arrays that we can index uh, these objects and uh, select certain elements with uh, these square brackets index operator. So let's uh, try this out here. And then we can open uh, square brackets and actually to select one column we can simply pass uh, the column label as a string, so within uh, quotation marks. And let's assume that you want to select uh, the H column. Then we can simply uh, code here H. And now let's run the cell here. And here we have only the H column, the first five elements and also the last five elements. And on the left hand side, uh, we can still see uh, the range index. And actually the output here is a so-called panda series. So actually the pandas library has uh, some data types. So uh, we already know the pandas data frame. And uh, this is here a panda series. And we could say that a panda series is uh, very similar to a data frame, but a series only shows uh, one column or one row. So to say it's a one dimensional labeled array and it's uh, called labeled because still we have here the index. So the values in the H column here are still uh, labeled with uh, the index labels. And later in the course we will have a closer look on panda series, but uh, for the time being you should uh, simply notice uh, that uh, this is here a panda series. And the name of uh, the series is actually uh, the former column label H. And here we can see that in total we have 891 elements and the data type is uh, float. And we can also check the data type with uh, the type function. So let's go here to command mode and uh, let's uh, copy and paste with uh, C and uh, V. And let's uh, use here the uh, type function. And no surprise, so this is a panda series. So now we have selected uh, one column, but now let's assume that you want to select uh, two or many columns. And again, let's uh, copy here and let's uh, paste. Now let's assume that you want to select uh, the age column and also the uh, sex column. Then uh, let's try the following. So let's uh, pass here age and sex. And here we get an error message. And it says here key error. So there's uh, no column label that uh, consists actually of a tuple with age uh, and sex. But of course, uh, there's a workaround for this. So let's uh, again uh, paste here the code. And actually, if we want to get uh, two or many uh, columns, then we have to pass uh, the column labels as a list. So we have to create here a list and actually pass h and uh, sex as uh, two elements of the list. And now let's also close uh, the list here and uh, let's again run the cell. And here we get now the two columns h and sex. And obviously if we select uh, two or many columns, uh, then the output is again a pandas data frame. And we can also check this here. So this is a pandas data frame. Now let's again uh, copy and paste the code. 
and actually we have coded h and sex and uh, therefore the sequences here h and sex but uh, we can also change uh, the sequence so first of all we have uh, sex and uh, then we have h and by doing so we can also change uh, the output so let's have a look here and now we have uh, the sequence sex and h and finally we can also select uh, multiple columns so let's uh, copy and paste and uh, for instance, we can also select uh, the fair column. So we code comma and fair. And here we have now the three columns. And actually before we have seen that if we select only one column, then uh, the output by default is a panda series. But uh, if we pass only one column also within a list. So let's try this out here. And now let's create a list uh, with only one element, so the h. Then here we get obviously a pandas data frame and we can also check this here. So when selecting only one column, you might ask yourself whether it's uh, beneficial to have a series or a data frame. And we will see later in the course, uh, in the vast majority of cases, it doesn't matter as uh, series and data frames share most of the methods. So there are only very few methods uh, that only work for data frames. And there are very few methods uh, that we can only use on series. But uh, generally speaking, most of uh, the methods are available for both types. All right, thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next lecture. Bye. Hi and welcome back. There's also a second alternative to select one column and we can use uh, the uh, dot notation or attribute notation. And uh, we have still imported uh, the Titanic data frame or data set. And a data frame with uh, the column age has also an attribute uh, dot age. And let's run the cell. And here we can see the age column and also here this is a panda series with uh, 891 elements. So when selecting one column, the dot notation and the square brackets notation are equivalent and uh, lead uh, to the same output. And we can also check this uh, with uh, the equals method. So let's have a look inside here with shift tab. And uh, the equals method uh, tests whether two objects uh, contain the same elements. And let's uh, copy here our code uh, where we selected the h column with uh, the square brackets notation. And let's paste it here inside uh, the uh, method equals. And now let's run the cell. And here we can see that we get a true. So both alternatives uh, lead uh, to the very same result, um, the h column. And there's actually some controversy which alternative uh, to prefer. And uh, some people argue that uh, we shouldn't use uh, the dot notation as it can lead to errors in some cases uh, where we have unclean data. For instance, uh, the dot notation does not work in case uh, the column label contains uh, white spaces. And actually I don't agree with that because uh, we should avoid to work uh, with unclean data anyway and we should uh, clean the data before we start uh, with our primary tasks. So I use both alternatives but I'm pretty lazy and I prefer the dot notation as it is uh, less to code. So for instance, to get the embarked column, I simply use uh, the tab completion twice and uh, that's it. So I start with the uh, Titanic, then I use uh, tab and enter dot and then I start with emp and also here I use um, the autocomplete and that's it. All right, thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next lecture. Bye. In the next two lectures, you will learn how to select the rows, columns and elements of a data frame by their positions. And uh, this is called position-based indexing. For instance, you will learn how to select uh, the second row or the last row or the first two columns of a data frame or even more complicated, the element that is located in the seventh row and third column. But before I want to recap two fundamental concepts that are valid not only for pandas but uh, for Python in general and also for other programming languages, it's uh, zero-based indexing and negative indexing. And you might recall from sequences like lists, strings, or numpy arrays that uh, the very first element is at index position zero, 
then the second element is at index position 1 and so on. So we start uh, with uh, the position 0. And that's uh, the reason why it's called zero-based indexing. So zero-based indexing also applies uh, for pandas data frames. And the only difference is uh, that a data frame is two-dimensional. So we have rows and columns. And therefore we have index positions for rows and also for columns that uh, follow the zero-based indexing concept. So first of all, let's focus on uh, the column index positions. And uh, just to recap here, so player here is not a column but the index and therefore the very first uh, column is nationality at index position 0. Then we have club at index position 1 and so on. And the same applies also for the row index. So we have uh, the very first row, Lionel Messi, and uh, this row is at uh, row index position 0. Then we have uh, Cristiano Ronaldo at index position 1, and uh, so on. So this is uh, zero-based indexing, but uh, there's also a second concept, and it's called negative indexing. And uh, this can be applied as well. So we can either use uh, zero-based indexing or negative indexing, and it uh, depends on the specific case which one makes more sense. And now let's have a look. So negative indexing means uh, that uh, the very last column is at index position minus 1, that's uh, the goals to 18 column. Then uh, the second last column is at index position minus 2 and so on. So finally the very first column nationality is at index position minus 5. And of course uh, this also applies uh, for the row index, so the very last row, Manuel Neuer, has the index position minus 1, and then we have minus 2, minus 3, and so on. And actually, for your convenience, you can find uh, this slide uh, for download in the attachment of uh, this lecture. All right, thanks for watching, and see you in the next uh, video. Bye. In this video, I will briefly summarize what we have learned so far, and it's more than just a summary. So in anticipation of later and more advanced lectures, I will show you best practices and uh, you might have recognized that sometimes uh, there are different ways how to do the very same thing, but even if you get uh, the same result or the same output, the ways can still differ in the background, and they're actually best practices and non-optimal solutions uh, that can cause uh, problems later on. And finally, I will give you an outlook on the upcoming sections and lectures. So let's start, and uh, we should always import pandas SPD. And then we can import a dataset from a CSV file with uh, pd.readcsv. And we can also determine uh, a column that uh, should be the index. And then we can simply print and inspect uh, the data frame. So by default we can see the first five rows and the last five rows. And it's uh, always advisable to have a look at the info method to get uh, some more information on our data frame. And this could enable us uh, to identify potential problems in our data frame. Then next uh, we have two options uh, to select uh, one column. It's uh, the dot notation or with uh, square brackets. So you can uh, use both. Then uh, we have actually two options how to select multiple columns. And first of all we have uh, the square brackets and we can pass a list uh, with column labels. And uh, we can do the same with uh, the log operator. So we actually slice for all rows and uh, the columns say year and metal. And actually the result or the output of uh, both alternatives is uh, the same. But uh, there is a difference in the background. And I would highly recommend to use only uh, the log alternative. So later on when it comes to manipulating elements in a data frame, then uh, the uh, square brackets notation with uh, more than one column could cause uh, some problems. So you should definitely use the log even if it's a bit more to code, but uh, that's uh, the best practice here. And next uh, we can select the positional rows with ilog, for instance from index position 10 inclusive until 21 exclusive. And we can also perform label-based indexing and select the labeled rows with uh, log. 
So here we get all instances of uh, Carl Lewis. Finally, let's assume that you want to get all rows uh, with Carl Lewis and only the columns year, event, and medal. Then actually, we have uh, three alternatives, and uh, two alternatives are bad practice, and only one alternative is uh, recommended. So, first of all, let's start uh, with uh, two non optimal solutions. And actually, we could uh, first of all select uh, the columns year, event, and medal with uh, the square brackets notation. So, let's cross out uh, the log. And here we get all rows and uh, the columns here, event and medal. And then we can chain another indexing operation with log and select uh, all rows with Carl Lewis. So this works actually, but uh, this can cause uh, some problems in the background. And we can also do this uh, the other way around. So first of all, we select uh, all rows with Carl Lewis uh, with uh, the log operator. And uh, here we get uh, all rows with Carl Lewis and all columns. And uh, then we chain another indexing operation and select only the columns here, event, and medal. So this works as well, but also here we have uh, kind of uh, two indexing operations. So we chain indexing operations like here. So here we have two. This is uh, the first indexing operation, and here the second, and also here. This is uh, the first, and here the second. This is called chained indexing and this can cause severe problems later on when we want to create uh, slices or copies of a data frame and uh, if we want to manipulate elements in a data frame. So that's definitely bad practice. And finally let me show you the best practice uh, that is highly recommended. And actually we index and slice our data frame for rows and columns. And uh, we should do this in one indexing operation only. And it's uh, pretty straightforward to do this uh, with uh, the log operator. So we have log and uh, then on the left hand side of the comma we select uh, the rows, Carl Lewis, and on the right hand side uh, we select the columns. So let's run the cell here. And uh, the output is uh, the same but in the background it's a bit different. And again, this is only one indexing operation, but uh, these two examples here, we have uh, two indexing operations, chained indexing, and this is bad practice, so don't do this. All right, now let's have a short outlook on the upcoming uh, sections and lectures. And there are actually three major data types or classes in pandas. It's uh, the data frame. And uh, so far we have actually worked with the data frames. So here we have, for instance, uh, the summer data frame with the rows and columns. And uh, second, we have panda series. So only one uh, column or one row is a panda series. And one example is um, the year column. This is a panda series. And uh, finally, we have uh, index objects. So if we select either the columns index or the row index uh, with the attribute columns, then uh, this is here an index object. And also if we uh, select here the row index, so this is also an index object. And before we go on with the data frames, in the next lectures, we will go deeper into pandas series and uh, pandas index objects. So thanks for watching and uh, see you there. Bye. This is uh, the first lecture on pandas series and we've already learned that pandas data frames, pandas series and pandas indexes are the three major classes or data types in pandas. And when selecting only one column or one row of a data frame, we typically get a pandas series. So let's have a look and uh, we import pandas and also the titanic data set. And we already know that we have nine columns in the titanic data frame and uh, then we can select one column, for instance the H column with uh, the square brackets notation. And uh, this gives a panda series, so let's also check this here with uh, the type function. And actually a panda series is a one-dimensional labeled array. So we have an array with 891 elements and these elements are labeled with uh, the very same index labels that uh, we have in uh, the data frame and it's here a range index. So the passenger with index label 0 is uh, 22 years old and we can find uh, the very same passenger also here in the data frame. 
And we've already learned uh, that there's also a second alternative how to select uh, one single column. And it's uh, with uh, the daughter attributes notation, titanic.h. And uh, this gives uh, the very same result as uh, the square brackets notation. So let's save for the h column in the variable h. And actually pandas data frames and panda series uh, share most of uh, the methods and attributes. So there are only very few methods uh, that are only available for data frames and very few methods uh, that are only available for panda series. And uh, for instance, let's try to call the head method on the panda series age. And uh, this works. So here we have the first five elements and we can also customize uh, this and select, uh, for instance, uh, the first two elements. Then next also we can call the tail method on uh, the panda series age. And uh, there's uh, the attribute dtype and here we can check the data types in the panda series. And it's no surprise that it is a float. Then next we can check the shape. And here we get the result that we have 891 elements. And uh, then we can also pass uh, a pandas series uh, to a Python build-in function, for instance, uh, the length function. And also here we get uh, the number of elements in the panda series, 891. Now we've already seen that a panda series is a one-dimensional labeled array. And we can also get the labels or the index uh, with uh, the index uh, attribute. So here we have uh, the range index uh, from 0 till 891. Then next let's uh, try to call the info method on our panda series age. And here we get an error and it says uh, that uh, the series object has no attribute info. So the info method is only available for a panda data frame. And finally, there's uh, the method toFrame, and with uh, toFrame, we can uh, convert a panda series into a pandas uh, data frame with only one column. So let's have a look here. And here we have now a data frame with uh, the column age, and of course, still we have on the left hand side uh, the range index. And now we could also call the info method on our data frame. So this is kind of a workaround. And uh, this works uh, pretty well. So here we can see that we have only one column. It's uh, the H column. All right, these were the very first steps uh, with the Panda series. And in the next lectures, we will go into a more detail. So hope to see you there. Bye. In this video, you will learn when and why to use the copy method. So first of all, we import your pandas and uh, we import our Titanic data set. So that's uh, the first five rows here. And in the last videos, we selected a numerical or a non-numerical column and we analyzed the column and uh, played around with it. That's a typical workflow with pandas, selecting a subset of a data frame, for example, a column and uh, playing around with it. But uh, actually, we do not want to change uh, the original data frame. And uh, that sounds easy, but uh, there's a severe pitfall here that causes uh, one of uh, the most frequently made mistakes when working with pandas. Again, we select here the H column and uh, save for the H column in the variable H here. And let's have a look. So these are the first five elements. And uh, let's assume that we want to change uh, the third element here at index position two. And the passenger here is not uh, 26 years old, but uh, 29 years old. And we can actually change and override that element by selecting the element here, for example, with the ilog operator and uh, we assign the new value 29. So let's do this here. And here we get a warning message, um, the so-called uh, setting with copy warning. And it says here a value is trying to be set on a copy of a slice from a data frame. So this sounds weird actually, but let's simply have a look um, what we did here with our code. So we have a look here first of all on our H column here. So that's uh, the five elements. And we can see here that we changed uh, the third element from 26 to 29. And let's also have a look here at our Titanic data frame. And the intention was actually not to change uh, the element here in the overall data frame, but uh, that's exactly what we did here. So also here we have uh, 29. And that's uh, really a severe pitfall here in Pandas. So we only intended to change an element in a slice of a data frame, so here in our H column, but uh, we effectively changed also the overall data frame. 
And uh, there's a simple workaround uh, to prevent uh, this behavior here. And uh, let's go up again here. So let's uh, rerun here the cells. So again, we uh, import here the Titanic uh, CSV file. So again, here we have uh, 26. And now we want to select uh, the H column and we want to play around uh, with the H column, but uh, we do not want to change uh, the original data frame. And uh, there's a simple workaround. So we uh, chain here the copy method. And by doing so, pandas creates a separate object. So our H column that is uh, stored in the variable H is uh, completely independent now from our Titanic data frame. And uh, before without uh, the copy method, the object uh, that was stored in the variable H was not independent uh, from the data frame. And in fact, uh, the object that was stored in the variable H was a view on the data frame. So it was actually still part of the overall data frame. And we can prevent this uh, by creating here a copy. And uh, let's do this here. And let's uh, repeat the process uh, that uh, we change here the third element uh, to 29. And here we can see uh, we do not get any warning message. And let's also check here the consequences on uh, the object uh, that is stored here in the variable H. So here again we have changed uh, the third element. But here in our original data frame, we did not change uh, the element. So here we have uh, still 26. So that's uh, the most important uh, use case for the copy method. And uh, with this, we are finished here. And I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye. In this video, we will have our first steps with uh, the pandas index object. And first of all, let's import the pandas. And we also import our Summer Olympics uh, medals data set and store it in the variable summer. And we have a look at the first five rows and uh, the last five rows. And we can call the info method to have a look at uh, some metadata. And we can call the attribute index. And with the, the attribute index, we can get information on our row index and the row index labels. Here we have a range index starting from 0 till 31,164. So we can also check uh, the type of um, the index here. And it's a pandas index range index. And we can do the same um, with uh, the columns. So we can get uh, additional information on our column index and our column labels with the attribute columns. So we can see here that it is a index object um, with um, here the index labels or column labels. And we can also check um, the data type and it's a index object here. And actually here it, it looks a bit like an, an list or an array. However, compared to a list or an array, the index uh, object or index data type has uh, special methods and attributes uh, specifically designed for large data sets. So with index objects, you can do much more than, for example, with a list. And that's why developers of Pandas created the index object to allow special index operations. And with uh, the attribute axes, we can have a look at both row index and column index. So here we can see for the row, we have a range index and uh, the column index is a index with uh, the following labels here. And we already learned that we can customize um, the import with uh, the read CSV method. And we can say that as uh, index column, we want to have, for example, the column athlete. So now we have here on the left side um, the athlete column as a row index. Uh, let's run here. And now if we call the index attribute, we get here the new index uh, with our index labels. So the athletes here. And the type of the index is not a range index, but an index uh, with uh, string objects. All right. And also with index objects, we can select and uh, slice single and multiple elements of uh, the index object. So for example, if you want to slice uh, the columns index for the first three elements, we can slice from the very first element until the fourth element at index position 3 excluding. So here we have uh, the first three elements.
So this is position-based indexing with all the rules of uh, zero-based indexing. And we can also select in the row index in the first element, for example. It's Alfred Hayos and the last element. It's Jimmy Litberg. And we can make slices from the 100th position until the 102nd position, excluding. So I would expect to have two elements here. So we have Alfred Flato and Gustav Felix Flato, so that's maybe brothers. So before we said that uh, the index object has specific uh, methods and attributes, which uh, makes it so powerful, but uh, yeah, actually it looks like a list and we can transform also a index object into a list with uh, the method uh, to list. So now before we had uh, the index object, the column index object here is our elements and we saw here that it's an index object and here we have just in the list with the year, city, sport, discipline, country, gender, event and medal. And before we learned that with the label based indexing it makes a difference if we have only unique values in our index or if we have uh, also duplicates. So if we selected Michael Phelps we got all occurrences in the data frame and if we only have uh, unique values or labels in our index we get only single results organized in the panda series. And also with the label-based slicing, so for example, if we slice for all rows from the beginning of our data frame until Michael Phelps, it does not work because um, yeah, slicing with the duplicates uh, does not work actually. And there it definitely makes sense to check our index if uh, there are duplicates or if uh, all labels are unique and uh, there is um, the attribute is unique. And here in our summer index with our athletes, we get a false. And last but not least, uh, there is another attribute called getLoc. And if we pass a index label to getLoc, we get um, the position of uh, the index label. So let's try Dimitrios Rivas. And we get a 2. So this is index position 2. And we know that uh, zero base indexing applies. So let's check it. Here we have our index object and at position 0 we have Alfred Hayos, at position 1 Otto Herschmann and at position 2 Dimitrios Rivas. Alright, so now we are finished with this session and I hope to see you in the next session. Bye! In this video we learn how to change column labels of our data frame. So first of all let's import pandas as always and we import our titanic data set. And we have a look at the first five rows and the last five rows. And then we can have a look at our column labels uh, with uh, the attribute dot columns. So it's here survived, p class, sex, age, and so on. So same as here above. And we can also index our column index object, for example, for the first element. So the first element at the index position 0, it's survived. And now let's assume that we are not happy with um, the word survived. So we, we would like to change it to alive, for example. And we can try to do so by setting alive as uh, the new value. So let's try this out. And here we get an error message. Uh, index does not support mutable operations. So same with uh, row index objects, also column index objects are immutable. So we can only change them the whole index by passing a list or a sequence with new values that has uh, yeah, actually the same amount of elements uh, in our index. So in our example here we have uh, nine elements and we can pass a list with nine elements. So for example we can say that our column labels should be alive, class, sex, age, Zip SP, parents and children, fair, embarked and deck. So for each column label we pass here a new column label. And let's try this out. And let's have a look at the first five rows. So now we can see here we have changed all column labels. So we have here alive, uh, class, sex and so on. And we can also set a name for our column index object. So there's the attribute name. And uh, so far we do not have a name for our index object, so we get nothing here. But we can change um, this for example to a passenger characteristics. So now let's see again here. And there you can see here 
we have a name now for our column label. So these are the passenger characteristics. And we can also set a name for our row index. So let's try this out. So with the dot index dot name and uh, so far we do not have a name, but we can change this to, for example, passenger number. So starting from zero till 891. Uh, and let's check again here the first five rows. So now we have here a name for our column label, so passenger characteristics, and we have a name for our row index, uh, passenger number. All right, so now in this video, in the last video, we learned how to change um, the complete row index or column index, and we learned that an index object is in general immutable, but uh, there is an option to change uh, single entries of our index objects, and in the next video, we learn how to do this. So hope to see you there. Bye. In this lecture, I will show you how to change our rename row and column labels. And first of all, we import pandas and we are working with the Summer Olympics data set with uh, the column athlete as uh, the index. And now let's assume that uh, the spelling of Alfred Hayos is incorrect and uh, the correct spelling is uh, Hayos with a Y instead of a J. And we've already learned that pandas index objects are immutable so the following does not work. So we cannot uh, simply select uh, the element Alfred Hayos and try to overwrite it or assign a new value. Here we get an error message and it says uh, that uh, index is actually immutable, but uh, there's a solution for it and uh, we can actually use uh, the rename method. And there are actually two ways how to do it. And uh, first of all, let's uh, have a look at the first option and uh, we have uh, the parameter mapper and here we have to pass a dictionary with a key value pair and on the left hand side we have the key which has to be uh, the old value so high auth uh, with a j and as a value on the right hand side uh, we have to pass uh, the new label high auth with a y and finally we have to define whether we want to change a row index label or a column label and uh, there's uh, the axis the parameter and uh, here we have to pass either index or columns and in this example as we want to change a row label we have to pass index and let's have a look here and here we have uh, the new spelling with a y and now let's come to the second alternative and uh, this is in my view the better alternative as it uh, has uh, less code so again, we have uh, the dictionary with uh, old uh, versus uh, new label. And then we can directly pass uh, the dictionary to the parameter index. So we know that we want to change um, an index or row label and therefore we have to pass uh, the dictionary to index. And again, if you really want to change our data frame in place, we have to pass uh, true to the in place parameter. So the default setting is false. And let's run the cell and uh, we have successfully changed here the first uh, row label. And we can also change uh, column labels uh, with uh, the rename method. And uh, this works pretty much in the same way. And also here we have two options. So let's have a look at the first option and uh, we have uh, the mapper parameter. And uh, now let's assume that you want to change uh, the column label sex to gender and uh, city to host city, then of course we can also change uh, more than just one label here. And uh, we can have more than just one uh, key value pair in our dictionary. So here the key value pairs are simply separated by a comma. So this is an ordinary dictionary. And since we want to change column labels, we have to pass columns uh, to the axis parameter. So this works pretty well. Now we have host city and gender. And finally, let's come to the leaner and uh, cleaner option. So we directly pass uh, the dictionary to the columns parameter. And also here, if you really want to save our change, we have to pass uh, true to the in place parameter. And uh, we have successfully changed uh, the data frame summer. And here we have host city and gender. All right, thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next video. Bye.
In this video we learn how to filter our data frames and uh, so far we selected rows of a data frame only by index position or index labels. So for example we selected uh, the first 20 rows or we selected all rows um, with uh, the index label Michael Phelps in our Summer Olympics uh, data set. And actually in, in real world uh, the more important case is to filter a data frame based on information in one or more columns. So for example in our Titanic dataset we want to filter all male passengers on the Titanic or we want to filter all passengers um, that are younger than 14 years old. And uh, first of all before we start let's import pandas and we are working with the Titanic dataset and we will have a look at the first 10 rows here. And what we want to do now is uh, we want to filter out all rows um, where the passengers are male. So in the end we want to create a data frame with only passengers uh, that are male. And uh, therefore we select our sex column and we will have a look here at the first uh, 10 elements in our sex column. So here you can see our sex column. And now we want to check element-wise each element if um, the element is male or female. And uh, this works essentially the same way as with NumPy arrays. So let's use here the double equal sign and let's see what we get here. We get actually here a brand new panda series uh, with uh, Boolean values. And pandas does uh, this in a vectorized manner, so we do not need any for loops like with lists. So pandas checks here for each element. So let's start here with element 0. Here we have a male and male is equal to male, so we get a true here. Then we have uh, 3 times female, and then we get here 3 times a false, and then again 4 truces. So now here we have a panda series with boolean values for each passenger, if it's an, a male or female. So from index position 0 to 890 here. And now we can filter our data frame and we can pass here our panda series with boolean values into spare brackets of our Titanic dataset. And uh, this works essentially the same as with NumPy arrays. So by Passing our boolean series here within the spare brackets, we filter out all rows uh, where the passenger is male. So let's try here. And we get here a brand new data frame with only male passengers. And what pandas does here, pandas checks the row wise if we have a true or false in a row. So for example, let's go back here to our panda series and we can see here so in row 0 we have a true and uh, in our new male data frame we have also the row with the uh, index position 0 and in index position 1, 2 and 3 we have a false so in our new data frame we do not have uh, the rows uh, with uh, the index position 1, 2 and 3 and then again for the index positions 4, 5, 6, 7 we have a true, we have a male and now a new data frame we have here the rows uh, 4, 5, 6, 7. All right. So let's copy here our code. And what we can also do instead of having here the square brackets notation, we can also use in the log notation and filter for all rows where the sex column is male. So this works as well. So we have here the same result actually, the same new data frame. And if you ask me which notation to use, I would clearly recommend uh, the log notation and uh, that for two reasons. So first of all with uh, the log notation we can also filter here not only for rows. So here we want to have all rows where we have a male. And in addition we can also filter for columns. So we can make here a comma and uh, then we can say okay I want to have only the fair column. So for all male passengers, I want to know um, the fare they paid. And now here we have a panda series um, with all the fares um, that the male passengers paid. And with uh, the spare brackets notation, you cannot do this uh, within here uh, one spare bracket. So let's go back. So here in this case, if you want to filter or only select um, the fair column, you have to add here another spare bracket and filter for the fair column. 
So this gives them actually here yeah, obviously the same result. So the first advantage of the logic notation is actually that you only have here one spare bracket and the code is actually yeah, easier to read and it's uh, yeah, more comfortable. And uh, here you have two spare brackets and uh, this is a so-called chained indexing. So what you are doing here, you actually chain index operations. So first of all, you filter the data frame for only males. And then in the second step, uh, you select uh, only the fair column. And uh, chained indexing is actually a very bad way to filter your data frame because it creates uh, huge problems and confusion when it comes to manipulating data frames, so changing elements in the data frame. And we will see and check uh, this later in our course, so chained indexing is uh, not a good idea. And if you are already familiar with pandas, you might have learned filtering here with um, the spare brackets notation. But um, this is a clear recommendation from my side. Um, please use here um, the log notation. So again, as I said, when it comes to manipulating data frames, you will have uh, less, less problems um, with uh, the log notation than here with um, the spare brackets notation. All right, so now let's move on here. And as a matter of taste, we could also call our panda series uh, with um, the Boolean values here, Titanic dot sex equals male, we can also assign the variable mask. So here mask one. And again, here we get our Boolean series. And uh, to increase the readability of our code, we can now also pass um, mask one to our log operator here and uh, filter our Titanic data set in this manner. So this gives us of course um, the same result, but it's uh, yeah, a bit clearer and it improves the readability. So this is a better style than passing here the whole line here into the spare brackets. But uh, the result is the same, of course. And what we also did here, actually, we saved our brand new data frame with uh, only the mail rows to the variable Titanic mail. And uh, we can now print and uh, check our new data frame. We check the first five rows. And we have here our brand new Titanic mail data frame with um, only mail passengers. And with uh, the log notation, we not only can filter for specific rows, but we can also filter specific columns. So we learned that before, but we can do more than just uh, filtering, for example, the fair column or the age column. What we can do actually, we can check here the data types of our columns with um, the attribute titanic.dtypes. And here we got um, the data types of our columns. So in the survived and uh, passenger class column, we have integers. In uh, the age and fair column, we have load objects. And also here in the zip sp and part, we have integer objects. And in the sex embarked and deck column, we have actually strings. And now what if we want to filter our data frame? So we want to have all rows where we have a male and we only want to have um, the columns with um, numeric objects. So we want to filter for the columns survive, passenger class, zip sp, part, and fair. And we do not want to have um, the string columns, uh, sex, embarked, and deck. So now we could check for each column if uh, the dtype is object and uh, call it mask2. So now we have here for the sex column, the embarked column and the decked column are true because here we have uh, string objects. And then we can also filter our Titanic data frame with um, the log notation. So we want to have all rows and we want to have uh, the opposite of mask2 with uh, the tilde symbol here. So if you would filter for mask2, we would get all columns um, with string objects and with the tilde symbol, we get all columns uh, with uh, yeah, actually numeric values here. So let's try this one. So here we get all rows of the, our Titanic data frame with only numeric columns here. And we can further customize here our filtering and pass mask1 and um, the opposite of mask2. And uh, then we get here all rows where we have a male passenger and we only get the columns uh, that have uh, numeric data. So we have survived, passenger class, age, zip sp, parch and fair. So here with uh, the log notation, we can not only filter for rows, but also for columns. 
And with uh, the spare brackets notation, uh, this wouldn't be as easy as we have it here with uh, the log notation. All right, so now we are finished. So the key message is when we want to filter data frames based on a condition that is in a column, you should always use in the log notation. So that's here a clear recommendation from my side. All right, so see you in the next session. Bye. In the last video we learned that being an adult male on the Titanic was a pretty bad combination for surviving the disaster. So now we want to check uh, the opposite hypothesis and uh, we know that uh, there was a clear code of conduct to save uh, women and children first and uh, what we want to do now is actually we want to check if being either a female or a child was favorable when it comes to surviving the disaster. So first of all we import pandas and uh, we work with our titanic data frame. And we have actually two conditions. So we want to check if we have a female and we store the resulting panda series uh, with boolean values in mask1. And as a second condition we check uh, whether the age of the passenger is less uh, than 14 and we store this uh, in uh, mask2. So now we have here two panda series uh, with uh, boolean values. And now we want to combine both conditions with an OR operator. So we have to use here the pipe symbol as OR. And uh, the pipe symbol stands for the logical OR. So by combining mask1 and mask2 with um, the pipe symbol, we should get all passengers that at least meet one condition. So we should get um, adult females, we should get young boys. And at least one condition means uh, that we also should get all passengers uh, that meet both conditions. So we also should get uh, girls below 14 years old. So let's combine here mask1 and mask2 and let's have a look here. So we get also here a boolean series. So if we have a look at index position 0 we have a false or false. So no condition is met and we get a false. And let's have a look at index position 1 where we have true or false. So at least one condition is met and we get a true. So here we have no example where we have two times true. So maybe let's increase here to 10, 10 rows. That's still not enough here, maybe 20 rows. So I'm searching now a young girl. So here at index position 10, we have a true for the female, so it's a female, and also we have a true for being younger than 14. So we have true or true, and this gives us, by combining it with or, this gives here also a true. And now we can pass in the combined uh, boolean series here to our titanic data set and the log operator and by doing so we are filtering all, out all rows that meet at least one condition so let's check it here so here we are, have uh, adult females uh, then we have a uh, baby male adult females uh, a very young female here a very young male here so we created here a brand new data frame with only females and young boys. All right, so now we can further filter our data frame. So we again use mask1 or mask2 and we are only interested in the survived column in the passenger class sex and age. So we are creating here a brand new data frame and we are storing the data frame here in the variable women or children. And let's check here our new data frame, the first five rows. And let's get more information on our data frame here. So we have 351 entries. So we have 351 passengers that are either women or children. And let's use in the describe method to get even more information. And we see here in the survived column, so we have uh, a mean of uh, 0.72 and that means with being either a woman or a child, the probability of surviving the disaster was actually 72% and that's quite high actually. So we can also 
compare this uh, to the survival rate of all passengers and uh, we already know that this, uh, the survival rate of all passengers was only 38 percent so actually our data set uh, supports our hypothesis uh, that being either a woman or a child was a very favorable characteristic on on board of the titanic uh, to survive from the disaster all right, so now we are finished uh, with this session and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye. Welcome to the introduction video on NA values or missing values. And before we are going to detect and handle missing values in our Titanic and Olympic data set, we should first of all understand what NA values are and how and why NA values are generated. And actually NA values or missing values are also a very important topic because in real data we always have missing values and we always need to handle missing values. And uh, so far throughout the course we already have seen missing values and we have worked with uh, these missing values and now it's time to dig a bit deeper into this topic. And we have already imported pandas and we also import here numpy. And we are working with a sales data set, which is uh, stored in the CSV file sales.csv. So let's import this. And let's have a look here. So here on the left hand side as uh, the index of our data frame, we see the four salesmen, Stephen, Mike, Andy and Paul. And as columns, we have here the weekdays, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. And the values here in our data frame are actually sales data. So for example, Mike had uh, 45 sales on Monday. And we can see here that for Stephen on Thursday, we have here a NAN value. So NAN stands for not a number. And in pandas, this is a strong indication that we have here missing values in our data. So it might be a good idea to also open the original CSV file. So let's do this here. So this is here the CSV file. And we can see here the column labels, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And on the left hand side here, the row index label, Stephen, Mike, Andy and Paul. And we have seen that for Stephen, we have a NAN value on Thursday. So let's start here with Monday. And on Monday, we have sales of 34, then on Tuesday, 27, on Wednesday, 15. And then again, we have here a comma. And after the comma, we have actually no value here at all. So no information. So not even a, a white space or an empty space. And then again, we have here a comma and uh, then we have uh, the value for Friday. So here in our CSV file, whenever we have no value or no information at all, then we get a NAN value in our data frame. So now let's go back to our Jupyter notebook. And we can also call the info method here. So here we have uh, the columns Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. And we can see here that in the uh, Thursday column, we have only three non-null values. So obviously here we have a missing value. And we can also select uh, the missing value. So we use here the log operator. And uh, then we are going into the row with uh, the row label Steven and into the column with uh, the column label Thursday. So let's do this here. And here we can see we get an AN, so not a number. And uh, this is a strong sign that we have here a missing value. And we can also produce some more missing values. So let's go back here to our CSV file. And for example, let's delete here also the sales information for Friday. So let's save here our CSV file and let's go back to our Jupyter notebook. And let's uh, re-import here our file sales.csv. And now we can see here that we have two missing values, so on Thursday and on Friday. And we can also produce missing values with Python. So for example, let's assume that we want to have a missing value at uh, the index position 1, 1. So we take uh, the row with uh, the index position 1. Here it's Mike and then the column at index position 1. It's here Tuesday. So we want to replace here 9 with a missing value. And what we can actually do, we can assign the keyword none. So let's do this here. And let's again check our sales data frame. 
And now we can see here that we have a NAN or missing value also here for the Tuesday sales of uh, Mike. However, the preferred and more reliable way to produce missing values is by assigning np.nan. So now we are selecting the element at index position 2, 2. So it's actually here 54. And we are assigning the value np.nan, which stands actually in NumPy for missing value or not a number. And let's again check our sales data frame. And now we have also here missing values for the Wednesday sales of Andy. And once again, we can call the info method. And now we can see that on Monday we have four non-null values. On Tuesday we have only three non-null values. And also on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday we have only three non-null values. So we have one missing value in each column here. And with real data it's sometimes problematic to identify missing values because instead of having no value or no information at all, there might be some other values uh, that should indicate uh, that uh, there's no value. So let me demonstrate this and we again go to our CSV file. And we have seen here that on Thursday we have uh, no information or no value at all for Steven. However, it might be the case uh, that somebody, instead of uh, including here no value or no information at all, includes here a white space or an empty space. So let's do this here and let's save here our CSV file. And let's go back here to our Jupyter Notebook. And let's uh, re-import here our CSV file. So now let's have a look here at Thursday and we can see here that we have here in our pandas data frame no information or no value at all. Because here in our CSV file we simply have a white space or an empty space. And also here we have a white space or an empty space and we can also select here the element with the log operator again. And instead of getting a none we simply get here a string object, which only consists of a white space on empty space. And if we call now the info method, then we can see here on Thursday that we do not see any missing value. So we have four non-null values because here we have uh, simply a string object with a white space. And with the real data, this is a real problem because at a first glance, we do not really see that uh, on Thursday here we have a missing value. All right, so now let's have another example. So when working with real data, it is very often the case uh, that people, if uh, there's no data, people assign just uh, a value like no data or missing data. So for example here, for Paul on Thursday we have no value and then Paul inserted here no data. So let's go back to our Jupyter Notebook and let's uh, re-import. And now we can see here on Thursday for Paul that we have here the string no data. And if we call here the info method and if we have a look here on the Thursday column we still do not identify any missing value. So still we have four non-null or non-missing values. Even in reality we have two missing values. So we have here a missing value for Steven and we have a missing value for Paul. And we can only detect uh, these two missing values if uh, we further analyze um, the columns here. So for example the Thursday column with uh, methods like nUnique, value counts, uh, unique and so on. Alright, so this was uh, the introduction on NA values or missing values and in the next videos we learn how to identify and handle missing values in our two datasets. So hope to see you there. Bye! In this video we learn how to handle missing or NA values. And uh, this process actually includes uh, two major steps. So identifying missing values and uh, once we have identified them, then we have to decide what to do with uh, these missing values. And uh, there are in principle three options. So the first one is uh, that we do nothing and uh, leave uh, them as uh, they are. And actually pandas is uh, best prepared to handle missing values since in many methods we can decide whether to include or to exclude NA values. 
And in most cases, the default setting is that Panda simply ignores missing values. Then uh, the second option is to delete missing values, or more specifically, observations or rows uh, with uh, missing values. And we can also delete entire columns uh, with uh, missing values. And then the third alternative is to replace the missing values by either the actual values, if you can manage to find them, or to replace by approximate values. So this is in principle a very complex topic, not coding-wise, but in the decision-making process, what to do when, as it always depends on the specific case and uh, there's actually no black and white. And in this video and in this course, we will focus on the coding part. However, in my general Pandas course, I will go much more into detail also on the decision-making part. So let's import Pandas. And again, we are working with uh, the Titanic dataset where we have uh, many missing values. And let's have a look. And here in the info method, we can already see our missing values. So we have here in the H column 177 missing values, or to put it uh, the other way around, 714 uh, non-null or non-missing values. And also in the embark column, we have two missing values, and we have many missing values in the deck column. And instead of identifying NA values with uh, the info method, we can do the same with uh, the isNA method. And here pandas checks for each and every element whether the element is an NA value or not. So here we can see we get uh, many falses because here we have uh, non-missing values. But here in the deck column we can see many truths. So here we have many missing values. And then we can also sum up uh, the missing values, for example per column, to get uh, the total amount of missing values. So as a short repetition a true stands for 1 and a false for 0. Therefore, we can chain here the sum method. And then we get here 177 missing values in the H column, for example. And actually, the opposite of the isNA method is uh, the notNA method. And let's have a look here. So also here for each element, uh, we get actually a true if uh, the element is uh, not missing and we get a false if uh, the element is missing. And again, we can also take here the sum. And uh, this is actually the same U as uh, we have here in the info method. So 740 non-null values in the H column. And then we can also filter our data frame, for example, for all rows or for all passengers where we have uh, NA values in the embarked column, so these are only two. And uh, therefore we use here the isNA method on the embarked column and uh, we filter our data frame with the log operator. Here we get two passengers where we do not know the port of embarkation. And uh, now let's have a look at uh, the shape of our data frame. So we have 891 rows and nine columns. And as I said before, we have uh, three options how to deal with uh, missing values. And here in the embark column, this is a very good example where we actually do nothing because we only have two passengers with any N values. And uh, also the embark column is uh, not uh, the most important column here in our data frame. So we just uh, leave it as it is here. So we leave here the NA values and uh, the second alternative would be to uh, drop NA values. And here we can either drop uh, rows with NA values or we can drop columns with NA values. And to do this pandas provides us with uh, the drop NA method. And uh, let's simply run here the cell. And here we have the data frame where we applied uh, the drop and a method and it's quite hard to, to identify and see anything. And uh, therefore we also chain here the attribute uh, shape. And here we can see starting from 891 passengers and nine columns by just using the drop and may method uh, results us in a data frame with only 182 rows and nine columns. And the drop NA method actually by default drops all rows where we have at least uh, one missing value. And as we have over 600 missing values only in the deck column, then pandas deletes here actually all passengers uh, where we have uh, at least uh, one missing value. And we only have left here 182. 
However, we can change uh, this behavior and uh, there's uh, the parameter how and the default setting is any. So by default pandas drops all rows where we have at least uh, one missing value. And uh, let's again check it here. And alternatively, we can also pass all to the how parameter. And by passing all to the how parameter, then pandas drops only rows where all values are actually missing values. And uh, let's try this out here. So here we have all 891 passengers. So there's uh, no passenger where we have only missing values. And in the drop and a method, uh, we have also the axis parameter and the default setting is uh, zero. So pandas uh, drops rows, but we can also decide uh, that pandas should drop columns. And uh, therefore we pass uh, one to the axis parameter. And again, we can uh, use here any or all for the how parameter. So let's try out uh, the any parameter. And here we get a data frame with all passengers, but only six columns. So we dropped all columns where we have at least uh, one missing value. And uh, these are actually the columns age, embarked and deck. And with the how parameter, we are actually quite limited. So either we can define that uh, we want to drop all rows or columns where at least uh, one value is missing or where all values are missing. And uh, this is actually quite unflexible. And uh, therefore there's uh, the additional parameter thresh. And here we can define how many non-missing values uh, we at least uh, want to have in a row or in a column to leave uh, the row or the column in the data frame. And let's focus here on the columns. So we pass one to the axis parameter and we can say, we want to uh, drop all columns where we have uh, less uh, than 500 uh, non-missing values. Or to put it uh, the other way around, we want to drop all columns where we have uh, more than uh, 391 missing values. And uh, let's uh, check this out here. And here we lost uh, one column and uh, obviously this should be uh, the deck column because here in the deck column, we only have uh, 203 non-missing values. And this might be actually a good strategy in our case. So the deck column is actually of uh, little use for us because uh, the information itself is not too useful. And also we have only 200 non-missing values. And uh, therefore we decide to uh, drop all columns with uh, less uh, than 500 non-missing values. And also here we have to uh, pass uh, true to the in place parameter. And let's have a look. So here we have successfully dropped uh, the deck column. So as a short recap, we decided to leave uh, the two missing values in the embarked column. We deleted uh, the complete uh, deck column. And uh, now let's filter our data frame for all passengers where we do not know the uh, age. So these are all passengers where we have missing values in the age column. And having 177 passengers where we do not know the age, it uh, might not be the best decision to just uh, delete all 177 passengers. So it might be a better idea to replace uh, the missing values. And uh, therefore we can either try to find uh, the revalues or we can replace uh, the missing values by approximations. And here in this case, one good approximation could be to use uh, simply the mean age over all passengers as a fill value. So first of all, we calculate the mean age over all passengers. And uh, this is uh, 29.69. And then we can fill each and every missing value in the age column with uh, the mean age. And we can do this with uh, the fill NA method. So first of all, we select uh, the age column and then there's a parameter value and here we can pass the fill value that uh, we want to have here. So here in this example, it's uh, the mean age. And also here we have to pass uh, true to the in place parameter. So let's do this. And let's have a look at our age column. So before we could see here that uh, the passenger at index position five, we have here a missing value. And now we have here the mean age 29.69. And also finally, we can inspect uh, our data frame again with the info method. 
And here we can see that uh, we have no missing values now in the H column. So we have successfully replaced all missing values here by the mean age. And with uh, this we are finished here with uh, this video and I hope to see you also in the next one. Bye! In the last video we handled missing values in the Titanic data frame and we created kind of a clean data frame. And now it might be the case uh, that we want to terminate our Jupyter session and save our progress uh, locally on our computer. And uh, one way to do this is by exporting and uh, saving the clean data frame in a new CSV file. So we have still imported here the clean Titanic data frame. And we can also have a look here at the first five rows. And then we can actually export and uh, save our data frame in a new CSV file. And we can do this with uh, the method uh, to CSV. And here we have to pass our new desired uh, file name. So here, for example, clean data frame.csv. And uh, let's uh, run the cell here. And actually pandas creates a new CSV file in the folder where also the Jupyter notebook here is located. And uh, we can also re-import our clean data frame CSV with uh, the read CSV method. And here we can see that we have here an additional column which uh, was actually the former range index. And uh, whenever we save or export a data frame with a range index, then we also save the range index in the CSV file. And uh, when we re-import uh, the data from the CSV file, then pandas by default creates another range index if uh, we do not uh, determine a index column. And therefore, whenever we want to export a data frame with a range index, it might be the best option to pass false to the index parameter. So here we have an index parameter and here we have to pass false. And when we pass false, pandas uh, drops uh, the index and does not export uh, the index. So let's run the cell and we actually overwrite uh, the CSV file. And again, we can re-import the CSV file and here we can see that now we do not have uh, this additional column. We just have here the range index. And uh, with uh, this we are finished here and I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye! In this video we learn how to use summary statistics and accumulations to further analyze our data frames. And in particular data frames with uh, numeric values. So first of all, let's import pandas and we are again working with our Titanic's data set. And we check the first five rows here. And we already know the very helpful describe method. So the describe method returns us many summary statistics for our numerical columns. So we have here our numerical columns survived, p class, h, sipsp, parch and fair. And first of all, we have count, where pandas actually counts all non-missing values. So here in the H column, we have some missing values. Then we have uh, the mean value over all values in the particular column. So for example, uh, the average fare or ticket price was uh, $32 or pounds. Then we have the standard deviation, the minimum, 25th percentile, the median, the 75th percentile, and the maximum. So the oldest passenger is 80 years old. And for most of uh, these summary statistics here on the left side, there also exists a method. So for example, there is uh, the count method that we can apply for the whole data frame. And let's press shift tab here. So the count method counts uh, non-missing values for each column or row. So now let's run here. And we get here for each column the amount of uh, non-missing values. And we can define here the axes where we want to count actually the number of non-missing values. And by default it's set to zero. And alternatively we can also pass here in quotation marks index. And with uh, zero index, we get actually for each column the amount of uh, non-missing values. And in my opinion, uh, this is a bit confusing because we get here for each column the amount, but we set axes to index and not to column. And uh, the reason is uh, that axes uh, equals index means 
that we go here along the rows and uh, along the axes here for each column. So in my opinion, uh, this is a bit confusing and uh, there might be further room for improvement uh, for the next versions here of pandas. And let's try also columns here, columns or one. And here we get uh, the amount of non-missing values for each row. And uh, you could say that, okay, we are going here along the columns and therefore I have to use here the parameter columns. All right, so either you use um, columns or x is equals one, so that's uh, the same here. And then we can also take the mean and if we set axes uh, to zero, we get uh, the mean for our columns or along the rows. So here again, we have for the fare, the average ticket price of $32 or pounds. And we could also try to calculate uh, the mean for each row. And uh, we still get here values. So actually, if we look here at a row, we have here numerical values in each row, but also um, string values. So still the mean method returns for each row here a value. And let's check here why this is the case. So let's go here inside. And we have here the parameter numeric only. And let's check this. Include only float, integer or boolean columns and if uh, set to none and by default numeric only is set to none. Then pandas uh, will attempt to use everything and then use only numeric data. So pandas is quite smart here, it tries to calculate the mean over all values and if it finds some numerical values and non-numerical values, so string values, it then excludes uh, the string values from the mean calculation. And pandas uh, does uh, this automatically, so here you again can see that pandas is quite powerful and quite smart. All right, so there's also the method uh, sum and we can take uh, the sum for each columns. So here for the survived column, we have uh, 342. Um, that means uh, that we have uh, 342 pas passengers uh, that survived. So we have um, the value one for survived and the zero for not survived. And depending on the column, actually the sum makes sense or does not make sense here for the sex column, we have just male, female, female, female concatenated. So for example, if you want to take here the sum for all rows by passing here one, we again get the, the sum over all numerical values. So also here, pandas tries to take the sum over all elements. And uh, once it uh, finds some string values, it uh, yeah, just ignores uh, the string values and takes only the numerical values. All right, so let's have a look again at our data frame. And the title of our video is here not only um, summary statistics, but also accumulations. And one example for accumulation is cumsum. So let's try the cumsum method on the fair column. So cumsum stands for cumulative sum, and we can see here. So we're starting with uh, 7.25. And uh, then for each row, cumsum sums up all rows uh, that came before. So here in the second row, we should have here 78 and then 78 plus 7.9 gives 86. And then 86 plus 53 gives 139 and so on. All right, let's go on. And there is uh, the method dot core and uh, dot core actually calculates uh, the correlation between numerical columns. And the correlation is actually an indication of the relationship of two random variables. So in other words, if and how two random variables uh, move together. And uh, the correlation can take values between minus one and one. And minus one is an indication for strong and negative correlation where one variable goes up and the other goes down and vice versa. And uh, the value of zero, so zero correlation stands for, or is an indication for no relationship between those two variables. 
And a correlation of one is an indication for a strong positive correlation. So when one variable moves up, the other moves up as well. And we can have a look here at our Titanic data set. And we can see here on the left, so we have the, the survived column. And of course, um, the survived column is 100% uh, positive correlated to itself. And we see here that uh, there is a quite high negative correlation to the passenger class. So the lower the passenger class, so we have passengers in class 1, the higher is uh, the likelihood uh, that uh, the passenger survived. So here's um, the indication that actually money rules the world. Not only in business, but also on board of the Titanic. And here for the age, we have a weak uh, negative correlation. And also here, SIP, SP and PART, uh, there's only a small correlation here. And for the fair column, we have a fairly strong positive correlation. So the more a passenger paid for his ticket, the more likely it was and that uh, the passenger survived. And we could also have a look here at uh, the fare column. And uh, the ticket price is actually positive correlated to uh, um, the survived. So we already have seen this. And also ticket price is uh, quite strong negatively correlated to passenger class. So this is a no-brainer. So a passenger in class 1 paid more for his ticket than a passenger in class uh, 3. And we can also see here a positive correlation to the amount of parents and children and the ticket price. So obviously the passengers uh, that traveled with parents and children paid more for their ticket than passengers who traveled alone. So it might be the case uh, that in the first class the passengers traveled with uh, their families in a suite and in the third class there were many young men who traveled alone trying to find their happiness in America. All right and there's also the core method for pandas data frame and there we can return the correlation between only uh, two columns so we selected here the survived column and then with uh, the core method we can calculate uh, the correlation between the survived column and the p-class column. So here within the brackets we have to pass the p-class column as a panda series. And here we get minus 0.33, so the same as here. So if you were a passenger in the third class, it was uh, less likely that you survived um, the Titanic disaster. All right, now we are finished uh, with this video and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye. In this video, we are going to plot the data on our Titanic data frame with uh, the method plot. But first of all, let's import pandas and we import our Titanic data set. So here are the first five rows and some meter information. And if you want to create some plots and visualizations, we first need to import uh, the matplotlib library, which is actually the most popular Python library for creating plots and visualizations. And actually as convention, we import matplotlib.pyplot.splt. So plt is actually the most commonly used uh, abbreviation here, so let's do this. And now we want to plot uh, the numerical columns in our Titanic data frame, so we have uh, some numerical columns here. We have uh, the survived column, the p-class column, the h column, zip sp, parge, and also the fair column. And we can do this by simply calling here the plot method on our Titanic data frame. So for pandas data frames and panda series, uh, there is uh, the built-in method dot plot. And before we run the cell here, we have to also call the show method. So so this is a direct uh, matplotlib.pyplot method. And with the show method, we can actually display our graph or our plot. So always when we create one or several plots with the matplotlib, as a very last argument, we have to call here the show method. So let's simply call here the plot method on our entire Titanic data frame. And uh, let's run the cell here. And here we can see that uh, we actually see nothing. So by default, uh, the plot method creates here a line plot with on the x-axis um, the index. So here we have uh, the range index from 0 till 891. So these are actually the passenger numbers. 
And on the y-axis, we have actually the specific values in our numerical columns. And for each column, we have actually here a line plot. So we have six columns here. And as we have here six line plots within one graph or within one plot, it's uh, quite hard to see anything. And uh, therefore, let's go here inside the brackets with shift tab. And here we can see we have a parameter subplots. And by default, it's set to false, but uh, we can set this also to true here. And by doing so, we are creating for each column a separate subplot. And still it's hard to see anything because uh, the plot size is very small. And there's an additional parameter here. And it's called uh, fix size. And here we can determine uh, the width and the height of the graph. So let's do this here. We have here fix size. And then we have to pass within a tuple the desired width and uh, height of the graph. So for example, we want to have a width of uh, 12 and a height of 8. Then we get here a larger plot. And maybe we should further increase uh, the size here to maybe 15 and 12. So now it's much easier to see and analyze it. So for each column, we have here a separate subplot. So here for the survived column, the p-class column, the h column, the sipsp column, parch column, and fair column. And by default, all subplots share actually here the x-axis. So we have here at the very bottom one x-axis with the range index from 0 to 891. But we can also create a separate x-axis for each subplot. And there is one parameter here. And the parameter here is uh, share x. So let's have a look here. And by default, it's uh, set to true actually. So all subplots uh, share one x axis. But we can also set uh, this to false. So let's do this. So we have here the share x parameter and we can set it to false. And now we can see here at the bottom of each subplot um, the x-axis uh, with uh, the range index from 0 to 891. And we can see here on the left hand side for each subplot actually the y-axis. And here we have a specific y-axis uh, for each subplot. So for example here for the survived column we have uh, values between 0 and 1. So you can see here it's uh, oscillating between 0 and 1. Then here for the p-class column, we have the values 1, 2, and 3. Then for the h column, we have values between 0 and 80. And a line plot like this is actually good to see the distribution of values. So the majority of ages are here between 20 and 40. But we have some outliers here around 0 and some outliers here around 75, 80. And specifically when we have time series data with a date time index, so here we have then on the x-axis a daytime index. So for example, starting from the year 2010 until 2015. And specifically in this case, a line plot is uh, very intuitive to see the evolution of some factors over time. So for example, stock prices or weather data. But also here with uh, non-time series data, a line plot uh, makes uh, definitely sense. And here in the SIPSP column, we can see that uh, the majority of values are here actually one. So most of the passengers have uh, one uh, sibling or spouse on board. And also here for the parents and children, the most frequent values are here between uh, zero and uh, two. And also here in the fare column, we can see that uh, the most frequent fares are actually quite low here between uh, zero and uh, 20. However, there are some outliers here. So we have here some outliers until four or five hundred dollars. And as we have seen on the left hand side, so for each subplot, we have a different scale for the y axis, but uh, we can also change uh, this here. So there's uh, the parameter share y. So here we have share y. And by default it's set to false. So for each subplot we have a specific and appropriate y-axis, but uh, we can also set this to true. And here we have for each subplot actually the same y-axis with uh, the same scale. And as we have here the largest scale at uh, the fair column, 
So the shared y-axis is actually most appropriate here for the fair column. So here we have values between 0 and 500. However, for the parch column, a scale between 0 and 500 does not really make sense. So here we actually see nothing. And therefore, in this case, it definitely makes sense to set the share y parameter to false. And actually, if you are only interested in the H column, and if you only want to visualize the H column, you can also apply the plot method only on the H column. So let's do this. Let's copy here the code. And instead of using here the plot method on the entire Titanic data frame, we use it only on the H column. And if we only use it on the H column, we do not have to define here subplots. So this is not necessary. And maybe we make uh, the figure size a bit smaller here because we have only one subplot. And also we do not need uh, the parameters share x and share y. So let's plot here the graph. And here we have actually a line plot only for the h column. So we can see here the x-axis with the index labels from 0 to 890. And we can see on the y-axis uh, values between uh, 0 and 80. And the majority of values are here between uh, 20 and 40. And we have some very young passengers uh, that are only a bit older than uh, 0 years old, so babies. And we have some quite old passengers uh, above uh, 70 and until 80. All right, this was uh, the first video on data visualization. And in the next video, we learn how to customize our plot here. So hope to see you there. Bye. All right, so in the last video, we created a line plot for our H column. And now in this video, we will customize our plot here. So for example, we will add a title and also labels for our X and Y axis. And we will also learn how to change uh, the line style and uh, the color of our graph. So now let's first of all, let's uh, plot again here our line plot. So with no customizations at all. And we can actually see that the font size of our x-axis and the y-axis is quite small. And uh, therefore there's another parameter here. And the parameter is called font size. So let's uh, try this out here. And here we can actually define the font size for our x-ticks and the y-ticks here. And uh, let's uh, try for example 13. So now here we can see that uh, we have increased font sizes. And we can further increase the font size by passing here a greater number, for example, 20. And now we have even larger font sizes. So let's go back to 13. And we can see here that our line plot has kind of a blue color, but uh, we can also define the color here with uh, the parameter C. And here we can pass our desired color. So for example, we could pass here red. And it's also possible to only pass here R for red. So feel free to have a look at the documentation of what uh, colors are provided here. So now we will use here um, the red color. And we can also customize the line style. So there's uh, the additional parameter line style. And by default, it's set to a single dash here. But we can also create a dashed line, so with uh, two dashes. And now we can see a kind of a dashed style. And we can also create a dot style by passing here a colon. Now we have uh, dotted lines. And also here feel free to have a look at the documentation, what uh, different uh, line styles uh, Matplotlib provides here. So let's go back here to the single dash. And now we can also create a title for our graph or our plot. And we can do this with uh, the function or method pld.title. And uh, within the brackets here, we have to define the title of our graph within quotation marks. So it should be Titanic ages. And then there's an additional parameter font size where we can define uh, the font size. And here for the title, the font size should be a bit larger than the font size of the X ticks and Y ticks. So let's run here the cell. And here we have our title, Titanic Ages. 
Next, we can also create a legend for our graph. And in particular, this makes sense if we plot here several columns. So let's assume we plot here the age column and the fair column. Then we should have a legend here somewhere saying that, okay, the red line is um, the age column and for example, the blue line is uh, the fair column. And uh, we can create a legend with uh, the method uh, plt.legend. And here we can define also the font size and also the location of the legend. But first of all, let's run here. And here we can see on the upper right the legend age. So the red line is the age actually. And if we would have here another line, for example, for the fair column, we would have here red for the age column and blue for the fair column. And we can also define the location. So let's go here inside the, the brackets. And uh, there are several locations uh, that we can choose. So for example, we can choose uh, the location best or zero. So we can pass here zero or best within quotation marks. Then depending on the graph, uh, matplotlib locates uh, the legend at uh, the best possible place. But we can also define upper right, upper left, uh, lower left, and so on. And uh, instead of passing here the strings, we can also pass uh, the codes. So for example, let's assume that we want to place the legend here on the lower left side. We can either pass the string lower left or three. So let's pass here three. And now we have here the legend on the lower left location. And with the font size, again, we can also change here the font size, for example, to 20. So we can make it larger, but let's stay here at 15. And we can also create uh, labels for our x-axis and y-axis. And we can do this with uh, the functions uh, plt.xlabel and plt.ylabel. And here we have to pass within the brackets uh, the labels at quotation marks uh, that we want to have. So for example, here for our x-axis, we want to have uh, the passenger number. And for our y-axis, we want to have age. And again, here we can define uh, the font size. So let's do this here. Now we have here the X label passenger number and the Y label age. And we can also create a grid here with the function plt.grid. Next, we can also define the limits of our axis. So here by default, we have on the X axis the limits between 0 and 900 and on the Y axis between 0 and 80. But uh, we can also change uh, this here and uh, let's press shift tab. So here we can see we have the parameters x lim and y lim. And here for both parameters, we have to pass a tuple with uh, the lower and uh, the upper value. So for example, let's assume that uh, we are only interested in the passenger numbers between 200 and 400. Then we can pass here to the parameter x lim a tuple from 200 to 400. So let's run here the cell. And here we only have on the x-axis uh, the passengers between 200 and 400. And as you can see here, it's some blanks. So these are the missing values in the H column. So here we have a break everywhere where we have a passenger where we do not uh, know the H. And we can also limit or customize here our y-axis with the y-lim parameter. And let's assume we are only interested in passengers between the age 20 until 40. So now let's run here. And here we limited our y-axis from 20 to 40. So let's go back here on the x-axis uh, from 0 to uh, 900. And on the y-axis from 0 to 80. And here we can see on the x-axis we have x ticks uh, 100, 200, uh, 300, 400 and so on. But uh, we can also customize uh, this and uh, let's assume that we want to have a ranges of only 50, so 50, 100, 150, 200, and so on. And there's also the parameter 
x ticks and y ticks and here we can define uh, the ticks uh, that we want to have so let's have a look here so here we have x ticks and y ticks and here we have to pass a sequence so for example a list with uh, values uh, we want to use for the x ticks and y ticks and now let's assume that uh, for the uh, x-axis we want to have uh, x ticks from 0 to 900 and we want to have a tick for each 50 passengers so we want to have 50, 100, 150 and for the age we want to have the ticks 5, 10, 15, 20 until 80 and we can do this by creating two sequences or two lists so here we can create a list for the x ticks and for the range between the 0 and the 900 including we create a list of values with uh, the step uh, 50 so let's uh, run here and uh, let's have a look so here we have a list starting from 0 till 900 and we have a step of 50 50 100 150 and the same we can do for the y ticks so we are creating here a list from 0 to 80 including and with a step of 5 so let's run here and here we have the list uh, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20 until 80 and now we can pass both lists to the parameters x ticks and uh, y ticks so we have here the parameter x tick and here we pass the list x ticks and we have the parameter y ticks and here we pass the list y ticks and let's run here the cell and here we can see our customized uh, x and uh, y labels and we can also see that uh, the grid actually automatically adjusts so we have here the grids for, for the ticks here actually and here we can see on the x-axis if we have uh, many ticks it might be more convenient to rotate uh, the ticks a little bit to have here more space and we can do this with another parameter so let's check this out here and we have here the parameter road and here we can define for example that uh, we want to rotate our ticks by 90 degrees and here we have our x ticks uh, rotated by 90 degrees and we could also define that uh, we want to rotate them by 45 degrees so this is uh, flexible so here we have 45 degrees and actually now we are finished uh, with uh, the customization however there's one more option and actually we can completely change uh, the whole style of our graph and we can do this uh, with uh, the method plt.style.use but before we can also have a look which uh, default styles um, matplotlib uh, provides us and we can do this here with uh, plt.style.available and here we can see uh, several styles so we have the classic style then ggplot from the R programming language then we have grayscale and we have several seaborn styles and once we have chosen a style we can also set now a new style and we can do this with uh, plt.style.use and here we can pass within uh, the brackets our style that we want to have and for example let's choose here the seaborn style now let's run the cell here and now let's uh, rerun our graph here and our graph will automatically be transferred to the seaborn style and here we have the seaborn style and by default actually the seaborn style has also grids but by calling here the grid function or method we actually removed the grids so let's disable the grid function and here we can see our seaborn style and we can also change uh, the style for example to uh, classic and now we have here a classic style so the options to customize a plot in matplotlib are actually unlimited and if you like you can have a look at uh, the documentation site but uh, for the time being, we are now finished and I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye.
All right, in this video we will learn how to create a histogram for our Titanic H column. So histograms are specifically useful to visualize the frequency distributions of values in the numerical columns. So first of all we import pandas and we are also importing uh, matplotlib as uh, plt and we use uh, the seaborn style and we are importing our Titanic dataset. And before we also learned uh, that we can analyze uh, the frequency of values uh, with uh, the value counts method. So here we are selecting the H column and we are analyzing the H column with uh, the value counts method. And uh, the most uh, frequent value is actually uh, 24. So 30 passengers are 24 years old. And here at the end we have some outliers, so 0.42 years for example. And we can also organize our ages here in bins. And uh, let's have a look here. So there's here the parameter bins and by default it's set to none. But uh, we can also set the bins to true and then rather than count values, bins uh, group them into bins. So for example, now let's set the bins to 10. So we're creating 10 bins. All right, an S is missing here, so now it should work. And here we have uh, 10 equal width uh, bins. So starting here from uh, 0 till 8, then 8 to 16 and so on. And uh, the bin or the interval with uh, the most values is here actually the interval between 16 and 24. So here we have 177 passengers. And the least uh, frequent bin is here between 72 and 80 with only two passengers. And the same we can actually do uh, graphically with a histogram. So we are selecting here the H column and uh, then we are using the plot method. And uh, so let's run here first of all. So here we have our line plot. And um, instead of passing line, so line plot is actually here the default value. And instead of passing line to the parameter kind, we can also pass uh, hist for histogram. And here we have uh, the histogram. And by default we have here 10 bins and uh, these are actually the same bins as here above. So from 0 to 8, then from 8 to 16 and so on. And the very last bin is from 72 till 80. And here in this bin we have only two passengers. And the largest or most uh, frequent bin is actually here this bin and uh, this is in uh, the interval 16 to 24. So having here 10 bins is actually the default setting, but uh, we can also change uh, the amount of bins and uh, there is here the parameter bins. However, if we have here a look with the shift tab, then uh, the parameter bins is uh, not explicitly uh, displayed here. And this is actually a disadvantage if we use here the plot method. So some specific parameters which are only available for some specific plot types, so for example here, the bins parameter for the histogram are actually not listed here in the plot method. However, at least in this case for the bins parameter, we can uh, still uh, use it here. So let's uh, simply call here the bins parameter. And for example, let's assume we want to have uh, 30 bins. Then let's run in the cell. And then we can see here that we have uh, 30 separate bins. And as we have here a range between 0 and 80, it could also make sense to have here 80 bins. So for each year we have one bin. So for example here we have one 80 year old passenger. And here the largest bin is actually, I think it's 24. Alright, so now we have seen that the plot method is actually not the optimal solution if we have here other kinds than line plots. And in the next video, we will also learn some uh, other alternatives how to uh, create here the histogram. But uh, for the time being, we are now finished and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! In the last video, we have created a histogram for our H column. And we did this with the pandas method dot plot, where we passed the hist to the parameter kind. So here we can see this. And not only for histograms, but also for other plot types, there's more than one way to plot data in a data frame. 
And in this video I will show you two other ways how to create here the same histogram and we will see that uh, there are slightly differences and the pros and cons for each way. So in my opinion there is no optimal solution but uh, let's have a look now. So the second alternative would be to use the direct method uh, dot hist. So instead of having here the method plot and we pass hist to the kind parameter there's also a direct method called hist. And also here we can define the fixed size 12.8 and let's have a look here. So here we have some different parameters in the documentation. So here we have explicitly the bins parameter and by default it's set to 10, but here we set it to 80. And we can also set the X label size and the Y label size here. So we set it to 15. And we can see that uh, this is a slight difference here to the plot method. So here in the plot method we can actually determine the x label size and y label size with uh, the font size parameter. And we've also seen with the direct plot method that uh, there is no explicit uh, bin parameter here. So here we do not see the bins parameter. But if we pass here hist to the kind parameter, then we can nevertheless here use the bins parameter, even if it's not explicitly listed here. All right. So now we can run here our cell and we actually create the very same histogram. So we have here the same amount of bins, then the same size of the labels here. And we can see here by default that here with the plot method, we have here the uh, Y label frequency and here we do not have the Y label. So this is a minor difference. And now let's go to the third alternative where we use um, the hist method directly on matplotlib.pyplot. So plt.hist. And here we have to pass uh, then the sequence uh, for which we want to have the histogram. So here in this case, uh, we want to have uh, the panda series uh, titanic.h. And also here we can set uh, the bins parameter to 80. And uh, let's uh, try to run here the cell. And here we get an error message. And in the end it's because the direct matplotlib hist method cannot by default handle here missing values. So here in our h column we have missing values. And if we pass here our h column to the direct matplotlib uh, method hist, uh, then we have here a problem. So before we can plot here our h column, we have uh, to drop um, the missing values. And we can do this with the method uh, drop na. So we will have a closer look uh, later in this course on this here. So drop na. And by doing so, we are dropping all missing or na values. And now actually our code should work. So let's try this out here. So this uh, looks uh, quite similar to the other graphs or histograms. And let's have a look here at uh, the additional parameters. And we can see here that uh, here we have some more parameters. So for example, we have uh, the density parameter and by default it's set to false, but uh, we can also set uh, this to true. And then instead of getting here the absolute quantity for all of uh, the bins here, we get uh, the relative quantity. So let's try this out here. So here we have the relative quantity for all bins and we can also transform here our histogram into a cumulative histogram. So by passing here true to the parameter cumulative. And here we are actually adding up all bins starting from the left hand side. So in the very end uh, here we end up with uh, one or uh, 100%. So still we have here normalized quantities and in the end if we sum over all bins uh, then we have 100% uh, of uh, the data here included. So here we are ending at 100% uh, or 1. And actually in the other two direct pandas methods there are explicitly uh, no parameters density and uh, cumulative. But uh, still we can use them so let's have a look here. So here we do not see any density or cumulative, but still we can use these parameters here. So let's try here the cumulative parameter and let's set it to true. And here we get uh, the absolute uh, cumulative histogram. So starting from zero here at the left hand side till over 700 passengers um, at the, in total at the very end. 
And also here for our plot method, for example, we can determine the parameter density. And here we can set it to true. And now we should get on the left hand side instead of absolute quantities, uh, relative quantities. And this is true here. So actually the direct pandas methods um, have uh, the advantage that by default they can handle missing values. But if we have a look at the parameters, not all parameters uh, that uh, the direct matplotlib method provides are explicitly here listed in the parameters. And if you do not know that uh, these parameters exist, so then you could get uh, limited here in the functionalities. So in the end it's uh, best to at least uh, know all three alternatives and uh, know all parameters uh, that you can actually use. And then in the end it's uh, actually a matter of taste uh, which one uh, of uh, these alternatives uh, you use. Alright, with this we are finished here and I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye! In this video we learn how to create two-dimensional scatter plots. So scatter plots are specifically useful to detect the relationships between two numerical features. So for example in our Titanic dataset we have the numerical features age and fare. And by creating a scatter plot for these two features we might get a first visual impression whether there is a relationship between these two factors. So for example our hypothesis might be that older passengers have more money and therefore pay a higher ticket price. So we will see this in a minute, but uh, first of all let's import pandas and uh, we import matplotlib and we are using the Seaborn style. And uh, then we are working here with the Titanic dataset. And now if you want to create a scatter plot for the Titanic data frame, we can call here the plot method and instead of passing here a line to the kind parameter we can pass scatter. And now let's press shift tab here. So here we have uh, the parameters x and y. And here we have to determine which uh, column should be on the x axis and uh, which column on the y axis. And here in our example we want to have uh, the h column on the x axis. So we pass here the h column to the parameter x. And within quotation marks here. And on the y axis we want to have uh, the fair column. And we've also set uh, the figure size to 15.8 and uh, now we can uh, run here the code. And here we can see the scatter plot for the age and uh, the fare column. And actually each uh, single dot or scatter is a passenger. So for example here we have a passenger that is uh, 64 years old and the passenger paid actually about 260 or 70 ticket price. And so we have for all passengers here where we have uh, non-missing values in the fare and age column one uh, dot or one scatter here. And apparently with a very first inspection it's uh, quite hard to detect here any relationship. So our hypothesis was that uh, the older the passenger the higher the ticket price. So if our hypothesis holds true then we would actually expect uh, scatters from the bottom left to the top right. But uh, this is actually here hard to confirm visually and in this case you would need to perform some uh, more advanced uh, statistical analysis. So let's move on here with our plot and uh, actually we can determine the color of the scatters and we can do this with uh, the parameter C. And here we can pass for example red. And there's also a parameter where we can change uh, the type of uh, the dots or the scatters here. And this is called marker. And the default setting is that here we have a kind of a round dot. So the default setting here is um, this kind here. So here you can see nothing has changed. But we can also change the marker for example to uh, D or to uppercase X or to lowercase x and then we get here actually different scatters. And also we can change the size of the scatters here with the parameter s for size. And here we can pass an integer, so for example let's try 20. 
And we can also increase the size by increasing here the integer. So for example, to 50. And now we have uh, actually here a larger scatters. So now let's go back here to 20. And there's actually one more feature where we can transform here our two dimensional scatter plot into a three dimensional scatter plot. And we can do this by passing here to the color parameter another column of the data frame. And if we pass here the survived column, then we get here for the dots or for the scatters uh, different colors depending whether the corresponding passenger survived or not survived. So for example, the passenger here has a white color and white color actually means here a zero in the survived column, which means uh, that uh, this passenger did not survive. So in the end, we can say that here we have a three dimensional graph. So the first dimension is here the x axis age, then we have uh, the y axis uh, fair, and we have uh, the color which uh, gives us information uh, whether the passenger survived or not. And we can also change um, the color style here of uh, the survived column. And uh, there is uh, the parameter color map. And if we have a look at uh, the matplotlib page, then here we can see some color styles. So we have uh, Viridis, Plasma, Inferno, Magma, and some more here. So let's uh, choose here Viridis. And we pass Viridis here as a string. And let's run the cell. And here we can see that uh, we have successfully changed uh, the color map. So now yellow stands for survived and uh, the dark color for not survived. So here in the survived column, we only have uh, two different values, uh, 0 and 1, and uh, therefore we have only dots or scatters that are dark or yellow. But uh, let's try also here the column uh, p-class. And here we can see now that we have uh, dots or scatters with uh, three different colors. So we have for the third class uh, yellow, then we have uh, for the second class green, and for the first class we have here kind of a dark color. And here we can see visually that the first class passengers paid the highest ticket prices. So we have here the dark scatters or dark plots here at the top. Then we have uh, the second class with the green dots here in the middle. And then at the, the bottom, we have actually the yellow dots for the third class. And actually the relationship between H and P class is uh, less intuitive. However, one could uh, conclude actually that uh, the very young passengers here are more likely to be in the second or third class. And the older passengers are actually more likely to be first class passengers. All right, this was the video on scatter plots, and I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye. In this video, we are going to create our very first seaborne plot, a so-called count plot. But uh, before we need to import pandas and also seaborne, and by convention, the standard abbreviation is SNS. So we import seaborne as SNS, and we also import uh, matplotlib. And in this video, we are working with the Titanic data frame. So let's also import this here. So here we have the first five rows. And now we want to create a seaborne count plot. And earlier in this course, uh, we have seen that we can split our data into different groups by using categorical data. And uh, we did this, for example, with the group by method. And with the group by method, we were able to group our data by, for example, the sex column into female and male. Or we also created uh, six groups by the categories sex and p class. And with the group by method, we were also able to count uh, the number of elements in each group. So for example, the number of uh, first class male passengers on board of the Titanic. And exactly this we can do also with uh, the count plot uh, graphically. So first of all, we set here the figure size to 12.8. And as a final statement here, we have plt.show. So this is uh, nothing new. And now we want to create a count plot and we can do this with uh, sns.countplot. And let's have a look here inside the brackets. 
So the count plot shows the counts of observations in each categorical bin using bars. And we have here several parameters and the structure of the Seaborn plots are quite similar. So we always have here the parameter data and here we have to pass uh, our data frame that we want to plot. So in this example Titanic. And then in addition we have here the parameters x and y and here we have to pass uh, one column. So for example let's assume that uh, we want to count the amount of uh, female and the amount of males on board of the Titanic. Then we pass here to the parameter x our column sex here in uh, quotation marks. So let's uh, run here the cell. And here we can actually see a bar chart where we have here on the left hand side uh, the amount of males. So it's about 570 and the number of females on board of the Titanic, so about 320 something. So this is here a vertical count plot, uh, but we can also pass uh, the sex column to the y parameter. And now we have uh, the same chart uh, horizontally. So let's go back to the vertical graph. And actually the very powerful thing with uh, Seaborn is that uh, we can further split here our data into uh, subgroups. So for example here we can split up the bin for the male passengers into a first class, second class and third class bin. And we can do the same with uh, the female bin here. And uh, there's uh, the very powerful parameter hue and we can find uh, this parameter in many Seaborn plots. So let's have a look here. So here we have uh, the parameter hue and here we can pass a column with uh, categorical data. So in our example we could pass here for example the p-class column. And uh, let's have a look what we get here. So here we actually split up our male bin and our female bin into uh, three separate bins. So we have in total about 120 first class male passengers. Then we have here an orange for male and female the uh, second class pas passengers and in green the third class passengers. So here we have our sixth group and for each group we have uh, the number of passengers which belong to the respective group. And we can also customize and uh, change uh, the style of Seaborn plots. And we can do this here with uh, sns.set. Uh, so let's have a look here. And it says here set aesthetic parameters in one step. So for example here we can change the font scale. Let's try this out here. So with this actually we can make the font size here on the x and y axis and on the legend larger. So for example let's pass here 2. And now we have here a significantly larger font size. And for example we can also have some other changes here. So we can change the font itself. Or we can also change uh, the color map. So in matplotlib uh, we know this as color map. Here we have uh, the parameter palette. And uh, for example let's uh, call this parameter here. And let's pass uh, the color map uh, vdidis. And by doing so we can change here the color style. And there are actually many more options to customize here our graphs. So feel free to have a look at uh, the matplotlib and also at the Seaborn documentation. And uh, for the time being now well, we are finished here with uh, this uh, first video and I hope to see you also in the next videos. Bye! In this video we are creating several categorical Seaborn plots. And they all have in common that we group our data by categories. So for example in our Titanic data frame we have uh, the categories P-class and uh, sex. So we split our data into groups and then we compare these groups for example by the age or by the fare. And we can uh, draw conclusions like uh, that uh, the first class male passengers were older than the third class female passengers and so on. So we have still imported here pandas and uh, Seaborn and matplotlib and we still have imported our titanic data frame. And for all of our plots we set here the figure size to 12.8 and we increase uh, the font scale to 1.5. And our very first plot should be a categorical scatter plot, which is a strip plot. So we call here sns.strip plot, and uh, let's have a look here. So the strip plot actually draws a scatter plot where one variable is categorical.
And also here we have uh, the parameter data where we have to pass um, our data frame here, Titanic. And now let's assume that we want to have on the x-axis our categorical variables, so here sex. And on the y-axis uh, we want to have uh, the age. So let's simply run the cell here. So we split here up our data into a male and female. And here for each single male passenger we have a dot uh, corresponding to the age. And the same we have for, for all females. And you can see here that uh, many points are overlapping. We have here the parameter jitter. And by default it's set to false, but we can also set this to true. And by doing so we make here the plot or the, the points uh, non-overlapping. So now we can better see that the majority of male passengers are here around uh, 20 to 35. And we have some pretty younger male passengers and also some quite old passengers here. And the same we have here for the female passengers. And also the strip plot provides uh, for the option to further split here our two categories into more categories. So instead of having here only male and female, we could also have here male first class, male second class, male third class, and the same for the females. And again here we have the parameter hue, and by default it's set to none, but here we can pass also a categorical variable or a categorical column. And for example here we can pass uh, the p-class column. So let's run here the cell. And we can see here that for each point or for each dot we have uh, the additional information about uh, the p-class. So most of uh, the very old uh, male passengers are actually blue, so this is uh, the first class for example. But it's actually pretty hard to differentiate between uh, the colors and between the classes. And uh, therefore we have here the additional parameter dodge. And by default it's set to false, but uh, we can set it to true. And by doing so we're actually separating here the points or the dots uh, for the p-classes. So now here we have one line with uh, first class passenger dots or scatters. Then we have here one line with the second class males and so on. And actually at a very first glance we can now see here that uh, for male as uh, well for females it looks like uh, that first class passengers are older than the second class passengers and that are older than the third class passengers. So you can see here that we have here a kind of a decreasing uh, trend. And we not only can split our data by the sex and uh, the p-class column, so for example instead of having here the p-class column, we can also pass here the survived uh, information to the hue parameter. And now we have here in blue all passengers uh, that did not survive and in orange all passengers uh, that uh, did survive. All right, now let's go on. And there's another categorical scatter plot called the swarm plot. So let's have a look here. And the swarm plot actually draws a categorical scatter plot with non-overlapping points. So let's have a look. And the swarm plot is uh, pretty much uh, the same as here the strip plot with having jitter equals uh, true. So let's have again here the P class to compare it. So these two plots are quite similar, but uh, still here with a swarm plot we can even better see the distribution here. So for example here we have uh, third class male passengers uh, that are here all um, at the, the same age. And uh, the swarm plot actually locates all dots uh, side by side. So here we can even better see the distribution or the frequency distribution of uh, the age for the six groups here. So the most frequent age for third class male passengers are here and for example for first class male passengers we can see that uh, there is actually no single concentration here. So we have quite a stable distribution across uh, all ages here. And there's another plot where we can even better see uh, the uh, distribution and this is uh, the violin plot. And again here we have on the x-axis um, the sex and on the y-axis uh, the age. And additionally we split the male and the female group into the three passenger classes. So let's have a look here. 
And instead of having here a scatter plot, we have here actually a line or a curve where we can see actually the frequency distribution. So let's have a look here. And the line or the curve that uh, you can see here is actually called a kernel density estimate. So this is kind of a smoothened histogram where we can see actually the frequency distribution. So here, for example, for first class male passengers, uh, the highest uh, frequencies here are around uh, 40. And for second class passengers, it's around um, 30. And for third class passengers, it's around 20. And we can also see here that here we have a warning message. So here a future warning message. And this has uh, something to do with uh, the interaction between Seaborn and uh, the stats library. So at this point here we can ignore it. And actually we can also combine the plots. So here we have a violin plot and here we have a swarm plot. And we can actually combine both plots into one plot. So we enable here the swarm plot. And in the swarm plot we have actually here the same parameters. So we have on the x-axis uh, the uh, sex column, on the y-axis uh, the age. Then we additionally uh, split here up into the passenger classes. And in addition we want to have a black color for all scatters or for all dots. So let's have a look here. So here we have now a combination of uh, the violin plot and the swarm plot. So we can even better see now that uh, the highest frequencies here for example for third class male passengers are here around uh, 20. And for the violin plot there's actually another option here. So we can see here that on the x-axis uh, we have uh, two categories and for both categories we have uh, three plots. But actually if we swap the levels here, so if we have here on the x-axis um, the uh, three classes and for each class we have uh, two plots, so for female and male, then we can actually merge uh, the two plots. So here again we are creating a violin plot and then we exchange p-class and uh, sex. So we pass p-class to the x parameter and sex to the q parameter. So let's have a look here. So here we can see on the x-axis uh, the three categories. And for each category we have uh, two violin plots. So for male and female. And if we have two plots for each category we can also merge them. So we can have here one violin plot and on the left hand side we have actually the distribution for the male passengers and on the right hand side for the female passengers. And uh, therefore we have to pass here true to the split parameter. So by default it's set to false but we can set it to true. And let's see what happens. So now here we have only three violins. So one for the first class, one for the second and one for the third class. So on the left hand side uh, we have uh, the distribution of the ages for male and on the right hand side for female passengers. And so we can even better compare male versus uh, female. Alright. And there's an additional seaborne plot called bar plot. And again we pass our titanic data frame to the parameter data. Then on the x-axis we want to have the p-class, on the y-axis the age. And we pass uh, sex to the Q parameter. So let's have a look here. So here on the X axis we have our three P classes. And for each P class we have uh, female and uh, male. So female is here orange and male is blue. And here on the Y axis uh, we have uh, the age and by default the bar plot actually calculates uh, the mean age for all six groups. So here we have six groups. And uh, the height of the bars here actually uh, the mean age. So here for first class male passengers we have a mean age of uh, over 40. Then for example for females here in the first class we have uh, about uh, 34, 35. And these are so called point estimates because we simply calculate here the mean over all uh, passengers in the respective group. And in addition we can see here the black line which gives us kind of a confidence interval. So instead of having only one point estimate and saying that uh, the average age of first class male passengers is uh, 42, the confidence interval says that for example in 95% of all cases the mean age of uh, first class passengers should be between uh, these two points here.
So this is a more statistical approach. And with this, we can answer the question whether it is statistically significant that uh, here the male passengers are older than the female passengers. So let's have a look here inside um, the brackets. And we can see here that here we have a confidence interval of uh, 95 and uh, we have uh, 1000 uh, simulations. So Seaborn simulates here the booking for the Titanic uh, 1000 times and then creates here a confidence interval where we can find, for example, the mean age of all first-class male passengers in 95% of all cases. So this is here the interpretation. And as we can see here that there's hardly any overlapping. So here we could conclude that it is statistically significant that first-class male passengers were older than first-class female passengers. And for example, if we have a look here at the second class, so here we have an overlapping of the confidence intervals and here it's uh, more hard to say that the difference in the point estimate here, so here the males are a bit older than the females, that uh, this is uh, really is statistically significant. And instead of having here a bar plot, we can also have uh, the same as a point plot. So there's uh, the additional Seaborn plot point plot and also here we have the same parameters. And actually we have here the same plot, but instead of having here bars for each group, we have here, for example, so we have here one line for the male passengers and we can see here the confidence interval for the mean age of first class male passengers. And this is here the point estimate. So the mean age of all first class male passengers was uh, this value here. But if you would uh, repeat the Titanic booking 1000 times, uh, then the mean age is in 95% of all cases in uh, this uh, confidence interval. And we can see here that uh, there's no overlapping with uh, the uh, female confidence interval. And therefore we could uh, conclude here that um, the males are older than the females with uh, statistical significance. And the same we could conclude here for the third class, but uh, we couldn't conclude this um, for the second class. All right, this was uh, the video on categorical plots and I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye! In this video we learn how to create joint plots and regression plots. And with uh, these plots we can graphically analyze whether there's a positive or negative uh, functional relationship between features. So for example, in our Titanic dataset, there are the features age and fare, and we could try to answer the question whether, for example, older passengers pay more than younger passengers for their tickets. And in this video, we will also further graphically analyze whether the age or the fare of the passenger had influence on the chance to survive the disaster. So first of all, let's import pandas, Seaborn and Matplotlib. And again, we are working with our Titanic dataset. And actually in our Titanic dataset, we have uh, two numerical columns, two continuous numerical columns, age and fair. And in the first step, we can create a joint plot, which is actually a scatter plot, where we have on the x-axis uh, the age and on the y-axis uh, the fair. And as a kind of the plot, we can pass here scatter plot. So here we want to have a scatter plot. And here we can see on the x-axis uh, the age and on the y-axis uh, the fare. And each uh, single dot here or each single point is a passenger. And here at the top and on the right hand side we can also see uh, the frequency distribution. So this is uh, the frequency distribution or histogram for the fare. And this is uh, the histogram for the age. So we can see that the majority of ages are here around uh, between 20 and 40. And for the fare here around uh, between the 0 and 50. And also here we have a future warning, which is caused by an interaction between the SciPy package and the Seaborn package. So we can ignore this here. And actually with the parameter height, we can determine here the size and the height of the graph. And we can also change here the kind of uh, the plot. So instead of having a scatter plot, we can have different plots. So let's uh, check this here. And here we have the option to pass scatter, regression, residual, KDE or hex. So let's pass here hex.
and hex stands for a hex bin plot. And here we can see that our plot or here the area is divided into equal sized hexagons. And the darker the color of the respective hexagon, the more uh, data points we have here. So here we can see the majority of data points uh, we have here at uh, quite uh, low fair prices and at uh, ages between uh, 20 and uh, 38 or something. And we can also pass here KDE. And KDE stands for Kernel Density Estimator. So here instead of having a histogram, we have a kernel density estimator, so kind of a line that uh, approximates um, the histogram. And here in our graph, we can see actually some areas. And uh, the darker the areas, the more data points uh, we have here. So here we can identify where the majority of data points are located. All right, now let's go back to the scatter plot. So here we can see the scatter plot between age and fair. And the next question would be whether there is a significant uh, relationship between age and fair. So for example, whether older passengers paid more than younger passengers. And we can answer this question by having a regression plot. And therefore we can here also pass the rec. And here we can see a regression line through the data points. And the regression line seems to be upward sloping. So here we have a positive relationship or a correlation between the H feature and the fare feature. So the older the passenger, the higher the ticket price. And you can also see here the shaded area around the regression line. And this marks actually the 95% confidence interval for the regression line. So the regression line itself is actually a point estimate. And uh, let's assume that uh, we statistically simulate the booking for the Titanic 1000 times. Then in 95% of all cases, the regression line between age and fare is in this area here. So it seems like that the positive slope or positive uh, relationship is uh, statistically significant here. And Seaborn actually provides some alternatives to create a regression plot with uh, some more functionality. And for example, we can do this with a LM plot. So again, here we pass um, our Titanic data frame to the parameter data. Then we want to have on the x-axis h, on the y-axis fair. And with uh, the parameters aspect and height, we can determine actually the size of the plot or the subplots. So we will see this in a minute and let's run here. So here essentially we have actually the same regression plot with the same regression line and the confidence interval. So let's have a look here. So again here we have parameters like CI which stands for the confidence interval. So here in this uh, confidence interval, here we have a 95% confidence and under the hood Seaborn actually simulates uh, the booking of uh, the Titanic 1000 times. And by doing so, it creates here a confidence interval for the regression line. So this is uh, the same as uh, above. But actually here the LM plot provides uh, some additional functionality. And also here we have the parameter Q and we can split up our data frame, for example, by the sex column. So here we can see that we have categorized all single points or dots as being either male or female. And here we have male with blue color. And for the male dots or points, we have here one regression line and also for the females, we have one regression line. And it seems like that for males and females, the positive uh, relationship is here statistically significant. So we have here an upward sloping uh, regression line. And instead of having here both uh, regression lines in uh, one graph, we can also create subplots and uh, we can do this. And instead of passing here the sex column to the parameter Q, we can pass it to the parameter columns, cull, and by doing so, we're creating here two subplots and actually two columns. 
So here we have uh, the regression plot for the male passengers and here for the female passengers. And uh, both uh, seems to be actually here upward sloping. And theoretically we can also create uh, subplots uh, in the rows by passing here a sex to the rows parameter. So now we have here two rows. We have um, the regression for the male passengers and for the female passengers. But uh, let's stick here to columns. And here with the parameters aspect and height, we can actually customize uh, the size of um, the subplots here. So here we might conclude that there is a positive relationship between age and fare, not only for the male passengers, but also for the female passengers. And now we want to analyze the factors that actually influence um, the chance to survive. And again, we are creating here an LM plot. Then on the x-axis, our first factor is uh, the age. And then on the y-axis, uh, we have um, our survived column. So for the survived column, we know that we only have the values uh, 0 and 1. And uh, let's uh, run here the cell. So here on the x-axis, we can see the age. And on the y-axis, we have either zeros or 1s. And here we have a regression line. But uh, here we have a so-called uh, logistic regression because our dependent variable here, so the survived uh, variable, is actually a categorical feature where we either have uh, the values uh, 0 and 1. And uh, therefore we have to set here the logistic parameter to true because here we want to perform a logistic regression. So now we can see here our logistic regression line and we can see that it's uh, downward sloping and also here the confidence interval suggests that uh, this might be statistically uh, significant. So the older the passenger, the lower is uh, the chance to survive and uh, vice versa. So the younger the passenger, the higher the survival rate or the chance to survive. And this is actually in line with uh, women and uh, children first. So children had a better chance to survive than older passengers. And also here we can make a categorical split. So we can split our data frame into groups. And therefore we can pass here, for example, to the call parameter, a categorical variable. So for example, sex. So here we have the logistic regression between age and survived for male passengers and female passengers. And it looks like that here we have a difference. So for male passengers, it seems like um, the younger the passenger, the higher the chance to survive. And for female passengers, uh, the relationship is actually the other way around. So that could mean that uh, for male passengers, it was even more important to be a child. All right, and actually we can do the same analysis also here split it by the P class. So we have still here on the X axis uh, the age and on the Y axis uh, the survived column. And then we split our data frame by the P class column. And again here, this is a logistic regression as we have here on the y-axis um, the uh, survived uh, feature with uh, categorical data 0 or 1. So we have to pass here true to the logistic parameter. So true with capital T of course. And here we can see the logistic regression for the three passenger classes between age and uh, survived. And it seems that for all three passenger classes, uh, the relationship holds true that uh, the older the passenger, the lower the chance uh, to survive the disaster. All right, this was the video on regression lines. And this is pretty helpful to visualize relationships between uh, features. So now we understand better the factors uh, that influenced actually uh, the chance to survive the Titanic disaster. And with this we are finished here and I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye!
In this video we learn how to create matrix plots and in particular heat maps to visualize cross tabular data. So we will see in a minute what I mean with this and first of all we import pandas and the seaborn and matplotlib and again we are working with the titanic data set and we've already learned that we can split our data into different groups and we can do this by categories. So for example, we have the sex column and the p-class column and in total we can create here six different groups and then we can determine the size of each group. So we can determine how many first class male passengers uh, we had on board of the Titanic. And we can do this for example with the, the direct pandas method uh, cross tab. So here we are passing the two categories the sex and p-class and by doing so we are getting here cross tabular data. So here on the left hand side we have the categories female and male and as columns we have the categories uh, first, second and third class. And for each combination of uh, those two categories we have here actually the amount of passengers uh, that uh, belong to uh, this group. So for example the largest group by far is in the group uh, male passengers in the third class. And this is pretty much the structure that we need for a matrix plot or heat map plot. So we can actually visualize and compare the size of the six groups with a heat map. And first of all we determine the figure size of 12.8 and then also we want to have a larger font scale here. And then we are using here sns.heatmap. And here we pass our cross tab uh, that uh, we created here. So let's uh, run here the cell. So here we have on the x-axis uh, the p-class and on the y-axis uh, the sex. And actually the color here indicates um, the size of each group. So here we can see on the right hand side the color bar and dark color means actually around 100 passengers in this group and the bright color means 300 plus. And we can also include here the exact size of each group by passing here true to the anode parameter. So by doing so we are getting here the numbers. So this is here the largest group, third class male. And here we have uh, 347 passengers and here we have a bright color. And uh, there's another parameter called cmap and here we can define the color map. And actually for a heat map uh, the color map uh, reds is uh, quite appropriate here. So let's do this. So we have here reds with a capital R. So here we have red colors and uh, we have uh, dark red for groups where we have uh, 300 plus passengers and we have uh, bright uh, red for groups where we have around uh, 70 or 100 passengers. And actually we can see here that uh, the scale is uh, not really uh, optimal or perfect here because here we have actually one outlier. So the group uh, male third class is uh, by far the largest group and uh, the other five groups are pretty much um, equal here, so between 76 and 144. And therefore we can cap here our color map, for example to 150. So all groups where we have more than 150 passengers are very dark red here. And here we can see that uh, we can better differentiate uh, the other five groups. So here we have a very bright color with uh, 76 passengers. Then we have a darker color with uh, 94 and so on. So here we have a heat map with uh, the six groups and uh, the color is determined by the size of the groups. But of course uh, the color could be also determined by the survival rate. And again we are using here the cross tab method. And we are splitting our data frame by the sex column and the p class column. And uh, then we have a look into the survive column and calculate uh, the mean. So this is actually the, the survival rate for all six groups. So let's calculate this here. So for example the survival rate for third class male passengers is only 13% and the survival rate for first class female passengers is uh, 96%. And again we can pass here the cross tabular data to the seaborne heat map. And we set the anode parameter to true and we want to have uh, reds. So let's have a look here. So here we have our six groups and we can see in a dark red color 
the groups with a high survival rate of around 90% and, and groups with a low survival rate are marked uh, with uh, bright red. So here we can see the groups male second class and male third class. Here we have only 14 and 16% survival rate and here we have a quite uh, bright color. All right, let's have another example and we can also create a correlation matrix of all numerical features in our Titanic data frame. So here we have the correlation matrix and here we have um, the numerical columns. So for the correlation, we have values between minus one and one and minus one means a perfectly a negative correlation and plus one means a perfectly positive correlation and the zero means no correlation. And here we can see that uh, we have a lot of uh, numbers here and it's, it's at a first glance uh, quite hard to analyze here the correlation matrix. And in particular in this case, it makes sense to visualize here the correlation matrix with a heat map. So we pass here titanic.core to the heat map. Then again we set anode to true and the color map should be reds again. And here we can see a strong positive correlation in dark red and a negative correlation in a bright color. So of course in the diagonal we can see perfect positive correlations between the features itself. So this is no surprise. And we can also have a look here at the survived feature. So we have here a strong negative correlation to the passenger class. That means first class passengers uh, had a higher chance to survive than uh, third class passengers. Then here we can see a small negative correlations uh, with the age and the uh, SIPSP features. Then quite weak positive correlation with the PARCH feature. And a quite significant correlation with uh, the FAIR feature. So the higher the ticket price, uh, the better the, the chance uh, to survive uh, the disaster. And we can see here, for example, the brightest the combination is here between the fair and P-class. So here we have uh, the most uh, negative correlation. And it's uh, no surprise uh, that uh, between fair and P-class, uh, there's a strong negative correlation. So passengers in the first class paid more for the tickets uh, than passengers in the third class. And here we can see quite a strong positive correlation between uh, PARCH and uh, SIPSP. So when passengers traveled with uh, their husband or wife, then it was quite likely that also children were also on board. And as a summary, we can see here that we get at a very first glance an intuition on the correlations without having here a closer look at numbers. So we can see this here graphically. And uh, this definitely helps if we have here even more rows and columns. So for the human eye, some colors are more intuitive uh, than uh, blank numbers here. All right, and uh, with this, we are finished here with uh, this video and I hope to see you also in the next one. Bye. In this video, we learn how to remove complete columns from a data frame. And uh, first of all, we import pandas and we import our Summer Olympic Games uh, metal data frame. And have a look at the first five rows. And here we can see that we have the columns sport, discipline and event. And let's assume we only want to keep the column event uh, because in the information in the uh, sport column and discipline column are a bit redundant actually. So first of all we try to remove um, the sport column and therefore we can use um, the drop method. And in the drop method we can pass the label of the column we want to remove to the parameter columns. And let's see what we get here. We get here a data frame without um, the sports column. All right, so let's check again our data frame. And here we can see that uh, the sport uh, column is still in our data frame. So also the drop method uh, has uh, the in-place parameter, which is uh, by default set to false. And if you want to change our data frame, we have to set um, the in-place parameter to true. But before we set, we want to drop um, the sports column and the discipline column. And we can, of course, also remove uh, multiple columns within the uh, drop method. 
And we can do this by passing a list of column labels to the parameter columns. So let's check here. So here we can see that we removed the, the column sport and the column discipline. And now if we want to make this in place and change our original data frame, we have to set the in place parameter to true. And let's check again our data frame. And now we can see that now in our data frame there is no sport and no discipline column. And now let's assume we want to drop also the event column. Then we again use the drop method. But instead of passing the event column to the parameter column, we can also pass event to the parameter label. So let's check here. So before we passed our, our columns uh, that we wanted to drop to the parameter columns, but we can also pass them um, this to labels and define uh, the axis from which we want to drop our label. And uh, in this case, it's uh, either we can use uh, one for columns. So let's check here. Now we have removed the event or we can use in quotation marks columns. Ah, and then it's missing here. So that's actually the second alternative. So either we pass our column labels to the parameter columns or we pass it to the parameter labels and define the axis as columns or as one. And again, we have to set the in place parameter to true. And let's check again our data frame. So now we have removed uh, the sports uh, column, the discipline column and uh, the event column. And there's another way to remove a column with uh, the keyword delete and then selecting the event column from our summer data frame. But uh, I wouldn't recommend this one. So I would definitely go for the drop method here and use um, the drop method to drop a column. So now let's import our summer's uh, data set again. So this is uh, the original one. And before we dropped them, um, the columns uh, sport, discipline and event. But instead of dropping the three columns, we could also explicitly um, select uh, the other columns. So we could select uh, year, city, athlete, country, gender and medal. And we can do this uh, with uh, the log operator. So we select all rows. And then we pass a list of column labels uh, that we want to keep in our summer data frame. So year, city, athlete, country, gender and medal. And we overwrite uh, our summer's data frame. So our new data frame, summer data frame contains the columns year, city, athlete, country, gender, medal. And it does not contain the columns sport, discipline and event. All right, so this also works. And it depends actually on the case whether you drop them um, the columns uh, that you don't need or you select the columns uh, that you need. So let's assume we have a data frame with uh, 100 columns and you want to drop one column, then you should definitely use um, the drop method. But uh, if you have a data frame with uh, 100 columns and you want to keep only two columns, then it makes more sense to explicitly uh, select the two columns. All right, so now we are finished with this session and I hope to see you in the next session. Bye. Welcome to the pandas group by section. So group by operations are one of the most powerful data analysis tools in pandas and the functionality and flexibility is almost unlimited. And that's why group by is actually my favorite pandas tool. So it's simply fun to perform group by operations. All right, so now I want to give you a very first intuition what we can do with the group by method. And uh, let's assume we have here our data frame with the male passengers and female passengers. And what we can simply do, we can calculate uh, the mean or the average age over all passengers with uh, the mean method. But uh, what if we are interested in the group specific uh, mean ages? So for example, the mean age over all female passengers and the mean age of all male passengers. And group by actually provides us uh, the easiest and most comfortable way to do this and uh, to perform group specific operations. So actually within one line of code, we can transform here our data frame into a summary data frame where we have uh, the mean age for all female passengers and the mean age for all male passengers. 
And we can simply do this with uh, the group by method where we have to pass the key by which uh, we want to split our data frame here by the sex key. So we have uh, male and female in our sex column. And uh, then we apply the mean method. And by doing so within one line of code, we are getting here our new data frame. So no worry, I will explain this in more detail in the next videos and we will also practice uh, this in more detail. So this was just a little outlook. And actually this is just uh, the top of the iceberg of uh, what we can do with group by. And as I said, uh, the functionality and complexity is unlimited here. So we will see this in the next videos where we will dive deep into this topic. So I hope to see you there. Bye. Welcome to our first coding video on group by operations. In this and the next video, we want to figure out and really understand what group by does in the background. And we also want to understand what a group by object is. So first of all, we will have a deeper look into the split part of split, apply and combine. But first of all, let's import pandas. And uh, we are working with uh, the Titanic dataset. And let's have a look here at the first five rows and the last five rows. And also at some meta information with uh, the info method. And for the time being, we want to work with a toy example. So we slice our Titanic data frame only for the first 10 rows and for the columns sex and age. And we are saving here the slice in the variable Titanic slice. So let's do this. And let's have a look here at our slice. So here we have uh, the first 10 passengers and uh, the columns sex and age. And now we want to use uh, the group by method on our slice here. And what we actually want to do, we want to split here our data frame by the sex column. So the key is uh, the sex column. And by doing so, we expect uh, that we split here our data frame and then we get all rows or all passengers who are female and we get all rows um, and passengers who are male. So let's also press here shift tab within the brackets and the most important parameter is here the by parameter where we have to define the keys by which we want to slice our data frame. And here we have to pass one or several columns and in this case here we are passing the sex column. So let's do this here. And here we can see that we get something like a group by object. So let's uh, store here the group by object in the variable GBO group by object. And let's also check uh, the data type of uh, GBO. So here it's a data frame group by object. And same as with all data types or classes in Python, also the group by object has specific attributes and methods. And one attribute is the groups attribute. So let's try this out here. And here we can see that we have two groups in our group by object. So we have uh, the group female with actually all rows where we have a female. So we have in the rows one, two, three, eight, nine females. So let's check this out here in our data frame. One, two, three, eight and nine. So here we have actually the index labels where we have females in our data frame. And uh, the second group is uh, the male group. And also here we have uh, the index labels for the rows where we have males. So we have here 0, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0, 4, 5, 6, 7. And now we could also transform here our group by object into a list by using here the list function. And uh, we save our list in the variable L. And let's have a look here at L. So it's actually at a first glance hard to see what we have here. But uh, apparently our list has two elements. So the first element starts here with uh, the bracket and ends here. And the second element starts and ends here. So let's check first of all the length of our list. So the amount of elements. So we have two elements. And now let's uh, select uh, the first element of our list. So here we have uh, the first element. And here it looks like a tuple. So we have here two brackets. And apparently our tuple consists of two elements. So we have here the string female. And it seems like that we have here a data frame with all rows where we have a female. And we can also check here the data type. So it should be a tuple. 
And now we can also select the, the first element in our tuple. So it should be here female. So let's try this out. And it's a female. And uh, this is apparently a string object. And let's also select uh, the second element of our tuple here. So this looks like a data frame. And indeed here we have a data frame with all rows where we have females. And still here on the left side, the index labels are the same as here in our original data frame. So here we have for the females, uh, the index labels 1, 2, 3, 8 and 9. And also here we have 1, 2, 3, 8 and 9. And we can also check here the data types. So this should be a pandas data frame. Exactly. And for the sake of completeness, we can also check um, the second element in our tuple here. So this time we have here a tuple with um, the first element, the string male, and the second element, um, our data frame, with rows where we have uh, male passengers. All right. So what the group by method actually did, it split our original data frame into two data frames. And uh, the first data frame contains all rows with female passengers and uh, the second data frame contains all rows with uh, male passengers. And alternatively, we could also slice our data frame with uh, the log operator and slice for all rows where the sex column is female. So we can also do this in this way here. And here we can see that we get here the same slice. So here we have all rows with females and here we have all rows with females. And we can also save here the slice with all females in the variable titanic slice female. And we can do the same with uh, male. And uh, then we can check with uh, the equals method whether the data frame with all female passengers which we created here with the log operator is actually the same as our sliced uh, group by object here. So here we get a true. So this confirms uh, that the, the group by method splits our data frame by the key sex and creates two data frames, one female data frame and one male data frame. And we can also iterate over our group by object with a for loop. And for each element in our group by object, we want to print uh, the data frame. So we can also do this here. And we get here our female data frame and our male data frame. All right, so now let's go also back to our slides here. And uh, this is actually exactly what we did right now. So we created here a group by object and this is actually the split part. So we had here our original data frame or our, actually our slice of our data frame with uh, nine passengers and the sex and age column. And uh, then we applied here the group by method by the key sex. And by doing so, we splitted our data frame into two data frames, where in the first data frame, we have all female rows here. And in the second data frame, we have here all rows where we have a male passenger. So, and this is now our group by object. So we have two groups or two data frames split by the key sex. All right, so we are finished now with uh, this video. And in the next video, we can see that we can also split a data frame by more than one key. So by many keys, by two, three or four keys. So hope to see you there. Bye. In this video, we will split our data frame by more than one key. So in principle, we can split our data frames by one, two, three or whatever number of keys. So this is no problem. And first of all, we import pandas as always. And then now we are working with the Summer Olympics data frame. And we will have a look at the first five rows here and also add some meta information. And this time we are working with the whole data frame. So no toy examples this time. And let's have a look here at the country column. So now let's first have a look how many different or unique countries we have in our data frame. So up to now athletes from 147 countries have already won medals in some Olympic Games. And in the last video where we have split our Titanic data frame into a male data frame and a female data frame, we have seen that we can also do this with the log operator 
and create a group by group. So this is quite easy if we only have two groups, so males and females. But if we have here 147 groups, like in this case, then doing this manually with the log operator is getting quite messy. And with the group by method, we can do this actually in one line. So let's do this. We are splitting our Summer Olympics data frame by the key country and we save our group by object in the variable split one. And let's transform our group by object into a list and store it in the variable L. So let's have a look here at our list L. First of all, let's check here the length. So we have 147 countries and the length of our list is 147. And for each country, actually, we have here in our list a tuple consisting of the country code here, starting with Afghanistan. And then the second element here in the tuple is actually the data frame with all rows where we have athletes from Afghanistan. So in total here we have two medals, both medals awarded here in Taekwondo. And here we have uh, the second element of our list. It's uh, the country AHO. So actually I do not know which country it is. And uh, then the third element is here Algeria. So we can also randomly select here a data frame and we slice for the tuple at index position 100 and we slice for the data frame. So let's see what we get here. And we get here a data frame with all medals won by athletes from the Philippines. And now instead of splitting our data frame only by the country, we want to split our data frame by country and gender. So here with our group by method, we have the parameter by and before we just passed here one column name, but we can pass here a list of multiple column names. So here we are passing the column name country and gender. And by doing so, we can split our data frame by country and gender. So let's do this and we save our group by object in the variable split2. So let's run here the cell. And then we are transforming our group by object into a list and save the list in the variable L2. And let's print here L2. And first of all, you can see here the first element. We have here all men from Afghanistan that already won a medal in some Olympic Games. And we can also check here the length of our list too. So intuitively we could say, okay, we have uh, 147 countries and we have male and female. So the number of possible combinations should be two times 147. It's 294. So potentially we have 294 groups, but I do think at least for the small countries that we have countries where only male athletes or female athletes have already won medals. So I do not expect to have here in our L2 list a length of 294. So let's check this out. And we have only 236 groups. And let's uh, randomly select uh, the group at index position 104. And here we can see that we have uh, the group with female athletes from Ireland. So actually we have here one, two, three, four, five, six medals that has been awarded to female athletes from Ireland. And apparently here we have a tuple, so we can also check here for the first element in our tuple. And here it's not a string, but also a tuple consisting of two strings. So here are two groups. So we have island and the women. And we can also slice here our tuple for the second element. So the second element here is uh, the data frame. And here we have uh, the data frame with all rows or all medals where we have female athletes from island. And still here on the left side, we have here the index labels from our original data frame. All right, so now in this video, we split our Summer Olympics data frame, not only by one key, but by two keys. And we could also do the same for more keys. So for example, we could say that we want to split our data frame by country, athlete, and let's say the year or the edition of uh, the Olympic Games. 
Then here Michelle Marie Smith would actually form one group, so female athletes from Ireland who won in the edition 1996 a medal. And a second group would be female athletes also from Ireland that won in the year or in the edition 2000 a medal. So here in this data frame we only would have Sonia O'Sullivan. Alright, we are finished now with uh, this video and I do think we have now a good impression how group by splits our original data frame in many data frames or in many groups. And in the next video we will learn how split apply combine works. So this is uh, the real power of group by and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! In this video we learn how to perform split apply combine operations on a data frame with the group by method. So in the last videos we already learned how to split a data frame into groups. And now we apply a function to our group by object and by doing so we are creating a new combined data frame. This sounds complicated but you will see that it's really easy and straightforward. So let's start coding and we import pandas. And we are working with the Titanic dataset. And also this time we are working with our toy example, so we are slicing our Titanic data frame and we only use in the first 10 rows and the columns sex and age. So here's our toy example. And we have already learned that by applying the group by method and for example using the key sex, we are splitting our data frame here into, uh, in this example, two data frames. So we have one data frame with all rows where the passenger is female and we have another data frame with the rows um, where the passenger is male. And we can transform our group by object into a list and then we can slice our list. And here our first data frame and our group by object is uh, the female data frame and the second data frame is uh, the male data frame. And now let's assume that we want to calculate the average age of uh, the females and uh, the average age of um, the male passengers. And uh, therefore we are using here the group by method on our slice. And we group by the sex column, so male and female. And by doing so we are creating a group by object. And then we have to apply a function on our group by object. And uh, the function will be applied on both uh, data frames in our group by object. And after we have applied both functions here, both data frames will be combined to one new data frame. So this sounds complicated, but uh, let's just do it. And we are using the function mean. And uh, let's run the cell and let's see what we get here. So we are getting here a brand new data frame where we have as index here our sex column, so female and male. And we have here a single column, age. And here we have the mean or the average age for all females and for all males. So actually here 28 is the mean or the average of all of the females here in our split. And also here for our males, so 28.25 is the mean or the average of all male passengers here. And by default pandas is just ignoring here the missing value or any n value. And this is actually all. So with the group by method, we split our original data frame in a female and a male data frame. And then for the female and the male data frame, we calculated the average age and then we combined the average age of females and the average age of males into one final data frame here. And let's also have a look at our slides here. So here we had our original data frame. Then we used here the group by method and used as a key the sex column. And by doing so we created a group by object. So we split our data frame into all rows where we have females and all rows where we have males. And then we applied the function mean. And by doing so pandas actually calculated the mean age of all females and the mean age of all males. And then both mean values were combined into a brand new data frame. So by applying the group by method we splitted our data frame and by using here the mean function we applied a function on both data frames and at the same time we combined our groups into a new data frame. Alright, so now let's go back coding. And in theory as a function here we can apply um, any function. 
And the most frequently used functions are actually aggregations, so taking the mean or the sum or the min or the max of uh, the groups. So as a next step, we could also use here the sum function on our group by object. So let's see what we get here. And we are using here the group by and sum function on our whole data frame. So we are having all 891 rows and all columns. And uh, let's see what we get here. So again, we split it our data frame here by the sex column. So we have female and male. And then we have for each column here actually the sum. So we have here the survived column and in total 233 female passengers survived and only 109 male passengers survived. And we have also the sum of the p-class, so in this case it doesn't make really sense. And we have also the sum of the age, so all females together are 7286 years old. And we have also the sum of all siblings and spouses. So all female passengers together had uh, 218 siblings and uh, spouses on board. And we have the same here for parents and children. And also we have uh, the sum of uh, the fare. So all females together paid about $14,000 uh, or pound. And all male passengers together paid uh, slightly more than the females. And you can see here that taking the sum does not make sense for all columns. So let's assume we are only interested in the survived column and we can do so here by here just only choosing the survived column. So dot survived. So this is actually method chaining. So first of all, we are using the group by method on our Titanic data frame and we group our Titanic data frame by the sex column. Then we are only interested in the survived column and for each group, so female and male, we want to know the amount of uh, female and male who survived. All right, so let's do this. And we can see here that we only get aggregations for the survived columns. So we have 233 females who survived and only 109 men. All right, and of course we can select uh, more than one column. So here we only selected uh, the survived column, but we can also select uh, the fair and the age column. So we have to pass here within our spare brackets a list with the fair and the age column. And we split our data frame by the sex column and then we want to know the maximum. So we want to know the maximum fare paid by a female and by a male. And we want to know the maximum age of uh, females and males. So let's do this here. So the highest fare paid by a female is 512. And also the highest fare paid by a male is also 512. And the oldest female on board was 63 years old and the oldest male on board was 80 years old. All right, so now let's again split our whole Titanic data frame by the sex column. And we want to calculate the mean on all columns. So let's do this and we assign the variable new data frame. So let's have a look at new data frame. So here we have uh, the mean for all columns by female and male. So on average, 74% uh, of all females survived uh, the Titanic disaster and only about 19% of all males. And the average passenger class is a little bit higher for the males. And also the male passengers are a bit uh, older on average um, than the female passengers. And on average, um, the female passengers paid more for their tickets uh, than the male passengers. So on average, um, the females paid $44 or pound and the males paid uh, $25 or pound. All right, and now we can also visualize here our new data frame and we import matplotlib and we use um, the Seaborn style. And we want to have a bar plot uh, for each column where we can see the difference between female and male. So let's do this and let's have a look here. So here we use the subplots true. So for each column here, we have a subplot and here the first subplot is uh, for to survive. And we can see here on the left side are the females and on the right side are the males. And we can see that uh, the survival rate is uh, tremendously higher for females. 
And here we have uh, the average of the passenger class and here the average of the age. So here we can see that on average um, the male passengers were a bit older than the female passengers. And here we have the information about uh, the fare. So on average um, the female passengers paid significantly more than the male passengers. Alright, so now we are finished with our video and in the next video we will apply our new split apply combine skills to some more cases. So hope to see you there. Bye. In this video we will learn some very helpful daytime index methods and attributes and with these methods and attributes we can for example create additional features for our data frame containing some kind of customized representation of a date or time. So let's first of all import pandas and uh, we import our stocks uh, CSV and we set the date column as being the date time index. So let's have a look here. And then we only select here the opening prices for our six stocks and we are creating here a copy and uh, store the new data frame in the variable close. So let's have a look here. So this is our closed data frame with the daily closing prices for our six stocks. And let's also call here the info method. And we can see here that we have a daytime index uh, with uh, actually daily timestamps. And with uh, the index attribute, we can also have a closer look at our daytime index. So here we have the daytime index with uh, the timestamps. So in total we have 2290 uh, daily timestamps. And here we can see for example for one timestamp. So here we have uh, the 4th of uh, January 2010. And it uh, might be quite helpful to get here additional information or different uh, representation of the date. So for example it might be useful to have um, the day of the week. So for example Tuesday or Wednesday or the quarter of the year. So here in this example it's uh, the first quarter. And we can do this with uh, quite helpful attributes and methods on the index. So first of all we have here the day attribute. And here we get actually the day of the month. So for example here in our first timestamp we have uh, the 31st of December and here we get uh, the 31st. So the data type is here an integer. And consequently we get here for the other timestamps, for example here 4, then we get 5 and so on. And we can also get an integer representation of uh, the month. And we can do this with the month attribute. So here we have the data type integer. And we get 12 here for the timestamp in December. And 1 for the timestamps in uh, January and so on. Next we can also get uh, the year with uh, the year attribute. So here again we have uh, integer data types 2009, 2010 and so on. And for each row or for each timestamp in our data frame we can also get uh, the day of the week or the day name with uh, the method day name. So here we have uh, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday and so on. And we can actually do the very same with uh, the attribute week name or weekday name and here we get actually the same uh, weekday names. And also instead of getting an integer representation of the month, so here 12, 1, 2, 3, we can get uh, the month name. So here with uh, the method month name and here we get uh, December, January, February and so on. So next we have the attribute uh, weekday and instead of getting here the string representation Thursday, Monday, Tuesday we get here an integer representation. So zero stands for Monday, then one stands for Tuesday and so on. And we can also get uh, the quarter with uh, the quarter attribute. And by default the first quarter is from uh, January to March the second from April to June and so on. So here we can see for the timestamp in December we get a 4 and for the timestamps in January a 1 as integer. Then next we have also the attribute days in month. And here we get for each row or for each timestamp 
the amount of uh, days in the respective months. So here in December we have uh, 31, in uh, January 31 and so on. And next uh, there's also the week attribute. And here we get actually the calendar week. So the very last week in December is um, the week uh, 53, then the very first week in January is uh, week 1 and so on. And the same we can actually get with uh, the attribute week of year. So this is uh, the same. And there's another attribute called is month end. And here pandas checks for each row or for each timestamp whether the day is actually the very last day of uh, the month. So here we have for the 31st of December a true and for the 1st of uh, January or for the 2nd a false. So these were some very helpful attributes and methods on the daytime index and uh, there are even uh, more methods so feel free to have a closer look. And now we can also create uh, new columns and new features for our data frame. So for example we want to have uh, the day name as a new feature and we can create here a new column called day and we want to have uh, the quarter as a new column or new feature. So let's uh, do this here and let's have a look here at our new data frame. So here we have our adjusted closed data frame where we have here on the right hand side the two additional columns day and quarter. And here for each row or for each timestamp we have here the weekday and uh, the quarter. So creating additional features uh, with a different uh, representation of date might be in some cases quite helpful. And uh, with uh, this we are finished now and I hope to see you also in the next video. Bye! In this video we learn how to fill missing values in time series with uh, backfill, forward fill and also with interpolation. So NA or missing values are typical problems in time series because typically we do not have for all timestamps in our index corresponding values in our features. And in particular when we resample, re-index or merge time series it's uh, very often the case uh, that uh, we create missing values. So for example we do not have official stock trading prices on bank holidays or on weekends. And therefore it's quite important to handle and fill missing values. So let's start with our close data frame. So this is still imported. So we have here the daily closing prices for the six stocks and uh, we have also here the additional information on the weekday and on the quarter. And uh, let's also have a look at the last five rows. And we can see here on the left hand side in our daytime index that uh, we only have the rows or timestamps for business days. So for example here we have uh, the 31st of December. Then we have here kind of a gap. So the next day is uh, the 4th of uh, January. And uh, this is because so the 1st of January is a bank holiday. Then the 2nd and the 3rd are um, uh, Saturday and Sunday. So weekend. And as we imported here our stock data from Yahoo Finance, so by default we only have here timestamps uh, for business days. And now let's assume that uh, here in our data frame we want to have all days, so also the weekends and uh, the bank holidays. And uh, therefore we're creating here a daytime index with uh, the pd.date range method. And uh, the start should be the 31st of December to 9. And uh, the end date here should be the very last day of our stock or closed data frame. So it's here the 6th uh, of February to 19. And we want to have uh, daily frequencies. And uh, then we store here the daytime index in the variable all days. So let's do this and let's have a look here. So here we have a daytime index uh, with all days from the 31st of December 2009 till the 6th uh, February 2019. And now here in our closed data frame instead of having a daytime index that does uh, not uh, contain bank holidays and weekends we now want to have uh, the daytime index with all days. And we can do this by re-indexing the closed uh, data frame and we can pass here within the brackets our new daytime index all days and then actually we override our data frame close. So let's do this. 
And let's have a look here at our new data frame with the new datetime index. So in our new datetime index here, we have now the timestamps uh, January the 1st, uh, the 2nd and the 3rd. And consequently, we have here everywhere missing values. So again, here January the 1st was a bank holiday. Then here we had a Saturday and Sunday. And here we have a Saturday and Sunday and so on. And now our task is to actually handle and fill the missing values. And for the columns day and quarter, we can do this by actually reassigning here the weekday name attribute and the attribute quarter and to override the columns. So let's do this here. And let's uh, reinspect. So here we have now also the weekdays uh, for the new timestamps here and also the quarter. All right, and now it's time to fill the missing values in the stock price data. And it actually always depends on the specific case uh, what uh, makes most sense. So first of all, we use here the fill NA method on our data frame. And uh, let's have a look here inside the brackets. So we've already seen here that we can pass to the values parameter a specific scalar value. So for example, we can say that for all missing values, we want to have the value zero. And in this case, uh, this does not really make sense. And there comes actually the parameter method into play and by default it's set to none. So, and here we can define the method to use for filling holes in re-indexed series. And by passing f fill, we can propagate the last valid observation forward to a uh, next valid, or we can use backfill to use uh, the next valid observation. So let's first of all pass here b fill for backfill. And if we have a look here at our data frame with uh, the missing values and with uh, the backfill method, we take the next value, which is not a missing value and backfill the missing values. So for example, here for our Apple stock, we should have here in these uh, three days with uh, the backfill method, uh, the value 30.57. And here we have 30.57. So we backfill the missing values. And we can also use uh, the forward fill method. And here we actually use the, the last valid value so for example, here the value at uh, the 31st of December and we forward fill the missing values. So now we should have here the value 30.10 and exactly here we have it. And as I said before, it always depends on the case uh, which uh, method uh, makes most sense. And in the case of stock prices, we should actually always use um, the forward fill method. So we use here the very last uh, valid traded price. And this is actually the best indication of uh, the price at the weekend. So here in our stock example, we use uh, forward fill, but uh, there might be other cases where backward fill is uh, more appropriate. And once we are happy here with our method, uh, then we can actually override our data frame and uh, save the changes by passing here true to the in place parameter. And now let's finally reinspect our data frame. So, and here we have successfully replaced all missing values. All right. So as a summary, in this case, we actually used here the re-index method on our closed data frame. And by doing so, we created here missing values. And then we filled and handled the missing values with the fill NA method. But we can also do this directly when re-indexing here the data frame. So also the re-index method provides here for the same tools to handle missing values. So also here we can see the parameter method. And also here we can define that uh, the resulting missing values should be filled with uh, the backfill or the forward fill method. So we can re-index and uh, fill the missing values here in one step, or we can do this in two steps. All right. So now let's have a look at another example. And therefore we import here our temperature data frame. 
So here we have uh, hourly temperatures for Los Angeles and New York. And now let's assume that uh, we want to upsample our data. So we want to change uh, the frequency from hourly to uh, 30 minutes. And we can do this with the resample method. And as new frequency, we can pass here 30 minutes. And uh, we want to take here the mean. So let's do this. And by doing so, we are creating here missing values. So we are creating more timestamps uh, than we actually have here. So here we have uh, data for all hourly uh, timestamps, but for the 30 minute timestamps, we do not have any values. So here we have missing values. And also here in this example, we could decide uh, that uh, we want to use the backfill or the forward fill method. However, in this case, with the continuous uh, temperature or weather data, it could also make sense to interpolate here the values. So for all missing values, we use here the interpolated value of uh, the values uh, that we have before and after the missing value. So here, for example, for 30 minutes after midnight, if we use here interpolated values, then I might expect to get here the mean of 11.7 uh, and 10.7, which is actually 11.2. And we can quite simply do this with the method interpolate. So let's do this here. And we can see here that we successfully have uh, filled all missing values with the interpolated values. And actually the interpolate method provides quite a lot of customization. So here we can, for example, define the method and by default it's uh, linear interpolation, but we can also change this here. And finally, if you want to save our changes, we also have to set the in-place parameter to true. All right. So with this, we are finished now with this video and I hope to see you also in the next one. Bye. Working and handling time zones is considered one of the most unpleasant parts when working with time series data. If you have time series data with daytime information, first of all, you never know which time zones uh, the daytime information is uh, referring to. And uh, therefore, many users choose to work uh, with the coordinated uh, universal time or short uh, UTC, which is uh, currently the international standard. And among others, the United Kingdom, Portugal and Iceland are located in the UTC time zone. So let's have a look at an example and we import pandas. And then we import historical stock prices for General Electric GE. And let's have a look here. So here we have on the left hand side a daytime index and we have actually time increments of uh, 30 minutes. And we have actually open, high, low, close and uh, volume data. So let's have a more detailed look here. And uh, we will examine the first uh, 30 timestamps. So actually here we are starting at uh, 9.30 to 10 a.m. Then we have here the next uh, period from uh, 10 a.m. to 10.30 and so on. And actually the very last uh, timestamp on a day is actually here from 15.30 till 4 p.m. So these are actually the regular trading hours on uh, New York Stock Exchanges. So this daytime information is here actually based on uh, New York time or actually Eastern time. And actually New York time or Eastern time is uh, four hours uh, behind uh, UTC. And we can also get some meter information here. So that's a daytime index and let's have a closer look on uh, the index. And apparently here we cannot see any information on uh, the time zone and we can explicitly get information on the time zone with uh, the index method uh, t set. And obviously here we have uh, no information on the time zone, so we have actually no time zone addressed here to our data frame or to our daytime index. So to say our data frame and our daytime index is here time zone-less. And that's actually our first step here. We have to localize our daytime index. And uh, we can actually do this uh, with uh, the method uh, tz to localize. And by doing so, we actually set or save a time zone on our daytime index. And for example, we can choose here UTC. So we know that here 
our daytime index is based on Eastern or New York time, but uh, first of all, we can, for example, localize it uh, to UTC. And still we have here the day and the time, and uh, then we have here an additional information plus uh, zero hours and minutes. And actually once we have localized our daytime index, then here we can see the difference or the time offset uh, to the UTC time. And if we localize our index uh, to UTC, then of course uh, the time difference or offset is uh, zero. So now let's uh, localize our daytime index to New York time. And we can do this by passing here America, New York. And still, of course, we have here the same daytime information. So the 29th of uh, July and the first timestamp is here 10 o'clock. But here we have uh, the additional information that uh, we are four hours uh, behind the UTC time. So that's uh, New York or Eastern time and we have 10 a.m. And the corresponding UTC time is actually uh, 2 p.m. or 14 p.m. All right. And actually to save our time zone information, uh, we have uh, to overwrite here our data frame. So we have to reassign it here to uh, the uh, variable GE. So here we have on the left hand side uh, the localized uh, daytime index. And in the next video we will see how to convert a localized uh, daytime index to uh, another time zone, so for example to LA. So for example we can get the LA time corresponding to the New York time. So thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. In the last video we have localized our G stock price time series to New York time. So here we can see that New York time is uh, four hours behind the UTC time. And we can also check this here with uh, the index uh, attribute Tset. So this is uh, New York time. And now let's assume that you want to convert uh, these uh, New York times uh, to LA time because we are located in LA and uh, frequently trade in the GE stock or whatever. And actually we can convert to other time zones uh, with uh, the method uh, Tset convert. And it's actually required uh, that we have uh, localized our time series before. So if we haven't localized it, uh, we cannot convert it. So first of all, we can convert our New York time to UTC by passing here UTC. And here we have the corresponding UTC time. So 10 a.m. New York is uh, 2 p.m. Uh, UTC time. And also here we have the difference to UTC time. And of course it's uh, zero. And now let's convert our New York time to Los Angeles time by passing America Los Angeles. So apparently Los Angeles time is uh, three hours behind the New York time and uh, seven hours uh, behind UTC time. So 10 a.m. New York is actually corresponding to 7 a.m. Uh, Los Angeles time. And also here if you want to save our new time zone and actually change our data frame, we have uh, to assign it uh, to a variable. And uh, for example, we can assign here our GE price data frame with uh, Los Angeles time to the variable GELA. So now we have uh, two data frames for our GE data set. So we have it in LA time and also New York time. And now let's assume that uh, we want to concatenate both data frames horizontally. And we can do this uh, with uh, the direct pandas method concat and we pass uh, GE and the uh, GELA data frame. And the interesting question is now, how will uh, the rows and the timestamps uh, be aligned in the concatenated data frame? And let's simply have a look here. So we save uh, the concatenated data frame in the variable comp. And let's have a look at comp. So that's actually the GE data set coming from the New York data frame. And here we have uh, the Los Angeles data frame. And actually it looks like that uh, the rows match here. So we have uh, the same prices and volume data. And here on the left hand side we have actually a daytime index uh, which is uh, localized uh, to UTC time. So Pandas actually recognized that the GE New York uh, data frame was uh, localized in New York time and the Los Angeles data frame in Los Angeles time. 
And it actually aligns both data frames by simply using here the UTC time. And we can also check here our new index. And here we can actually see that it is uh, UTC time. And then we can actually add uh, two new columns uh, to our combined data frame. So one column with uh, New York time and one column with uh, Los Angeles time. And uh, we actually convert here our daytime index uh, with uh, UTC time to the corresponding uh, time zones. So let's have a look here. And here we have on the right hand side two new columns, uh, New York time and Los Angeles time. And finally, you might ask yourself uh, where to get here the time zones uh, that uh, you have to pass here. And uh, therefore we have to import uh, the pi tz module. And we can actually get all available time zones uh, with uh, the attribute all time zones. And we can check here the length. So in total we have 592 time zones. And we can also get uh, the most common time zones with the attribute common time zones. So here we have uh, quite a few time zones. So let's uh, crawl down here. And here we can see uh, US time zones. So US Eastern, US Central and so on. And finally we can also see UTC. That were the videos on time zones. They're probably not uh, one of the most attractive topics, but uh, pretty important nevertheless. So thanks for watching and I'll see you also in the next video. Bye. Hi and welcome to this section on Object Oriented Programming or short OOP. So OOP is one of the most important and powerful tools, uh, not only in Python, but also in other programming languages. And if uh, you know the very basics of Python coding, like uh, data types, for loops, conditional statements, some operators and uh, user defined functions, you uh, shouldn't have any problems to create your own classes. So this is uh, not more complex or more difficult uh, than what you have learned so far. However, in my experience, many students uh, struggle with OOP and uh, find it hard to create uh, their own classes. And uh, the reason probably is uh, that when students uh, start learning OOP, they typically get overwhelmed by theoretical concepts and uh, buzzwords like class, object, instance, methods, attributes, parameters, arguments, so the modularity, abstraction, composition, polymorphism, encapsulation, aggregation, inheritance, and more. And uh, starting with uh, those buzzwords and uh, their definitions is uh, not a good idea and uh, can be daunting and puzzling. So in my view, OOP and uh, creating classes is a very hands-on and practical thing that helps us uh, to solve real-world problems. And also here learning by doing is uh, the best way to uh, learn and master OOP. So once uh, you have created your first classes, you will also understand concepts like inheritance or polymorphism. Like I said, OOP isn't uh, difficult or complex and in uh, Python everything is an object anyway. And uh, you've already used and uh, worked with uh, objects and classes, maybe without even knowing it. So for example, we have strings and uh, one example is dog. And uh, we could say the following here. So a string is a class or also a data type. So people use uh, that uh, interchangeably. And uh, one example or one instance of uh, the class string is dog. So the number of possible examples or instances is unlimited. And uh, we might uh, think of millions or billions of uh, different uh, examples for string. And we could also say that uh, the string class is like an abstract template that uh, we can use to work with any text data. So not only with uh, the string doc, but with any text data. And we could also say that uh, the class string is like a set of rules that uh, define how we can work with any text data. So not only with one example like doc, but uh, with any text data. Now another class or data type is the list like uh, one, two, three. So that's one example or one instance of the class list. And finally, we have also worked uh, with pandas data frames. 
And uh, Pandas data frames actually help us uh, to work with tabular data. And one example or one instance could be uh, the Titanic data set. And also here with uh, Pandas data frames, we could uh, rephrase uh, the sentence here. So the Pandas data frame class is like an abstract template that uh, we can use uh, to create and work with any tabular data. Now there are many available classes in uh, the Python standard library and also in other libraries like NumPy or Pandas or whatever. And uh, the good thing is uh, that uh, Python also allows us to create our own classes to solve our specific problems and uh, perform our customized uh, tasks and workflows. And uh, with our own classes, we can do this in a very efficient manner and uh, it allows us uh, to reuse code. And uh, one example in this course is uh, that uh, we will create and define a class to analyze the financial instruments, like for example, stocks. And actually object orientation is uh, the natural or human way of thinking. So human thinking typically evolves around uh, real world objects, like for example, a bubble maker that uh, consists of uh, two pieces. So here the blue one and the yellow one. And uh, these are characteristics or attributes of uh, the bubble maker. And uh, we can use uh, the bubble maker to make bubbles. And also the bubbles are objects uh, with uh, certain characteristics like uh, the size or the color. Now object orientation is uh, the natural uh, human way of thinking and even the small kids and babies learn and grow with object orientation and also learning OOP in Python is a simple task if it's done in the right way. And um, typically uh, it's best to learn and master OOP with uh, simple and intuitive uh, real world examples. And uh, in this course here, we will start with uh, the final solution so before we define a class, we simply use the class to understand how and why the class can help us to solve our real world problems and workflows. And uh, once we understand the functionality of our class, defining the class and uh, creating the class is uh, simple and straightforward. And uh, finally, we will do this step by step. So we add uh, one functionality after another and uh, see the impact of uh, the additional functionality on our workflows. So this is definitely the best way of doing it. And uh, next, uh, let's have a short look at uh, some classes uh, that we are already familiar with. Pandas data frame is an example of a class and uh, the goal of the class is to handle, manipulate and analyze tabular data in an efficient and uh, user-friendly manner. And that means uh, that the class should be easy and intuitive to use with concise and uh, short code fragments. And uh, the pandas data frame class is a perfect example for this. So with only few lines of code, we can perform very complex workflows on tabular data using quite complex code fragments in the background with uh, dozens or even hundreds of lines of code. Now, before we can work with pandas, we have to import pandas and uh, the convention is SPD. So pandas uh, isn't uh, part of uh, the Python standard library. Now instantiation means uh, creating a concrete or specific object of the class uh, pandas data frame. And uh, here we import uh, the tabular data set Titanic from the CSV file titanic.csv into pandas. And uh, read CSV is an instantiation method that allows us uh, to create a specific data frame object uh, from a CSV file. And uh, then we save uh, the specific object or instance of the class data frame in the variable df. So this is uh, the instantiation and let's uh, run the cell here. And uh, we have saved the object or the instance of the class pandas data frame here in df and uh, that's uh, the Titanic data set uh, with uh, the Titanic passengers. And uh, with uh, the type function, we can also check uh, the data type or the class of our object here. And it's no surprise, it's an instance of the class pandas data frame. Now specific objects have attributes or properties or also characteristics. 
and uh, a pandas data frame has uh, the attribute columns and uh, here we can get uh, the column headers like uh, survived p class and sex and also we can get uh, the shape of uh, the table so the number of rows and the number of columns with uh, shape and here we can see that uh, we have here a tuple and um, uh, the first element is here actually the number of rows 891 and then we have the uh, number of columns 9 and finally methods allow us to perform operations on uh, the specific object so with uh, the info method uh, we can get some more information so to say meta information on our data frame and uh, here we can see for each and every column the number of non-missing values or the data types or the memory usage and another example for a data frames method is uh, sort values so here we can sort um, the data frame by a specific column for instance age and uh, we can decide whether we want to have ascending or descending order so let's uh, simply run the method here or call the method and uh, here we get our data frame sorted by the age in an descending order from high to low so starting with uh, the oldest passenger that is uh, 80 years old and again sort values is an example for a method so the method here performs a specific operation on our object so it uh, sorts our data frame and uh, methods uh, can include parameters like here by and ascending and uh, here we have to pass uh, arguments like uh, that you want to sort um, the data frame by the age so age is uh, the argument for the parameter by and uh, we pass false to ascending to have a descending order and uh, the key message is uh, that uh, the whole functionality uh, work on any tabular data set so not only for the specific titanic data set but also for like the Olympic medals data set or for stock price uh, tabular data set and uh, millions or billions of other examples. So the class pandas data frame contains abstract definitions and rules that uh, should work for any tabular data set. And uh, this is how classes uh, work in general. And in the next lecture, we will have a look at um, the class financial instrument that help us uh, to analyze uh, financial instruments like stocks. So hope to see you there. Bye. In this and the next lectures, we are going to create our own class financial instrument to analyze financial instruments like stocks, currencies, funds, and more. And uh, like I said in the previous lecture, we don't start with uh, the definition of the class. So we start uh, with uh, the final result and just use uh, the class and observe um, the functionalities to understand uh, why and how the class can help us to analyze any financial instrument uh, we can think of. So for the class financial instrument, uh, we require some uh, packages and libraries and we import pandas, numpy, matplotlib, and also yfinance. So we will retrieve uh, data from Yahoo Finance. And uh, then we have here the definition of the class and let's uh, simply skip this. So we run the cell here and let's go on. Now, first of all, we have uh, the instantiation and here we can create uh, one instance of uh, the class financial instrument. So in other words, we can create an object of uh, the data type financial instrument and uh, we can do this uh, with the financial instrument and let's have a look inside here. So this is a class for analyzing financial instruments like stocks and uh, we have here a couple of parameters so we have uh, the ticker parameter and here we have to pass uh, the ticker symbol like apple then we have uh, the start parameter and uh, the end parameter and here we have to define dates at uh, which we want to start and end our analysis and uh, here we want to analyze uh, the stock apple from 2015 till the end of uh, 2019 and uh, when running the cell here we create an instance of the, the class financial instrument instantiation and uh, we save uh, the object in the variable stock and let's simply run here stock 
And here we get the information that uh, this is a financial instrument. So Apple from 215 to 219. And we can also check uh, the data type and it's uh, of uh, the data type financial instrument. Now our financial instrument has a couple of attributes and methods. And if we type here stock dot and then the tab key, we can see a drop down menu here with all attributes and methods. And uh, one attribute is uh, the ticker attribute and it's no surprise that uh, the ticker symbol is here Apple. And um, the start date is um, uh, the 1st of January 2015 and uh, the end date is um, the last day of 2019. And in addition, we have uh, the attribute data. And uh, here we have a data frame. So we have um, a data frame with the prices, daily closing prices and also log returns. So when instantiating our object here, we not only save uh, some properties, like uh, we pass here Apple and the start and end, uh, we also download uh, price data from Yahoo Finance and uh, we calculate um, the log returns. So this is all done when instantiating uh, the object here. And uh, now let's go on and let's have a look at uh, some methods. And uh, first of all, we have uh, the method uh, plot prices and we can have a look inside here with shift tab and uh, there are no parameters. So it uh, simply creates a price chart and now let's call the method. And here we have uh, the price chart for Apple from uh, 215 to 220. And uh, next we can also plot returns. And here we have one parameter kind and uh, the default argument is TS. So actually plot returns, the plots log returns either as time series TS or histogram. So first of all, let's uh, plot the time series. And uh, here we have uh, the daily log returns. And of course it's actually oscillating around uh, zero. And also we can create a histogram uh, to have a look at uh, the frequency of returns. And um, it's no surprise that um, the highest frequency is around uh, zero but uh, we have uh, some negative outliers here and also some very positive returns. So this was uh, the first part and uh, looking forward to seeing you also in part two. All right, let's continue and let's have a look at some more methods that allow us to further analyze Apple and also other stocks. And uh, first of all, we can calculate uh, the mean return. So the mean of uh, daily log returns and here we have 0 0.00077 and actually uh, the same we can also do with uh, the following code. So again, we have uh, the attribute data where we have uh, the data frame with uh, daily prices and daily rock returns. And uh, now we can select um, the column log returns and calculate the mean. So of course we get here the very same result. And again, let's have a look here inside um, the method the mean return. So we have uh, one parameter frequency and by default uh, we calculate um, the mean daily return, but uh, we can also pass a specific frequency like weekly or monthly. So let's pass here uh, W for weekly. And by doing so we calculate um, uh, weekly mean returns. So 0.0037. Next, we can also calculate uh, the risk of the stock and actually uh, calculate uh, the standard deviation of returns. And here we get a standard deviation of daily returns of 1.5%. And also here we can uh, select a frequency. So whether the risk should be based on uh, daily returns or weekly returns or monthly returns. And uh, the standard deviation of uh, weekly returns is 0 0.03. And finally, we have uh, the method annualized performance. And uh, we don't have any parameters here. And uh, this method calculates uh, the annualized uh, return and risk. So we have here an annualized return of 19.5% and an annualized risk of 24.9%. 
So this was a short analysis of uh, the Apple stock. So with only a few lines of code, we actually visualized um, uh, the prices and also the returns and we calculated the returns and risk and so on. And uh, now we can also change um, the ticker and analyze another stock, for instance, uh, GE, General Electric. And uh, we can uh, change uh, the ticker with uh, the method set ticker. So here we can set a new ticker and we pass GE. And by doing so, as you can see here, we download uh, the GE data from Yahoo Finance. And uh, now the ticker symbol is uh, GE and uh, we can also plot the prices and uh, here the graph looks a bit uh, different. So there are some problems uh, with the GE stock in uh, the recent past. And also we can calculate the annualized performance and it's no surprise uh, that uh, we have a negative return of uh, minus 15.7% and a quite high risk of 29.8%. Uh, so also switching from one instrument to another is uh, pretty simple. And um, this was uh, the financial instrument class. And of course, the way how it works uh, does not come out of nowhere. So we have to define uh, attributes and methods in the class itself. And uh, that's exactly what uh, we are going to do in the next lecture. So I hope to see you there. Bye. All right, in this and the next lectures, we will define and build our financial instrument class step by step. And uh, we start defining a class uh, with uh, the keyword class. So it's turning green and uh, this is an indication that uh, this is a keyword and uh, followed by our desired class name like financial instrument. And actually it can be any name. However, there are some rules and uh, some conventions. So for example, white spaces are not allowed and in cases where we have two or many words in the class name, uh, we shouldn't use a separator like underscore. So we shouldn't use uh, that and that's uh, the convention here. And also typically we use a title case and that means uh, that each word uh, starts uh, with an uppercase letter. So financial starts uh, with an uppercase F and uh, instrument uh, with an uppercase I. So that's uh, the convention. But uh, theoretically, you can do that in a different way and use uh, lowercase letters here. Finally, let's uh, add uh, some empty brackets and uh, a colon and then press uh, the enter key. And uh, similar to user defined functions, Python automatically creates an indent here. And then we can start uh, defining attributes and uh, methods for our class. And now the most uh, simple class is uh, just uh, do nothing. And uh, we can define do nothing with uh, the pass keyword. So this is a keyword. And uh, now let's uh, run the cell here. And uh, by doing so, we have actually created and defined our very first class financial instrument. And then we can instantiate our very first uh, financial instrument object. And uh, for example, we can use uh, the variable name stock. And uh, we can instantiate with the financial instruments. And let's simply run the cell here. And let's uh, print stock. And here we can see that uh, this is an instance of a financial instrument. So we have uh, successfully created an instance. But of course, we have absolutely no functionalities here for our financial instrument class. So we have uh, no attributes and also no methods, but um, this is uh, the very first step here. And now let's uh, copy here the definition and let's uh, remove pass. And uh, typically when creating an instance of a class, at least we want to assign some very first uh, specific properties to our specific object. So properties uh, that are specific to this object for example, the ticker symbol of the instrument like Apple or the specific time period for which we want to further analyze the instrument. And uh, we can do this uh, with uh, the special method in it. And uh, we can define a method with uh, the dev keyword like a user defined function. And then we have a double underscore in it, double underscore. 
And uh, in short, uh, this method is also called dunder init, so double underscore init. And actually, dunder methods are also called special methods, and uh, we will cover two or three of them in this course. And uh, the special method the dunder init is a so-called initializer. So it initializes some very first properties of our object once uh, the object has been created. And whenever we define user-defined functions or methods, we can add uh, some parameters here within the parentheses. And actually methods are typically called on uh, the specific object itself. And uh, therefore the very first parameter is always uh, the self parameter. And uh, many students uh, struggle with self, so they ask uh, what is self? Now when defining methods uh, that can be called on specific objects, we have to start uh, with uh, the first parameter self. That's uh, simply the rule and uh, that's how it works. And I guess uh, this is getting more clear in uh, this and uh, also the next uh, videos. So immediately after the instantiation, we call uh, the initializer method uh, init on uh, the object itself. And actually we want to have uh, the following additional parameters. So we are interested in the ticker symbol in uh, the start date and also in the end date. So these are the four parameters of our special method here. And let's uh, continue with a colon. And uh, then we can define uh, what will happen when uh, we actually initialize our object. And uh, we have seen before that a financial instrument object should at least have uh, some attributes. So stock.ticker should uh, return the ticker symbol and uh, stock.start and uh, stock.end uh, should return start date and end date. Now in our examples here we use uh, the variable name stock, but of course uh, this is flexible and uh, therefore we have to use the self. So the object the name itself and uh, the first attribute uh, should be ticker and um, uh, the value of uh, the attribute should be the value that we pass here to the parameter ticker. Then uh, second, uh, we have uh, the attribute start. And it should be the value that we pass here to the initializer. And finally, we have uh, the uh, attribute end. And with so this, we have successfully defined uh, some initial properties. And uh, now let's uh, define the class. And again, let's create a first instance. And if we go here inside the parentheses, then we can see that uh, we have uh, three arguments that we have to pass to uh, the parameters ticker, start, and end. And uh, for example, we can use here apple, then a start date like uh, 2015, January the 1st, and an end date, so 219, and uh, the very last day. So whenever we have an initializer method uh, with uh, some parameters, then uh, we have to pass here values uh, to the parameters, otherwise we cannot uh, instantiate our object. So let's run the cell here and uh, we have stock here. And then we can also access uh, the attributes uh, ticker, start and end. So let's press here dot and let's uh, press uh, the tab key as well. And here we have a drop down menu with uh, the available attributes, ticker for instance, and we get apple. And also we have end and start. And maybe already here it's getting more clear what uh, self actually is. So to say it's a placeholder for the variable name that we use. So when using the variable name stock, we have uh, the attribute stock.ticker. And uh, here in the class, uh, we define this in a more general way, self.ticker, self.start and so on. So with uh, the special method in it, uh, we initialized uh, some first properties, ticker, end, and start. And uh, still, we do not have uh, any functionality here. 
for our class, but uh, this will change in the next lecture. So hope to see you there. Bye. In this lecture, we are going to create our very first method, uh, the getData method. And uh, getData should retrieve stock price data for our instrument uh, for the specified time period from uh, the start till the end date from Yahoo Finance. So we will use uh, the Y Finance library here. And uh, first of all, let's remember how we can retrieve data from Y Finance. So we can do this uh, with uh, the download method. And uh, essentially we have here three parameters, uh, tickers, start and end. And uh, here we can pass uh, Apple from 2.15 till 2.19. And if we run the cell here, then we get open, high, low, close, adjusted, uh, close, and also volume data. And uh, very often it is uh, the case uh, that we are only interested in uh, daily close prices and therefore we can uh, select here the column close. And if you only select uh, one column, then uh, by default uh, we get a panda series. And uh, we can convert a panda series to a data frame with one column with uh, the method two frame. So this is uh, not a problem at all. Now this is a data frame with uh, raw data for Apple. And uh, we can also store the data frame in a variable, like for instance, raw. And it definitely makes sense uh, to rename here the column label from uh, close to price. So this is uh, the stock price. And uh, we set in place to true to actually overwrite uh, uh, the object uh, that is stored in raw. And let's have a look again. So now here we have uh, the column label price. And actually this is uh, the functionality that uh, we want to add to our class as uh, the method uh, getData. So let's uh, define the method with uh, the dev keyword and we use uh, the method name getData uh, and we don't have uh, parameters here. And actually it's pretty simple to adopt uh, the code here above to a method. So first of all, let's uh, copy and paste uh, this line here. So here we download uh, prices for Apple and to save it in the variable raw. And then we change the column label. And uh, there are only minor things uh, that we have to adjust here. So instead of having Apple, we want to pass uh, self.ticker to download. And instead of having here the start date, we uh, have self.start. And uh, finally, we have self.end. So we use uh, the attributes ticker start and end to actually download uh, price data for the ticker from start till the end date. And um, that's actually all we need to do here. So let's define again uh, the class financial instrument. And let's uh, call it again. So let's copy here. And uh, still we have uh, the uh, attributes available. And now we can also get uh, the data with the method getData. So here we can see now we have the method getData and uh, we can simply call the method. And uh, now we get here a very typical error. So the type error getData takes zero positional arguments, but one was given. So this is a very typical error for beginners. And uh, the reason is uh, that we actually called the method getData on uh, the object stock itself. And uh, we actually forgot here the parameter self. So whenever we uh, define a method that can be called on uh, a specific object itself, then at least uh, we have to add one parameter. It's uh, the self parameter. So let's uh, redefine here our class and uh, then it should work. And as you can see, we don't get an output here, but uh, we can change uh, this 
with the return raw. And let's have a look again. And uh, here we have our raw data with uh, the price data. But it actually makes more sense to store the data frame here as an attribute. So let's uh, create uh, the new attribute uh, self.data. And uh, we pass um, our data frame raw. And then we can actually access um, the data frame with uh, the attribute data. And here we have. Now there's one last uh, thing that I want to show you. And it would be great if actually our class automatically downloads the data at instantiation. And uh, now we can do uh, the following actually. We can say that we want to call the method getData when uh, we instantiate an object and uh, therefore we can add uh, self.getData to the init method. So this is uh, pretty simple and this works self.getData. So whenever an object is instantiated then initially we create uh, the attributes ticker, start and end and uh, we retrieve uh, the price data from Yahoo Finance. So let's uh, rerun here the definition. Already here you can see that when we instantiated the object stock, then automatically uh, the data gets downloaded. And um, now we have available the attribute data. And uh, here we have uh, the price data. So this is pretty cool and uh, pretty powerful. Thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next lecture. Bye. In the last lecture we have seen that we can call a method in another method. That's totally fine. So we call the method getData whenever the special method dunder init is called. So directly after the new object is instantiated. And now let's have another example. And uh, first of all, let's recall that uh, getData creates a new attribute self.data. And of course we can also access um, the attribute data here. So that's uh, the data frame with um, the prices, the daily close prices. And uh, now the plan is to add another column to uh, self.data. So a log returns with uh, the daily log returns. And uh, we can do that by introducing another method, the log returns method. And again, we can do this uh, with the dev keyword. And uh, we shouldn't forget self, so we don't have any parameter, but at least we, we shouldn't forget self because we can call the method log returns on uh, the specific object itself. And uh, what log return does, it actually adds another column log returns to uh, self.data. So this is self.data with one column and we add another column log returns and um, the calculation is pretty simple and it uh, should already be familiar. So we divide um, the price by the shifted price. So we have self data dot price divided by self data dot price dot shift by one leg. Now let's again redefine our class financial instrument and let's instantiate this apple and uh, this period here. And let's have a look at data. So we have only the price, but now if we call the method log returns, then we add another column with the daily log returns. And also here it might be more convenient to add uh, the log returns automatically when we instantiate the object. So we are fully flexible here and uh, we can add this to uh, the uh, init method to the special method in it. And we can say that uh, please run the method log returns here. So let's again redefine our class and uh, let's instantiate uh, the object stock. And uh, let's have a look at uh, the data attribute. And already here we have um, the log returns. So we have the price and also the log returns automatically when we instantiate a financial instrument object. 
And with this, uh, there's actually no need to, to call the method log returns explicitly. So it's already called here when uh, our object is instantiated. That's uh, pretty smart, actually. Thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next lecture. Bye. We are coming now to another special method, uh, double underscore wrapper. And uh, wrapper stands for representation. And uh, with uh, this special method, we can determine how an instance of a class is uh, represented when displayed or printed. Uh, this sounds complicated, but let me give you an idea why this can be helpful for users. So we still have um, uh, the object stock, and uh, that's actually uh, the instrument apple from 2.15 till 2.19. And if we simply display the object, then we get a rather technical representation. So stock is an instance of uh, the class financial instrument. And uh, we can actually also see here the memory position of uh, the object. And um, that's uh, not really helpful. And also if we print uh, the object uh, with the print, then we get more or less uh, the very same representation so for a user that is uh, not really helpful and not uh, really intuitive and it would be better if uh, we could see at a glance uh, that it's Apple and maybe also the time period and uh, that's exactly what we can do with uh, the special method uh, wrapper. So let's add here def double underscore wrapper and again double underscore and uh, then we have uh, one parameter, it's uh, the self parameter, so we shouldn't forget that. And then we can say that if uh, we display or print uh, the object, then Python should return the following string. So we are actually uh, pretty flexible and free here. And uh, maybe the following makes sense. So we have here a financial instrument. And uh, this instrument is determined uh, by the ticker. And uh, let's have a placeholder here, curly brackets. Then we have uh, the start date and another placeholder. And finally, we have uh, the end date. And uh, this is uh, the string representation uh, for any object of the type financial instrument. And uh, we have uh, three placeholders and uh, let's uh, create here a string replacement with uh, format. And uh, here in the first position, uh, we want to replace uh, this with uh, the ticker symbol that is saved in self.ticker. Then uh, we have uh, self.start. And finally, we have self.end. So this should work and uh, let's uh, redefine our class and uh, let's create an instance. So Apple from 2.15 till 2.18 and let's uh, display the object. And here we can see immediately that uh, this is a financial instrument and it's uh, Apple from 2.15 till 2.19. And uh, the same we can also see with the print. So to sum up, creating customized uh, string representations isn't required and it doesn't uh, change or improve functionality of our class. However, it improves uh, user experience as uh, users can see at a first glance what is inside uh, the object. So thanks for watching and see you also in the next lecture. Bye. Sometimes a graph tells more than many numbers and uh, that is in particular true in finance. So it's always a good idea and also beneficial to create price charts and also to visualize the financial returns. And uh, still we have uh, the object stock and uh, we can access um, uh, the draw data, so prices and returns with uh, the attribute data. And here we get a data frame with uh, prices and log returns. And uh, now we could actually create a price chart by selecting uh, the column price and the use plot to create a line plot. So here we have uh, the price chart for Apple from 2.15 till 2.20. And uh, of course we can also select log returns and uh, create a line chart. And actually uh, here we are plotting uh, the returns time series over time.
and it's no surprise that uh, this is oscillating around a return of zero. So to say, here we can see volatility clusters. For example, here in uh, 219, we have more volatility than, for example, here. And uh, there's also another option to plot returns. And it uh, might be also informative and helpful to have uh, the frequency distribution. So to say a histogram, and uh, we can do this uh, with hist and uh, we have to define uh, the number of bins, for example, 100. So this is uh, the histogram or the frequency distribution. And uh, also here we can see that uh, the highest frequency is around uh, a return of 0%. And actually many theories and uh, formulas in finance uh, assume that financial returns are normally distributed. And uh, with a histogram, we can see at a first glance whether this is uh, true or not. At least uh, the histogram is the first indicator whether returns are normally distributed or not. And of course, uh, later on, we can also perform an hypothesis test to test uh, for the normality. All right, now it's pretty simple and straightforward to add uh, the plotting functionality here to our class. And uh, we can add two more methods, uh, one method uh, to create a price chart and it's in the method plot prices. So we have def plot prices. And again, we shouldn't forget self. And uh, that's uh, the only parameter here. And uh, what uh, plot prices actually does, so it uh, selects uh, the attribute data and then selects uh, the price column and creates a line plot. And also we uh, define that uh, the fixed size should be 12, 8. And uh, we also add a title here. So it's a price chart. And uh, here we have um, the placeholder for the uh, ticker symbol. And uh, we have a font size of 15. Last but not least, uh, we define the method plot returns to uh, plot uh, the uh, financial returns. And again, we start with self. And uh, then we have here one additional parameter. It's uh, the kind parameter. So either we plot uh, the time series, so the line plot here, or we plot uh, the histogram. So we can either pass here TS for time series or hist for histogram. And uh, we have here an if else statement. So if kind is uh, TS, then we select block returns and uh, create a line plot with fixed size 12, 8. And also we add a title, so returns for the respective ticker. So self.ticker and we have a font size of 15 for the title. And elif, if uh, the kind is histogram, then again, we uh, select uh, log returns and create a histogram with uh, fixed size 12, 8. And as a rule of thumb, so the number of bins uh, should be around about equal to the square root of uh, the number of observations. So, and uh, we convert this here into an integer. So bins must be an integer. So we have np.square root and then the length of self.data, so the number of rows or the number of timestamps. And also here, finally, we add a title, so frequency of returns of uh, the ticker symbol self.ticker. So let's uh, redefine our class here and let's instantiate again Apple. And then we can simply plot prices uh, with the plot prices. And uh, here we have uh, the line chart and the title price chart for Apple. And finally, we can also plot the returns. And uh, the default uh, argument for kind is the time series. So here we get the time series. And if we pass uh, hist uh, to the kind parameter, then we get uh, the histogram. Thanks for watching and see you also in the next lecture. Bye. Encapsulation is a fundamental concept in object-oriented programming, not only in Python, but also in other programming languages. And it's uh, not just a fancy word. So encapsulation solves a real and severe problem in OOP. And I think it's uh, best to just demonstrate uh, the problem first. So still we have uh, the object uh, stock and it's uh, the uh, Apple stock. And then of course we can create a price chart so the Apple stock performed uh, pretty well in the most recent years. 
from uh, lesser than 30 to over 70. And actually Python does not prevent us to access uh, attributes. So we can access uh, the ticker attribute and uh, we get Apple. And also changing and overriding attributes is not prohibited in Python. So we can assign a new ticker symbol like GE for General Electric. And this works. So ticker is now GE. However, now if we plot the uh, prices, then uh, still we have uh, the price chart for Apple. So we only changed uh, the attribute ticker, but we didn't change um, uh, the data and the data frame with uh, the prices and the log returns. And this is a severe problem in object-oriented programming. So we can change an attribute uh, without uh, changing the rest. But uh, there's a solution for it. And uh, we can hide and protect an attribute and uh, create a so-called protected attribute. And uh, we can do this by prefixing uh, the name of uh, the attribute with a single underscore. So let's uh, create uh, the protected attribute uh, single un underscore ticker. And uh, we have to do this everywhere in our code. So we have it here. Then also here. And here. And finally here. So let's uh, redefine our class and uh, let's create uh, the instance stock. And uh, now if we try to access uh, the attribute ticker, then of course uh, we don't have uh, the attribute ticker. And also if we try to get uh, the drop down menu here with uh, the tab key, then we can neither see the attribute ticker nor the protected uh, attribute underscore ticker. So the protected attribute underscore ticker is uh, hidden and not uh, visible. And indeed we can say that it is uh, partly hidden and protected from being accessed and overwritten. But in Python there's no 100% protection and uh, we will see this now. So we can still access and also override uh, underscore ticker if we simply code here stock dot underscore ticker, so that's uh, possible. However, the prefix underscore is a clear warning for developers and also for users. So please uh, be careful about uh, this attribute and it might not be a good idea to just uh, change it. Now we have a protected attribute, but uh, still we want to have the option to change uh, the ticker symbol and analyze another instrument without the need to create a new instance. And actually encapsulation in a broader sense has two steps. So first hiding some attributes uh, by creating protected attributes uh, with a prefix underscore. And second, uh, creating an official method that allows us to set new values for the protected attribute. And that's exactly what uh, we are going to do in the next lecture. So hope to see you there, bye. All right, we have created uh, the protected attribute underscore dot uh, ticker, but still we want to have uh, the option to change uh, the ticker symbol. And uh, we can do this uh, with a so-called set method. So it can be any name, but typically we use method names like set ticker for methods uh, that set new values uh, to protected properties. So let's uh, create here a new method def set ticker. And again, as a first the parameter, we have self. And uh, then let's uh, create a second parameter. So if we do not pass any new ticker symbol, then we just have none as uh, the default parameter. So if we call the method set ticker, and if we do not pass a new ticker symbol, then uh, we simply use uh, the old one that is already stored. So let's uh, create an if statement. So if a ticker is not none, so if it's none, we actually do not uh, change anything. But if it's not none, then in this case, we want to change uh, the protected attribute self.ticker and assign uh, the new value. And uh, these lines of code allow us uh, to actually override the ticker but uh, this isn't sufficient actually. 
So once uh, we uh, change uh, the ticker and uh, set a new ticker, then immediately we want to uh, download and get uh, price data for the new ticker symbol. And also we want to uh, calculate the log returns. So we want to uh, actually retrieve uh, the full new data and uh, therefore the following has to be done. So once we change the ticker, then again we have to run the method uh, get data. And also we have to run the method uh, log returns. So let's uh, run the cell here and let's uh, redefine our class and uh, let's uh, create an instance again apple from 215 till 219 and uh, we can uh, plot the prices. So this is uh, the great performance of apple and uh, now let's change uh, the ticker symbol to GE general electric and automatically you can see here that uh, we download uh, the price data from uh, Yahoo Finance for GE and uh, we calculate log returns. So we can uh, plot the prices for GE. And here we can see that uh, GE most recently had uh, some problems. So this uh, performance isn't great. So as you can see, changing uh, private attributes isn't uh, difficult uh, with a set method, but uh, we have to be careful here. And uh, typically we have to change uh, some other things and uh, run some other methods like get data and log returns. So thanks for watching and see you also in the next lecture. Bye. In this lecture we will add some more methods that allow us to calculate some more performance metrics. And in finance and investments, uh, return and risk are probably the most important performance metrics. So first of all, we have here the method uh, mean return that uh, calculates uh, the mean return or the average return over time. And again, we start with uh, the dev keyword and uh, the name of uh, the method is mean return. And uh, as always, uh, the first parameter is uh, the self parameter. So we can use the mean return on a specific object itself. Then I added here the flexibility to change uh, the frequency. So depending on the purpose, sometimes it's more meaningful to calculate uh, risk and return based on daily price data. And sometimes it's uh, more meaningful to base the risk and return on weekly or even monthly prices. And therefore we have here the parameter frequency and uh, by default it's set to none. So by default uh, we calculate uh, mean returns based on daily data. Now we have here an if else statement and if uh, the frequency is none, so if we don't pass uh, any frequency, then uh, the method uh, returns uh, the mean log return based on daily log returns. And else if uh, we pass uh, a frequency like weekly, then first of all mean return calculates uh, resampled prices. So it takes uh, the price column in the self.data and uh, uses uh, the resample method and uh, uses uh, the past frequency. And then it uh, takes uh, the last price so for example, the last price of uh, the week or the last price of uh, the month. And uh, then in the next step, uh, it calculates uh, the resampled returns. So the resampled log returns with np.log and we use here uh, the resampled prices. And then it uh, returns uh, the resampled uh, mean returns. So this is uh, the method mean return. And uh, very similar to this is uh, the method uh, standard deviation of returns. So typically uh, the standard deviation of returns is uh, a metric for the risk of uh, the instrument. And also here we have um, the choice to change uh, the frequency. So if we do not pass a frequency, then uh, the risk is uh, calculated based on daily data. And if we pass a frequency, then once again, we resample the prices first of all, and uh, then we calculate uh, the risk based on a resampled prices. So in the first step, we calculate uh, the log returns based on resampled prices, and then we take uh, the standard deviation, and uh, then the method returns the standard deviation of uh, resampled returns. So this is uh, pretty simple and straightforward. 
And finally, we also have um, annualized the performance. And uh, this method actually returns uh, the annualized return and uh, the annualized risk based on daily data. So first of all, let's have a look at uh, the first line. And uh, here we calculate um, uh, the daily mean return annualized. So we uh, select uh, the log returns column and take the mean and uh, multiply the mean with uh, 252. So 252 trading days in a year. And then we round uh, the mean return to uh, three decimals. And uh, the same we do also for the risk. So we calculate uh, the standard deviation of log returns and uh, multiply it with uh, the square root of 252. So this is how we annualize uh, return and risk. And uh, then actually annualized performance, so the method prints the following statement. So the return is uh, the mean return and uh, the risk is uh, the risk. All right, let's run the cell and let's uh, define the class. And let's uh, create a new instance. And then we can calculate the mean return. And by default, it's uh, the mean return based on daily data but uh, we can also select the mean return based on monthly data, so the monthly return. And it's no surprise uh, that the monthly return is higher. So we have here 1.6% per month. And uh, the very same we can also do for the standard deviation of returns, the risk. So by default, uh, we calculate uh, the standard deviation based on daily data, and uh, we have here a risk of 1.5%. But of course, we can also change to weekly, monthly, or even yearly or annual. And uh, we get here a monthly standard deviation of 7.5%. And as I said, we can also change uh, mean return and uh, standard deviation to weekly or also to annual with Y, or I think even A works. And uh, this is true. And finally, we can calculate uh, the annualized performance and uh, we get here a return of 19.5% and a risk of 24.9%. Uh, so these are a few examples of performance metrics. And of course, uh, there are many more. So feel free to add uh, some more methods uh, that calculate another or additional performance metrics. Thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next lecture. Bye. All right, we have now a pretty nice financial instruments class that helps us uh, to retrieve price data from the web and uh, to calculate log returns and uh, visualize the prices and returns and also to calculate uh, the mean return, the standard deviation of returns and also annualize the return and risk. And uh, sometimes it is uh, desirable to split one larger class into several smaller classes to have a more modular structure. And also here in our example, it could make sense uh, to have a financial instruments base class with uh, the very basics like uh, retrieving the data, calculating log returns and uh, visualizing prices and returns. So that's uh, the very basics and the starting point for many other workflows like uh, calculating risk and return or calculating alpha and beta for the stock or whatever. So let's uh, create two classes here, one base class uh, with uh, the uh, basic functionalities like uh, getting the data. So we have here financial instrument base class, getting the data, calculating log returns and uh, plotting prices and returns and uh, setting the ticker. So let's uh, define the base class here. And then we have another class, uh, risk and uh, return. And uh, the major functionality is here below. So here we have uh, the method uh, mean return, then the standard uh, deviation of returns and annualized performance. But unfortunately, we have to copy and paste all other methods as uh, they are the prerequisite uh, to calculate risk and returns. So we have to rewrite major parts of uh, the code twice. So here we have all methods uh, that we also have in our base class, like getting the data, log returns, and uh, so on. So theoretically, we could uh, delete your plot prices or plot returns, but at least uh, we require get data and log returns. So this is not really efficient, but it works. And uh, let's uh, define here risk return. 
And let's uh, create an instance, for example, Apple. And uh, we save for the object in stock. And uh, then we can uh, call one of uh, the major methods like annualized performance. So this works, but it's uh, not really great. And uh, here comes uh, the concept of inheritance into play. So inheritance allows us uh, to create a class that inherits uh, the functionality from another class. And uh, the only thing that uh, we have to do, we have to pass uh, the parent class. So now example here, the financial instrument uh, base class is uh, the parent and uh, risk and return is uh, the child class. And uh, we have to pass um, the parent class to the child, child class. So we pass here financial instrument base class. And uh, with this, uh, the child class risk return inherits all properties and all methods from the parent class. So we can actually delete all methods that uh, we also have here in uh, the parent class. So essentially, we can delete all methods except mean return and the standard deviation of returns and annualized performance. So let's redefine the class uh, risk return that inherits uh, the class financial instrument base. And uh, let's again create an instance. And again, you can see here that uh, we download data so the class uh, risk return still uses uh, the method of uh, the parent class, so getting the data. And of course, now we can also calculate uh, the annualized performance. And uh, if we have a look at uh, the available methods and attributes, then we can see that uh, we have all methods and attributes available that are either in our child class or in our parent class. So we can get uh, the data, the raw data, with the uh, prices and log returns. And also we can get, uh, for example, the prices. Uh, we can plot the prices, so this is no problem. And uh, also we can change uh, the ticker by setting a new ticker like uh, GE. And then we can update here our plot. And uh, this works pretty well. Now there's one drawback and uh, let's uh, just uh, display or print our object uh, stock. And here we get uh, the string representation of uh, the parent class, so financial instrument. And uh, that's not really true. So our object stock is actually an instance of the class uh, risk return. And uh, the problem is that uh, risk return also inherits uh, the uh, Dunder representation uh, method. And uh, this doesn't really make sense. And uh, therefore we should uh, redefine this in our child class. So we define here our own string representation and uh, this could be instead of financial instrument, this could be a risk return. So let's uh, redefine here risk return and let's again create an instance. And again, we can calculate the annualized performance and many more things. And finally, let's have a look at uh, the string representation and now here we get uh, the representation that this is an instance of uh, risk return for Apple. So what happened actually is that uh, the child's uh, representation method overrides uh, the inheritance of uh, the parent's representation method. And uh, the simple rule is, so if uh, the child class has a method with uh, the very same name as uh, the parent class. So here we have uh, the very same uh, method, Dunder wrapper. 
Then in this case, uh, the child's method overrides uh, the inheritance of uh, the parent's method. And uh, actually, uh, the child's uh, method prevails. So here. So as a final remark, sometimes uh, there are good reasons to use inheritance. And in particular in cases where we have a base class that introduces some basic workflows uh, that are required for many other workflows. And then we can inherit uh, this base class uh, to other more specialized classes like uh, the risk return class or the alpha beta class or whatever. And uh, this can, for example, improve uh, readability and user experience as uh, users directly see what they get when using specialized classes like risk return or alpha beta. And uh, there's uh, one last uh, thing that I want to highlight here. So if you have some first experience uh, with OOP, you might have asked yourself why we used uh, the empty brackets here when uh, defining the financial instruments class or the financial instruments base class. So as long as uh, the class uh, does not inherit from other classes, we actually don't need the brackets, so we can just uh, delete some of them and uh, define the class, so that's uh, perfectly fine. But in my view, it's a more general approach uh, to always uh, use uh, the brackets, even if uh, they are just empty. And in all cases uh, where we have empty brackets, we simply don't inherit from other classes. All right, this was a short introduction to inheritance. And I hope uh, that uh, this was helpful. Thanks for watching and see you also in the next lecture. Bye. All right, this lecture is all about inheritance and uh, the super function. So if you Google the super function, you may find many explanations and examples that are highly technical. So this uh, topic seems to be a complex one, but in reality, it isn't that complex. And it's actually best to start with a real world problem that we can solve uh, with uh, the super function. And uh, still we have here our parent class or base class financial instrument base. And uh, a parent class is also called the super class. And uh, then, so let's uh, run the cell here. And uh, then we have uh, the child class uh, risk return, which is also called uh, the subclass. And uh, we've already learned that uh, the subclass inherits from the superclass. So we pass here the uh, superclass financial instrument base. And uh, now we have here two methods, uh, the mean return method and uh, the standard deviation of returns method. And uh, we can set a frequency here in uh, both methods to determine whether mean returns and also the standard deviation of returns should be based on daily data, weekly data, monthly data, or whatsoever. And uh, now let's assume that we want to set uh, the frequency already when instantiating a risk return object. So when creating an object, we want to decide whether mean returns and the standard deviation of returns should be based on weekly data, monthly data, or whatsoever. Then in this case, we need to create and call a dunder init method also here for the risk return class and also create a new attribute self.frequency. So let's uh, do this here. So we define the dunder init method. And then let's copy and paste uh, the parameters of uh, the parents uh, dunder init method. So ticker start and end. And also we create a new parameter or argument. It's uh, the frequency argument. And if we do not pass anything here, so by default it's none. And then we create an attribute. So the self dot frequency attribute. Then next we have to slightly change a couple of things. So now we have uh, the frequency already stored in an attribute. So we don't have to pass it here in the methods. And if self dot frequency and also here self. And uh, the same also here for the standard deviation of returns. And also here. So this is uh, the naive approach and let's have a look if it works. 
So we've already defined uh, the parent class and let's also define uh, the subclass. And uh, let's create an instance, risk return, and uh, we pass Apple, then the start date, the end date, and in addition to that, also the frequency, a weekly frequency. And uh, already here we can see that obviously we haven't downloaded uh, the data from Yahoo Finance, but uh, obviously we can access uh, the frequency attribute. And now let's try to do the same for the protected attribute underscore ticker. And here it says uh, that the object has uh, no attribute underscore ticker. And uh, let's also try to access uh, the data. And also here the risk return object has no attribute data. And it seems uh, that uh, we haven't initialized the properties that uh, we actually want to initialize here in our parent uh, class. And obviously we haven't set uh, the underscore ticker attribute. And also we haven't uh, run or called the get data method. And uh, the problem here is that uh, we haven't called uh, the dunder init method of our super class. So to say this was overridden by the dunder init method of our uh, subclass. But uh, there's actually a solution for it. And uh, we can use uh, the super function. And uh, the super function gives us access uh, to methods in the super class. So in the financial instrument base class from the subclass here. So with uh, the super function, we create a temporary object of uh, the super class. And then we simply have to call the dunder init method. And uh, we pass here the arguments. So we have ticker, start and end. And uh, this should work, so this is all. Now let's redefine here our subclass uh, risk return. And uh, let's again instantiate an object. And already here we can see that we have successfully downloaded uh, data from Yahoo Finance. So we can access uh, the frequency, which is weekly. And we can also access uh, the ticker attribute. And it's Apple. And we can also have a look at uh, the data frame with price and log returns. And then we can also plot prices and uh, calculate the mean return. But now here we don't have any choice. So the setting is uh, weekly. And finally, we can also calculate uh, the annualized performance. So as a summary, whenever we have a superclass and uh, a subclass that inherits from the superclass, and uh, whenever we want to initialize uh, some properties in the subclass, then we have to use uh, the dunder init method. And uh, actually the dunder init method overrides uh, the dunder init method of the parent class. However, we can call the dunder init method of uh, the superclass with uh, the function super. And uh, this is all you need to know about the super function. Thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next lecture. Bye. We are coming now to another important topic, doc strings. And uh, for developers, creating doc strings is typically an unpleasant and time-consuming task that uh, doesn't improve uh, the functionality of uh, the class and its methods. But it's uh, really helpful for users and also co-developers to understand uh, what uh, they're actually doing. And uh, doc strings are like a written manual that guides users uh, through the purpose and the functionalities of classes and methods. And uh, we as uh, developers are free to write whatever we want, but it should be concise and understandable for external users. So let's have an example. And uh, we have our financial instrument class with all methods. So also the uh, return and uh, risk methods. And let's uh, define the class here. And now if we create an instance with financial instruments, then we can go here inside with shift tab and uh, we can see that uh, there's no doc string available. So an uninformed user might not really know and understand uh, what the financial instrument is doing. So let's uh, create stock. And also if we call methods, then we can go here inside and have a look with, with shift tab. And also here we have uh, no doc string. 
And uh, we can only see here in the signature that um, the method has one parameter and uh, the uh, default uh, argument is TS. And also here an uninformed user might not really know and understand uh, what's uh, going on here and uh, what uh, the options are for the parameter kind. So it's uh, definitely a good idea to add here some doc strings and let's add a doc string to the method plot returns. So let's go here above and um, let's change uh, the mode from code to markdown to actually add a text here. And actually we have to create an indent here. And now we can start with our doc string and actually doc strings always start and end uh, with uh, triple quotes. And then we can start writing and uh, for example we can write the following. So the method plot returns plots log returns either as uh, time series short ts or as histogram short hist and finally we have to close our doc string with uh, triple quotes and uh, typically we move uh, this to the next uh, line. So now it's uh, getting clearer that uh, this is uh, the doc string here. And let's turn again to code. And here we can see the doc string in red. So this isn't a code and uh, this isn't part of the code. This is just the text, the doc string. And uh, let's again uh, define our class here. And let's uh, create one object. And now if you want to plot returns, we can go here inside and uh, here we can see our doc string. So the method plot returns plots the log returns either as time series TS or as histogram hist. Now we can add doc strings to methods, uh, but we can also add doc strings uh, to the entire class. So let's add a doc string to financial instruments to describe and explain what the financial instrument actually does. So let's go here above and let's again switch here to markdown mode. And let's uh, create here an indent. And uh, then we start uh, with uh, triple quotes. And uh, then we can write, uh, for example, the following. So the class financial instrument is a class to analyze financial instruments. like stocks. And uh, let's go to the next line and let's uh, close uh, the triple quotes and let's switch again to code. And here we can see that uh, this is here text, so a doc string. And let's again define the class and uh, let's uh, create an instance and let's go here inside. And now here we can see that the financial instruments is a class to analyze financial instruments like stocks. So these were just two simple and uh, short examples how to create doc strings uh, from methods and also for the class itself. And actually the level of detail depends on the complexity of classes and methods and also on the target audience. So if you are planning to create a new library for the wider public and uh, for completely uninformed users, it uh, should be more detailed, but in our case, we are among us and uh, you are definitely an informed user. So less uh, details are appropriate here. And also our class and methods aren't too complex with only one or two parameters per method. And let's have a look at a uh, final example here. So here we have a more detailed um, doc string for the class. So it's a class for analyzing financial instruments like stocks. And then we can have um, a description for all attributes. So for the initializing attributes like uh, ticker, start and end, and also for the methods. And um, here we uh, close in the doc string. And then for each and every method, uh, we could have a rather short doc string like uh, get data, retrieves and prepares uh, the data from Yahoo Finance or calculates log returns, uh, creates, creates a price chart and so on. So these are just the simple examples and typically 
for libraries uh, that are publicly available. You can see more detailed doc strings, which is okay here. So thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next lecture. Bye. All right, we have here the final version of our financial instrument class and we defined the class here in our Jupyter notebook. Now in case we want to use the class in other notebooks, so we have to copy and paste the class definition to the new notebooks and that's not really convenient and it's uh, best to just import the class like we import NumPy or Pandas and actually it's pretty easy and straightforward to create a Python module in .py format with the class financial instrument and uh, import the module and the class. And one option is to convert here the Jupyter Notebook into a PI file. And uh, we can do this here with uh, download as python.py. And uh, let's save uh, the Python module in uh, part two materials in the video lecture notebooks. And let's uh, give a name to the module. And uh, for example, we can use and choose a financial instrument. So financial instrument is uh, the name of the module and it's a PI file and let's uh, click on save. And now let's have a look here at our folder. And here we have now the PI file financial instrument.py. And actually we can also now open the file and uh, we should delete uh, most of uh, the cells here. So we only keep uh, the import of uh, some libraries like pandas and uh, Y finance and so on. And uh, the definition of the class financial instrument. So here we are just left uh, with uh, importing some uh, libraries and packages and uh, the final version of our class and now we shouldn't forget uh, to save uh, the file here. And now let's go back uh, to our current directory. And now here we have financialinstrument.py. And uh, now let's create another Jupyter notebook where we will use uh, the financial instrument module and import the module. So let's uh, import financial instrument. And then we can also define an abbreviation. So we can uh, import financial instrument, for example, as FI. And let's run the cell here. And we have successfully imported FI. And uh, now let's uh, create an instance or an object uh, of uh, the class financial instrument like uh, stocks. And now we can do the following. So in the module FI, there's uh, the class financial instrument. And uh, let's have a look inside here. So here we have to pass a ticker, for example, Apple and uh, a start and uh, end date. For example, 2015, January the 1st till 2018, January the 1st. And now let's uh, run the cell and let's uh, create the object stocks. And it worked. So now we have here stocks. And uh, we can also have a look here at uh, the data. And uh, here we have prices and uh, log returns for Apple. So this was a short introduction to Python modules. And again, it's important uh, to notice here that uh, this only works because uh, the Jupyter Notebook where we are coding in and uh, the Python module are in the very same location, so in the current working directory. And uh, you should make sure that uh, this is uh, the case. Otherwise, it's not that simple to import here the module financial instrument. So thanks for watching and uh, see you also in the next lecture. Bye. Hi and welcome to the third coding exercise. Here you will have uh, the opportunity to create a class from scratch, the rectangle class. And uh, this here is a rectangle and a rectangle has uh, four right angles and uh, four sides. So two short sides uh, with uh, the length A and uh, two longer sides uh, with uh, the length B. And then with uh, the following formulas we can calculate uh, the area 
the perimeter and also the diagonal. So the area, the shaded area here is simply a times b. Then the perimeter here is uh, simply two times a plus two times b. And finally we have here the diagonal and uh, we can calculate uh, the diagonal with uh, the square root of a, a squared plus uh, b squared. Now, first of all, let's see the rectangle class life in action before you will create the class from scratch. So I've already imported NumPy and I have uh, defined uh, the rectangle class below. And let's uh, create an object here. So let's go here inside. And uh, this is uh, the rectangle class. And uh, we have two parameters, a and b. And here we have to pass uh, numbers, for example, uh, three and four. And uh, we save actually uh, the resulting object in a rack. And here we can see that uh, this is a rectangle object uh, with a equals uh, three and uh, b equals four. And then we can also check uh, the attributes. So let's first of all, type here rec dot and let's press uh, the tab key and uh, here we have the methods and attributes area calculate area calculate diagonal calculate perimeter and uh, set parameters so we don't have uh, the attribute a and b and actually the class is uh, defined in a way that uh, we have uh, the protected attributes underscore a and underscore b and here we have uh, three and four. And also we have uh, the attribute area. So this is simply three times four is 12. And uh, there's also a second option to get uh, the area. And uh, there's uh, the method calculate area. And of course we get uh, the same result, 12. So it seems uh, that uh, the method uh, calculate area is uh, called already at instantiation and uh, the result is saved in the attribute area. So keep this in mind. And then we have uh, another method. So we have calculate diagonal and here we get five. So this is simply the square root of uh, three squared plus uh, four squared. So actually nine plus uh, 16 is 25 and uh, the square root is five. And then we can also calculate uh, the perimeter. So it's 14, two times uh, three plus uh, two times four. And then we can also change uh, the values for A and B with the method set parameters. So we have here the uh, default arguments, none. But uh, if we pass here five uh, to the B parameter, then we set B to five. And now we have here a rectangle with uh, A equals uh, three and B equals five. And actually when we run the set parameters method, uh, we automatically recalculate and uh, update the attribute area. So now the area is uh, three times five is 15. And finally, we can also calculate uh, the perimeter, which is 16. So this was uh, the rectangle class life in action. And uh, now it's your turn to actually create and define the rectangle class. And uh, there are actually two options. So either you uh, create uh, the rectangle class uh, without hints, or there's also a second option, so some help. And uh, you can have a look here. So if you want to do the exercise now on your own, then uh, please uh, stop the video because uh, I will continue now with uh, the solution. All right, now let's go on. And here we have uh, the second option. and. Uh, here we have some help, so we have uh, the methods. And now let's go to the solution. So first of all, we need NumPy because uh, we calculate later on the square root uh, with np.square root. And then first of all, we have uh, the dunder init method where we initialize uh, some properties. And uh, actually we have here two parameters, a and b. And uh, we save uh, those parameters in uh, the protected attributes underscore a and underscore b. And then we also run the method uh, calculate area. So we will have a look at this method in two minutes. But first of all, we define a string representation and we could define uh, the following statement. So this is a rectangle with a equals something and uh, b equals something. 
and uh, we replace here the curly brackets by self.a and self.b. And then we have for the method uh, calculate the area and uh, actually the area is simply a times b and uh, we save for the area in the attribute self.area and also we return the value here when calling the method. Then next we have uh, the method uh, calculate perimeter and uh, this is uh, simply here two times a plus two times b and uh, we return the value. And finally we have um, the diagonal, so calculate diagonal. And here we simply return the value of uh, the diagonal, it's uh, the square root of uh, a squared plus b squared. And finally we have uh, the option to set new values for a and b. And uh, we have uh, the default arguments none. And uh, if we do not pass any value for a and b, then we take uh, the existing values. But if we do pass the new values, so if a is not none, then we overwrite um, the protected attribute a and we pass here the new value. And then we also call the method calculate area and uh, update uh, the attribute area. And uh, for b it works in the very same way. So if we pass a value to b, then we update underscore b and uh, recalculate the area. So this was uh, the coding exercise on object-oriented programming and uh, classes. And if you have any problems or further questions here, then uh, please let me know and uh, write on the Q&A board. So thanks a lot and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye.